bring it home. Stellar date 10.12.8949, adjusted years. Location, the McWood Building, Memphis, Kansas. Region, Blue Ridge System, Old Geneva, Nietzschean Empire. It had taken Rika and Leslie over 20 minutes to make it to the high-rise that Nietzschean Command was holed up in. The edifice stood over two kilometers high, housing over 500 levels, any of which could hold their quarry. The exterior appeared to be windowless, just the smooth, shifting marble-like sheath. The only apparent entrance was the main doors at the front, but Rika and Leslie both knew that there would be a back entrance, as well as the underground mag-level tunnel that ran to the tower. The pair had discussed using the maglev at one point, but had decided that those tunnels were only a step up from the sewers. Neither wanted to be trapped underground with hundreds of neats overhead. Colonel Borden and his ISF hell jumpers were a kilometer further north, stalling another battalion of reinforcements, and the two women decided to use the distraction and approach the building at ground level. Following Leslie's location pings, Rika slipped around the side of the McWood building carefully avoiding a squad of neats who were setting up a crew-served railgun and grav shields on the street. Once at the back of the structure, the two marauders found a set of large bay doors for the building's loading dock. Though they were open, they were guarded by a platoon of the enemy who were well entrenched. However, their preparedness didn't involve high-energy active scan, and the two stealthed women carefully edged past the guards at the loading bay entrance and into a broad space filled with cargo trucks four empty heavy goon mech frames, and two heavy rail batteries both aimed at the open doors. Drop breach kits on those mech frames. I'll breach their controls and we'll use them for a diversion later, Nikki instructed Rika and Leslie. What makes you think we'll need a diversion? Leslie laughed over the tight beam that Nikki had established once they were inside. The question was rhetorical and no one responded. Rika selected her two mechs, then crept through the bay until she reached them and deployed the breach nano. Using the ISF's tech feels like cheating sometimes, she said to Nikki. Weren't you just telling me how keeping heads on shoulders was the goal? The AI's mental tone carried a note of humor, and Rika laughed in response. (laughs) I didn't say I'm above cheating. Once the GM's internal NSAIs were breached, the two infiltrators moved to a service elevator in the back of the bay. Think we should just go to the top? Leslie asked as they pressed the call button and waited for the car to descend. Rika shrugged. If my city was being attacked and I had two companies of mechs on my doorstep, I'd be in a bunker somewhere far away. But these neats probably think they can hide behind the shields they've set up around this building. And the fact that we don't have a history of willfully killing civilians. As she spoke, the lift arrived and the doors opened. Rika and Leslie were partially obscured by the mech frames and haulers in the bay. With any luck, no one would look too carefully at the service elevator and wonder why it had come down and opened its doors. So what you mean is that we should start with the top floor, Leslie inferred as she keyed in the command. You got it. The elevator's car doors began to close, then a voice called out, Hey, hold that lift. Rika froze and pressed herself against the wall knowing Leslie would do the same. She was tempted to reach over and mash the door close button, but a figure burst into the elevator before she could. Huh, the uniformed man said as he glanced about the empty car. Stupid Genevian tech, always fritzing. He turned to the control panel and entered his desired floor as the doors closed. Once his floor, 239, lit up on the display, the man, a corporal by his insignia, turned to face the door. He'd just let out a long breath and widened his stance when he turned his head back to the display. Floor 501, too, he muttered, approaching the panel. Shouldn't be able to go right up. Oh, good, it's going to stop at 490 for inspection. Well, shit, Leslie muttered. I did think it was a bit odd that we could just ride on up. I was taking it as a sign that fate was on our side. Rika sent an affirmation. As soon as this guy gets off, we need to select a stop a few floors down from 490. I don't favor a bunch of Nietzschean goons announcing our visit. You know who you're talking to, right? I live for stealth. 
A snort almost escaped Rika's lips. Yeah, but you're into barn, so. Took you long enough to bring that up again, Leslie said as the elevator car slowed and stopped at floor 239. None of my business who gets horizontal with who. Who says we get horizontal? Leslie shot back with mirth in her tone. Way more fun to do it against the wall. Les, Rika groaned. I just meant that since Jerry, yeah, I knew where you were going with that. I was trying to crassly head it off. I still miss Jerry, a lot. But he's not coming back in barn, well, he's changed lately. The Nietzschean corporal walked off the lift. And once the doors closed, Leslie quickly keyed in a stop at floor 485. It's the tail, Rika said with an audible laugh. <laughs> he's totally into the tail. Leslie sent her an image of rolling eyes, just the eyes. Leslie, yuck, why are those so bloodshot? What's gotten into you today? You deserve that. Barn may be into the tail. I mean, it's pretty damn awesome. But in reality, it's you, Rika. He's into me? Shit, silly tinhead. No, you've changed him. Rika estimated where Leslie was standing and gave her a light punch in the shoulder for tinhead. I guess he is a lot less of an asshole than he used to be. But a lot of that change has come from the ISF. They've given us real hope for the first time. We're not just scratching out a living, dreaming of taking the fight back to the needs. We're actually doing it. Okay, first, ow. And second, sure, that's a part of it. But it was really what you did at the Politica. You were willing to sacrifice everything to save those people. You could have killed Stavros a dozen times over but you wouldn't sacrifice all those mechs and even his stupid-ass goons. A lot of commanders would have written them off as collateral damage, but not you. Rika stood in silence for a moment as the lift began to rise. Finally, she said, What you do to the least of these, you do to me. That sounds deep, Leslie said. What's it mean? Something my father used to say, Rika replied with a shrug. She tried not to think of her parents, of how her life used to be. Though it didn't hurt as much as it used to, it still highlighted a hole inside herself that she knew would never close. It means that you're only as good a person as the way you treat the most vulnerable people, or creatures. People do what they can get away with. They're either policed by their own ethics or by society. Watch how they treat a child that annoys them, or a homeless person, or a wounded animal, when they think no one is watching, that's the real person. Leslie didn't reply right off. That's some stiff judgment. I don't know how well I'd stack up. I've had some bad moments in my past. The lift slowed to a stop at floor 485, and the door slid open to reveal an empty hall. Rika stepped out first and unslung her AC9CR. Good thing we've already paid for many of our sins. Too bad we keep committing new ones, Leslie replied. Rika wondered about that statement. Though Leslie often portrayed a carefree exterior and rarely spoke of her past, there was a deepness to the woman. Something born of a past that Rika suspected was troubled long before the Nietzschean war broke out. Neither spoke further as they traversed the level, heading toward the stairwell on the far side. Since the other staircase was a secondary access route, it was less likely that it would be patrolled by humans, and the ISF tech would allow the two women to slip past any automated sensors the Neats would have deployed. Several of the rooms they passed contained Nietzschean officers and chiefs of varying rank, clustered around holo tanks and planning tables. Few were in the halls, and those were easily avoided. Every one of them looked worried. Good. When Rika and Leslie reached the secondary staircase, Nikki bid them halt while she deployed nanoprobes, checking for additional security. Nothing other than cameras and EMIR sensors, the AI reported after a minute. You're clear to ascend. Rika slipped in first. Though Leslie was the better scout, if they hit significant opposition, they were going to want to mix heavier guns at the fore. The stairs were steel, and Rika stepped lightly to avoid any sound though the ISF stealth tech would dampen the noise. She didn't want to take risks when they were this close to their prey. After two minutes, they reached the 490th floor, 
and Rika saw a bored-looking guard standing next to the door. There didn't appear to be any active scanning systems present, so Rika stepped right past him and moved onto the next flight. The moment her right foot met the third step, she felt the slightest amount of give. Behind her, the guard's head snapped up, and he muttered a curse before unslinging his rifle and moving toward Rika's position. Shit, pressure sensor. It was in the wall mount, and I didn't spot it in time. I got him, Leslie said, and a moment later, the man's head twisted at an unnatural angle, a sickening crunch filling the stairwell. I've got Nano on him. Give me a minute, and I'll call it in as a false alarm, Nikki announced. Keep moving, Leslie added. I'll stay here and make sure no one checks in, or survives if they do. The scout had that bloodthirsty tone in her voice, the one that scared Rika a little. Okay, follow after as soon as Nikki gives the all clear. You bad, Colonel, Leslie replied. Rika waited for Nikki to give a green light on the rest of the stairs, and then proceeded to climb them as quickly as possible. Chances were that even if Nikki managed to hijack the dead guard's link before someone came to check the stairwell out, a visual inspection would still have been ordered. At least it better, if I were running security here and no one checked an alarm while the city was under attack, heads would roll. She'd just climbed past the 495th floor when Nikki signaled that she'd sent the all clear. The message came a moment before the sound of a rifle firing from below. And it's too late, Leslie commented as Rika heard pounding on the steps. Two neats came to check things out, didn't have helmets on, and now they're dead neats. I'm moving up a flight and planting some mines on the stairs. I'll keep them busy. Stay safe, Rika advised. Disappear and follow after me if things get too hairy down there. Rika, they're just neats. I'll be fine. Rika wanted to admonish Leslie further for her blasé attitude but knew that the scout was just trying to help Rika stay focused on the objective. Take out the Nietzschean leadership, and force the rest of the enemy to surrender and cease the slaughter of civilians. There was no guarantee it would work, but even if it was only partially effective in getting some of the Nietzschean field commanders to stand down, it would be worthwhile. With her objectives firmly in mind, Rika kept moving as quickly and as silently up the stairs as she could. When she rounded the landing below the 500th floor, she could see a security arch at the top of the next flight. You got this? She asked Nikki. Already spotted it with the probes. It has some high-grade encryption, better than the neats usually use on systems like this. A good sign that the brass is still up here. Going to take a minute or two. The sound of weapons fire came from below, and Rika shook her head. No dice, we don't have time. Two guards were stationed on either side of the door that stood beyond the security arch. The stairwell ended at level 500, which meant access to the top floor was somewhere beyond the pair of neats guarding the door. You sure? Nikki asked. Yeah, gotta get this party into full swing sooner or later anyway, Rika replied, then took aim with her GNR-41C and fired three rounds into the helmeted head of the guard on the left before repeating the action on the right-hand guard. To her surprise, the projectiles didn't penetrate either guard's face shield, she toggled the GNR to fire an electron beam, getting a shot off at the guard on the right, burning a hole clear through his head before the other Nietzschean had recovered and opened fire on her. Guess the E-beam draws a bit of a line to where I am, Rika said with a laugh to Nikki as she leaped into the air, sailing over the security arch. The machine began to wail as it detected her motion. She came down next to the remaining enemy and activated the light wand built into her left wrist. The Nietzschean didn't have time to react, and his head fell from his shoulders half a second later. Damn, Rika, you're scary fast, Leslie noted, and Rika saw the blood-spattered shape of the scout advancing up the stairs behind her. Is that from the SMI-4 upgrades, or the other stuff they did to you? A bit of both, I think. Rika kicked open the door and strode into the hallway beyond, firing her GNR at a pair of lightly armored Nietzscheans rushing toward her. The weapon was still on its electron beam setting, and the shots burned holes clear through the torsos of the two lightly armored soldiers. Rika barely spared them a second glance as she dashed down the corridor, angling toward the center of the level, where she suspected the stairs to the top floor would be. All around her were the trappings of luxury. Some of it looked to have been there since before the Nietzscheans took up residence in the building, but other items, 
mostly the art and a few pieces of furniture, didn't fit the overall decor, and Rika suspected they were the spoils of war and later corruption. Behind her, the report of Leslie's rifle sounded again, followed by the dull thud of her mind detonating. Well, we're not getting back down that way, Leslie said, though I suppose we could always jump a few flights, except the rubble looks like it's blocked things off at around the 480th floor. We don't need to retreat from here, Rika replied calmly as she gunned down a trio of Nietzschean officers who thought firing sidearms at a mech was a wise life choice. Rounding a corner, she caught sight of a foyer with a broad staircase that swept up to the next floor, splitting at the halfway mark and curving to either side. At the base of the stairs were two heavy mech frames, their four-meter-tall bulk almost more than could fit in the space. They were flanked by soldiers who were clustered around crew-served railguns and protected by grav shields. Rika's stealth effectiveness read at 95%, and she judged that as good enough to move into the open area at the staircase's base. All of the neats, 27 counting the pair inside the mech frames, were on alert, heads swiveling as they watched the room and the approaches, including the one Rika was easing through. She knew this to be the point where they were most likely to detect her, and was almost clear when one of the soldiers cocked his head and then fired around directly at her. Spotted. The bullet ricocheted off her body, causing no harm, but in the following moment, all hell broke loose. Rika leaped into the air as rail-fired slugs streaked through the space where her body had been seconds before. Her left hand fired rail shots from her AC-9CR rifle, while she sprayed ballistic rounds from her GNR at the nearest neats. The moment her feet touched the floor, she ceased firing and flung herself to the right, narrowly avoiding a spray of slugs from one of the goon mech's chain guns. As she sailed through the air, everything seemed to slow down, and a calm certainty came over her. There is nothing these Nietzscheans can do to stop me. I am their death. It would be easy. She lobbed a pair of smart grenades at the wall to the right of the stairs, angling them above the enemy's grav shields. The small balls of death bounced off the wall and headed straight for the crew served weapon. She didn't watch to ensure they hit, trusting the nades to detonate once they attached to the gun. Her focus was on the two heavies. The one on the left was advancing, conveniently blocking the left side crew served weapon while the one on the right contented itself with spraying more rounds into the open space. Rika took a moment to wonder if there were other neats working elsewhere on this level. As best she could tell, the weaponry being fired at her would chew clear through the building and anyone in their path in short order. Good thing we're near the top, she thought. Otherwise, these idiots would bring the whole building down. A moment later, the grenades went off, the grav shields containing the blast and flinging the nearby neats about like rag dolls. Rika used the moment of distraction to rush the right hand heavy. Her DPU sabot rounds could penetrate the metal monsters, but there wasn't enough range in the foyer to fire them, and she wanted to save the charges on her electron beam for whatever may come next. I'll do these bastards up close and personal. The GM must have spotted her movement, likely from disturbances in the smoke that was starting to fill the room, because it jerked its chain gun toward her. Rika would have thanked the mech's operator if she'd had the chance. The weapon mount made for the perfect landing place, and she clamped on with both feet, bending three of the barrels and fouling the weapon. At the same time, she dropped her AC-9CR back onto the hook on her back and ignited her light wand, driving it into the main body of the thing, sinking the blade down to the hilt. With the hole torn into the operator's pod, she disabled her light wand and pulled her AC-9CR free, briefly considering getting another set of arms, and fired on a pair of Nietzscheans rushing down the stairs, while her right foot pulled free of the gun mount and grabbed another grenade from the pouch at her waist, driving it into the hole that her light wand had hewn. She ran across the heavy as it scrabbled at itself, trying to knock the grenade free. She landed on the second GM, ducking behind its bulk as the grenade inside the first one detonated. Her GNR snapped three times, ballistic rounds firing into the greatly widened opening on the first GM. The second heavy spun around, attempting to fling her off, its movements making it impossible for the neats operating the left side crew served weapon to fire on her, for fear of striking their comrade. Rika grabbed another pair of smart grenades and set them to hit the neats furthest from the shielded gun. The heavy swung an arm up at Rika, 
and she narrowly avoided getting a chain gun to the head. The grenades detonated, and she kicked off the flailing beast to sail over the grav shield and land directly behind the crew served railgun. One slash with her light wand and the operator was dead. She locked one foot onto the gun's floor mount and then slammed the other foot into the neat managing the ammo. She clamped her three claws around its neck and twisted, breaking the woman's fragile bones before flinging her body at her comrades. In the time it took to kill the two Nietzscheans, Nikki had breached the simple bio lock on the railgun, and Rika let out a primal scream as she fired it at the remaining heavy, tearing its limbs off before finally penetrating its armored body and killing the human inside. A moment later, something struck her side, and she saw one of the Nietzscheans near the stairs firing a small mass coil gun at her. With a flick of her wrist, a smart grenade was sent sailing through the air to land on the soldier's chest. A guttural cry escaped the neat before the top of his body exploded in a bloody spray. Two of the soldiers on the far side of the stairs had disentangled themselves from their comrades and were running past the now flickering grav shield toward one of the exits. Rika didn't hesitate before gunning them down, not willing to risk the enemies regrouping with more of their scumbag friends and attacking anew. On her right, two of the Nietzscheans who had witnessed her callous action opened fire, one with a heavy caliber slug thrower and the other with a beam rifle. Rika twisted to the side, spinning the crew-served railgun on its mount to point at the pair, firing the last of the rounds in its current string of ammo at the Neats and tearing their bodies apart. When the railgun's whine died down, a stillness fell on the foyer. Rika stepped out around the grav shield, watching for any signs of life in the twisted wreckage of human and machine before her, nodding in satisfaction. Easy. Her stealth effectiveness was down to 50%, her armor dented and scored from the rounds that had struck her. She deactivated it. From here out, she wanted the enemy to see her coming. You in one piece? Leslie asked. I nearly got hit by a salvo tearing through the walls. I'm good. It's a bit of a neat soup in here, though. Ugh, that's the worst kind. Don't tip the waiter. Rika laughed at the scout's joke. <laughs> Keep your level secure. I'm moving up to the top. Already on it. I lift a few surprises at the ruined staircase, and I'm heading to the main lift to head off any new guests. Good, I'll holler if I need you. Me too, Leslie replied. Rika chuckled to herself, checking her AC-9CR's charge and swapping its nearly spent rail pellet magazine. Satisfied that the rifle was ready to rock, she checked her GNR for damage, ensuring that the firing modes were all functional. Nikki had already sent a passel of nanoprobes up the stairs, revealing a squad of Nietzscheans who had taken up positions in the hallway on the left-hand branch of the staircase. The top floor's halls curved, so she knew that both paths would lead to her quarry. She took the right-hand staircase, not feeling the least bit of guilt over hitting the enemy in the rear. Striding up the stairs and into the corridor like she hadn't a care in the world, she resisted whistling a tune. Killing Nietzscheans was her business. And business was good. Last Stand. Stellar Date 10.12.8949. Adjusted Years. Location. Nietzschean System Command, Memphis, Kansas. Region. Blue Ridge System. Old Geneva, Nietzschean Empire. Admiral Gideon tensed as the sound of weapons fire ceased. He glanced at the master sergeant next to the door. No one's in the corridor yet, sir, the man said, beads of sweat visible on his brow. Gideon nodded silently, not blaming the sergeant for his nerves. They'd all watched the feeds from the base of the staircase. The enemy they faced had impressive stealth gear, but as the fight progressed all 39 seconds of it, it became clear that the destruction was caused by a single attacker, one of the Genevian human hybrid mechs. What was that? Decato asked a moment later. It didn't look like a model I've seen before. An SMI of some sort, Sophia replied from her position behind a holo table, rifle held ready. But different than any I've seen before. Faster and that electron blade in her arm. Just one, a major on the far side of the room whispered. What are we going to do? Stow your shit, Sophia growled. She's not invincible, and she took a lot of hits down there. 
Plus, we have our countermeasures ready. They should be sufficient. Gideon wasn't convinced that Sophia's plan would work and was wondering if it was too late to make a break for the express elevator at the far end of the corridor. The small voice in the back of his head was driving home the regret he felt for not taking Sophia's advice earlier. The bunker on the northern edge of the city was looking very inviting right then. The staccato rhythm of kinetic rifles firing broke the silence outside the room and was punctuated by a scream, then a shriek and some crying. He doubted it was coming from the mech. Seven long seconds later, a light one slashed through the door, cutting away the lock. Hold until my signal, Sophia instructed. We need her to get inside the room. Gideon swallowed. Being the bait had seemed like the right call five minutes ago when Sophia proposed this plan. He'd felt strong and in control, an inspiration to those around him. He'd also been convinced that the attacker wouldn't make it past the defenses on the stairs. Now he worried he'd mess himself. The electron blade slid out of the door, and he drew in a breath, holding it for three long seconds before the door exploded inward, followed by the mech striding into the room. Her sleek gray armor was darkened by carbon scoring and streaks of blood. From the looks of it, none of it was hers. Who's in charge here? The woman's clear, strong voice rang through the room like a bell. Gideon squared his shoulders, hoping he appeared more certain of himself than he felt. Fleet Admiral Gideon, what are your intentions? The sleek mech took another step into the room. Her head didn't pivot to take the space in. He knew it didn't have to. Her helmet would be feeding a surround view of the space into her mind. The thing had eyes in the back of its head. My intentions are for you to surrender, Admiral Gideon. Order all your forces in the Blue Ridge system to stand down and cease all hostilities. If Gideon hadn't seen this killing machine tear its way through his troops just minutes before, he would have laughed in her face. And if I refuse? He asked. The mech took a step forward, swinging its right arm toward him, the meter-long barrel on its end aimed at his head. Then I blow your head off and your second-in-command gets the honors. It took every ounce of Gideon's willpower not to take a step back. He needed the mech to think him defiant and move further into the room. Then she did, a quick step followed by a second. Colonel Sophia screamed, now! Though it was not necessary, the EMP burst had already gone off, a targeted wave of modulated energy washing over the mech. Electricity arced across her body, and the mech stiffened, her three long fingers twitching as the EM wave continued to surge over her. Then the EM burst cut out, and the woman let out a keening wail, her right arm jerking as though she were trying to fire the gun embedded in it. To Gideon's great relief, nothing happened. The mech fell still, and the tension fell out of the room soldiers and officers rising from behind their cover. Then the mech took a shuddering step forward, a deep growl emanating from deep within the armored shell. With a calm expression, Colonel Sophia rose and fired a CF net that wrapped around the mech. Upon impact, the net latched on and tightened, carbon nanofibers drawing taut, pulling the mech's arms to its body. The Genevian horror wobbled for a moment and then fell backward, slamming into the ground. Gideon breathed a sigh of relief. He glanced at the windows to get an update on the status of the battle, only then realizing that even though the EMP burst had been targeted, the wave of energy had still shorted out every display in the room, and from the looks of it, had also killed three of the officers closest to the mech. He glanced at Sophia, but she only shrugged. Collateral damage. I can't believe she made it so far on her own, Decato said as he stepped toward the mech and gave it a kick. I wouldn't, Sophia's words cut off as the mech twitched, a muffled voice coming from behind her helmet. I'll kill every last one of you fuckers. Some mouth on that thing, Gideon commented as a sergeant ran into the room, skidding to a halt when he saw the monstrosity on the floor. A second later, he regained his composure. Admiral, sir, what is it? 
Gideon growled, annoyed at the interruption. The enemy, we have updated our assessment of their numbers and composition. And there are no more than two platoons out there, the sergeant reported. What? Decato interjected. How are they? He cut off when Gideon waved a dismissive hand in his direction. The sergeant took the gesture as his cue to continue. They're all mechs, every last one of them. What? Sophia gasped, then gestured at the thing on the floor. Like this? Yes, that's their scout model. Most of them are the heavier mechs, but there are a few configurations we've not seen before. Their walkers also have shields far stronger than we've encountered in the past. Not like their ships, but still strong. Sir? Sophia turned to Admiral Gideon. We need to go, now. Gideon didn't hesitate to nod. I agree, but we need more intel on this threat. If I abandon Kansas with nothing more than wild stories. He appeared to make a decision. We're taking this mech. The thing on the floor twitched at his words, but Sophia nodded. Understood, sir. Chasing Rika. Stellar date 10.12.8949, adjusted years. Location, floor 500 McWood Building, Memphis, Kansas. Region, Blue Ridge System, Old Geneva, Nietzschean Empire. Leslie, EM! Rika's voice hollered over the link, then cut out. The scout let out a string of curses, then flung her last grenade at the wall, triggering it to bounce twice, then roll them into the neats that had been advancing up the primary stairwell from the floors below. Rika, Nikki, I'm coming. She was running back toward the central room and its staircase to the top level before the grenade she'd thrown even went off. When she reached the foyer at the base of the stairs and saw the carnage, Leslie felt a sense of awe sweep over her, though the feeling was short-lived as weapons fire rained down on her from the level above. Fuck, she swore as she ducked back into the corridor reviewing the new enemies that her optics had detected. There were at least a dozen of them up there, and by the sounds of the footsteps, another dozen were forming up at the head of the staircase's other branch. A shot zipped over her shoulder, pinging off the wall, and Leslie realized that her grenade hadn't slowed down the first group of neats as much as she'd hoped. Rika, can you hear me, Nikki? There was no response, and Leslie felt a sense of helplessness wash over her as she turned down a side corridor and retreated under intensifying enemy fire. Chase, Potter, Leslie called out, but her calm relays weren't responding. The EM pulse Rika was trying to warn me about must have shorted them out. Why does she always have to run off without backup? Leslie continued cursing Rika's bravado and the Nietzschean's cunning as she continued to fall back. Through the nanoprobe she'd left behind, she watched a group of officers descend the stairs and saw that several sergeants behind them carried Rika's bound form. Leslie noted that Rika was struggling feebly and breathed a sigh of relief. She's alive. Her need to survive warred with Leslie's desire to get Rika free. Her stealth armor reported only 60% effectiveness, and she knew that precluded sneaking up on the neats and freeing her commander. Still, it would be enough to lose the squad of neats that was trying to flush her out. As she ran down the corridor circling the floor, Leslie tried to get close to the group of officers, only to have the feeds from her nanoprobes show them reaching the elevator bank well ahead of her, filing into a waiting car. Stars, let them put Rika in the next car, Leslie all but prayed as she rushed back to the half-destroyed secondary staircase. She came to the stairwell, and looked down to see a pair of Nietzscheans standing on the rubble that was piled up 20 floors below. Without a second thought, she leaped out into the empty space, firing her PR-99 at them as she fell. As luck would have it, the Neats fell across each other as they died, and she landed on their stacked bodies, then rolled off and dashed out into the corridor beyond. Without missing a beat, she raced across the 480th floor, firing indiscriminately at any enemy that got in her way not even bothering to ensure they weren't gathering behind her. Twenty seconds later, Leslie turned a corner and saw the lift doors ahead. There were two guards on either side, and she fired a series of rail-accelerated pellets, first at one and then the other, before turning her weapon on the doors. Shredded aluminum gave way, and she slammed into the doors and leaped across the lift to the lift-climb rail on the back wall. 
Below her, an elevator car was descending, and she glanced up to see another slide into place at the 500th level above her. Leslie wished Nikki was online to tell her where the lifts were headed. It was her hope that the group was going to the loading dock at the base of the tower. If that was the neat's destination, they would have a surprise waiting for them. Just as soon as she was able to link up with the four mech frames she and Rika had hacked on the way into the building. As the elevator car above began to descend, Leslie swung an arm out and caught one of the floor beams as it passed by. Hanging from the bottom of the car, she looked down into the thousands of meters below, scanning the doors leading to each floor for any signs of activity. The last things she needed were neat shooting at her while hanging from the bottom of the car. No enemies showed their faces, though, and Leslie gave a silent thanks to the ISF that, even at partial effectiveness, their stealth technology was enough to fool the Nietzscheans. Either that, or they don't have any sensors in the elevator shaft. That would be foolish in the extreme, but not terribly surprising. They're cocky bastards, after all. As the cars descended, she watched the first one, presumably containing the enemy's commanding officers, pass below ground level and let out a curse. They must be going for the maglev line beneath the building. Amid her descent, she was finally able to connect to the four mech frames they'd passed in the loading bay and triggered their activation sequences. Once again, wishing that Nikki was around to help, she directed the crude NSAIs in the frames to get to the elevator shaft and follow down once she'd passed their level. Below, she could see the first car stopping and assumed that it must have reached the maglev station below the building. Sure enough, it slid to the side at the lowest level, making room for the car Leslie was hanging from. The view confirmed that this was the bottom of the shaft, and she quickly scrambled at the side of the car, hoping that she hadn't made any noticeable noise. She settled on the roof, waiting for the car to stop and its passengers to disembark. Above her, she saw the four mech frames tear the lift doors off at the loading docks level, and three of them clamber down the sides of the shaft. She instructed the fourth one to wait, attempting to relay a signal through it while still at ground level. Potter, Chase, are you there? For a moment, there was no response, and Leslie worried she'd be entirely on her own. Then Potter's voice came into her mind. Leslie, are you okay? You sound worried. I'm okay, but the Neats captured Rika. They have her down at the maglev platform beneath the building. I'm in pursuit. What? Leslie was about to respond when beam fire flashed above, and the mech that had been standing at the doors exploded, the lower half of its body toppling into the elevator shaft as the top half became shrapnel, spraying into the other three mech frames. Shit, Leslie swore aloud, tearing off the access door on the car's roof and dropping down into the small space. Rika was no longer in the elevator car, but two Nietzschean naval chiefs were, both frozen in surprise at the partially visible figure that had just dropped between them. Leslie didn't even bother firing at the pair, instead racing out of the elevator as the bottom half of the mech frame slammed into it, smashing through the roof of the car and crushing the two neats. She found herself in a long corridor that connected to the maglev platform. Ahead, she could see Rika's form being carried on the shoulders of the Nietzschean sergeants, she fired at them, hitting one in the legs, but then the enemy made it around a corner 40 meters away. Passing an instruction for the remaining three mech frames to follow as best they could, Leslie took off down the corridor, cursing the need to slow as she approached the corner. While still a dozen meters away, she flung two microdrones ahead of herself, their optics revealing four neats crouched behind a barricade, their weapons aimed at the corner, ready to shoot anything that came around it. Beyond them, she could see that the Nietzschean officers were already boarding the maglev, the soldiers who were carrying Rika double-timing it to reach the train. Leslie snatched the empty grenade satchel from her waist and disabled its stealth before flinging it out beyond the corner. She didn't wait to see if the enemies fell for her weak ruse before easing around the edge. As she'd hoped, the four guards were distracted by the flying satchel. Combined with her stealth, the weak diversion helped her make it past their barricade. Once clear, she picked up her pace, racing toward the maglev, though the doors began to close while she was still some distance away. No, she screamed in the confines of her mind, driving her body to its limit in an attempt to reach the train. Behind her, a voice cried out, 
and projectile fire streaked past her head. She was nearly at the train when a pulse blast hit her in the back and sent her flying across the platform and over the edge. She landed on the maglev rail as it activated, the magnetic field crushing her body against the lower half of the rail. Pinned, tears of rage and frustration streaming down her face, Leslie stared at the departing maglev train. The train that held Rika. Don't move or I'll blow your head off. She looked up to see a Nietzschean standing at the edge of the platform, an ugly snub-nosed coil gun pointed down at her. Think so? She asked, wishing the neat could see the sneer on her lips. He looked like he was about to reply when an electron beam tore through his chest, fired by one of the mech frames that had finally made it past the elevator car's wreckage. The current on the maglev rail shut off, and Leslie clambered up onto the platform watching as the goon mech frames finished off the Nietzscheans. Fuck, what do I do? She wondered. Then an idea came to her, and she signaled the closest mech frame to open up its operator's pod. A minute later, she was inside the Nietzschean machine, racing down the maglev track. I'm coming, Rika, she whispered. Captive. Stellar date 10.12.8949, adjusted years, location, unknown, region, Blue Ridge system, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Rika felt consciousness slip in and out as she was jostled about for what felt like forever. Rough hands grasped her, wrenching her to and fro, the feeling barely perceptible over the pounding in her head. Try as she might, she couldn't get a response from Nikki. Her internal connection to the AI only flashed a routing error, and her external wireless connections and her Quancom connection were also unresponsive. She was barely able to move a muscle, and her mechanical limbs could have been fried for all she knew. Centrally located in her skull, directly below her reptile brain, were the heavily shielded repair mods, Though she could access them, the systems only reported assessing damage when she asked for status. Fuck, she silently raged, furious that she had allowed herself to fall into such a crude trap, her anger warring with the fear that was clawing at the edges of her mind. She was utterly helpless and in the hands of the Nietzscheans. Time seemed to pass with excruciating slowness. Though when she checked it, the chronometer still functioning within her mind told her that it had been 11 hours since her capture. What? Rika felt a fresh wave of panic. She wondered how her body had not managed to repair critical systems in that amount of time. She reviewed her internal system logs, only to find signs that the Neats had tried to crack her armor several times, but that her anti-intrusion defenses had responded with nano-attacks. The ISF's nano had staved off any breaches, but the intrusion attempts had slowed her recovery significantly. Rika? Nikki's voice came into her mind, sounding different than normal, a bit more like it used to before they were properly paired. Nikki? Rika shouted with joy. Are you okay? Do you know what's happened to us? Why do you sound different? Easy, Rika. I'm okay. Well, mostly. A part of my direct IO with you was destroyed by the EMP so I had to reroute through your general link, which I had to fix first. Then they tried to breach us. Stars, what a mess. Where are we? Rika asked. Do you have any feeds? I do, and you're not going to like it. Nikki? We're on a ship, Rika. The AI's words crashed into her like a K-1R on a bender. A ship? How in the stars? I don't know any better than you. I imagine Nietzsche and Command must have had some sort of evac vessel nearby. How it got past the blockade is beyond me. Rika considered how that could have played out. The Neats had an effective bargaining chip with her in captivity. It could be that they'd simply told the marauders that Rika would die if they attacked. She hoped her mechs wouldn't fall for something like that. Her life was just as likely to be forfeit if the enemy got her out system. It's on us to escape, Rika decided, pulling up her repair mods assessments. Stars were still a mess. Yeah, you're lucky there's enough power to keep the lights on, Nikki replied. We're in a cell of some sort. It's EM shielded, but I've sent a passel of nano cloud probes into the deck and bulkheads, looking for any power we can tap into. 
If we can do that, we can rebuild our nano supply and send a batch to start eating this damn web they've wrapped you in. Then we'll show them that only idiots take mechs alive. Of course, they have no idea something like nano cloud even exists, let alone that we have it. Nikki sent a feeling of emphatic agreement. Lucky for us, the ISF developed a variant they were comfortable with sharing, and that we stayed in Sepe long enough for that courier to arrive. Oh, by the way, they got your AC-9CR, and also managed to pull the barrel off your GNR. Rika stifled a curse. Getting angry wouldn't help her now, and she shouldn't have been surprised anyway. Disarming her as much as possible was a logical move on the part of the Neats. Smart, for once. She continued her assessment. Guards? There are four of them outside the cell. They check on you every 20 seconds in a rotation. Rika gave a soft laugh. <laughs> Paranoid bastards, not that I blame them. Over the next half hour, she assisted Nikki in finding a power source, a weak but consistent magnetic field in the deck beneath them. They tasked the final nanoprobes to build a coil to tap the magnetic field using copper from her charging cable and threading it through a small hole they'd bored in the deck underneath her back. It's going to take some time to juice us up, Rika commented as the trickle began to flow into her SC bats. More hours than I care to consider at this rate, Nikki agreed. But once we get more energy, we can build a connection that will support more amperage. Then we get free, Rika whispered, hoping that the Neats would leave or be for that long. She harbored no illusions that they would. Lost. Stellar date 10.12.8949. Adjusted years. Location. Intersection 48th and Bridge Street, Memphis, Kansas. Region, Blue Ridge System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Shit. Chase swore as Potter confirmed that a stealth ship had broken atmosphere at an opportune time and was already on the far side of the planet from the Marauder vessels. Their stealth is poor, but with the atmospheric ionization from all the fighting, it was enough to get them by. Potter said quietly, I'm sorry. Should I go after them with the lance? Captain Heather asked over the command net. Before Chase could shout yes, Lieutenant Colonel Alice joined the conversation. No. No? Chase asked, pulling up Alice's location on the battlefield. She was still on the far side of Bridge Street, a kilometer away. If I can get a line of sight on that piece of... He forced himself to take a deep breath. Why no? He demanded in a measured, perfectly not murderous tone. It could be a trap or a ruse, Alice cautioned, an attempt to draw us away from our target here. Our target is the Nietzschean command officers, Potter reminded her. I don't see a high probability scenario where they wouldn't have boarded their own evac craft. Even if Rika isn't on board, we should be pursuing that objective. What about Leslie? Chase asked. Have you managed to connect with her? Not since that single burst, Alice replied. I imagine she's in pursuit. I'm sending Kelly and her team after her, Chase decided. We know from Leslie that the Neats took the maglev line from under the McWood building. There's more than one line under that building, and the area is crawling with Neats, Alice warned. You don't say, Chase thundered. I was just going to suggest that we send in Yig's team as well, Alice replied, a steely edge to her voice. Chase clenched his jaw. He wasn't certain he believed Alice but this wasn't the time to take her to task, especially with her being in nominal command of the battalion. Oh, sorry. The Neats are falling back and we need to regroup. Kelly and Yig can check over their former HQ, while the rest of us establish our HQ at the spaceport. We can better coordinate the hunt for Rika and Leslie from there. Alice's words made sense on the surface, but he wondered if it really was better to move to the spaceport. It was clear across Memphis and it would take some time to get the behemoths over there. Still, he couldn't countermand her, and he figured it would be wise to be in the same room as the woman when she was making her decisions, if for no other reason than the probable need to knock her unconscious and take command of the battalion. Lieutenant Karen, Chase addressed M Company's XO. I'm going to take Potter and Aaron to the spaceport. You stay with First Platoon and Hull Bridge Street. See if you can establish a cordon to the Mackwood building to support Kelly and Yig if they need it. 
You got it, Captain, Karen replied. Do you think the Neats will counterattack? A trickle of sweat ran down Chase's temple, and he wished he could remove his helmet to brush it aside. No, probably not, especially since things are under control at the spaceport, and the sky screams control the air over Memphis. With their leaders gone, the Neats are broken. Now we just have to keep this city from devolving into chaos. Fun times, Karen replied. By the by, doesn't this run counter to the lieutenant colonel's orders? You're just securing the area for an orderly retreat, Chase reasoned. Alice won't reach out to you directly. If she does, just tell her you're following my orders. You got it, Captain. And Chase? Karen's voice had grown softer, and he knew what she was going to say. Yes, Karen? We'll find her. Chase gave a vehement nod in the shade beside a kitchen appliance store. Damn straight we will. Then we'll make the neats pay. Orders. Stellar date 10.12.8949, adjusted years. Location, Horton Space and Airport, Memphis, Kansas. Region, Blue Ridge System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Allison snapped to attention as Lieutenant Colonel Alice entered the Nietzschean's former CIC at the spaceport. The woman was one of the few non-mechs in the Marauders, and the only one in the command other than Leslie. The other non-mechs were mostly engineers, pilots, and ship crew. So far as Allison was concerned, each and every one of them were fully-fledged members of Rika's Marauders. They bled oil just like the mechs. But not Alice. Everyone knew that she was a plant sent from Marauder HQ to keep an eye on them and make sure that Rika remembered she worked for the Marauders and not Tannis and the ISF. Bullshit, Allison thought. Rika works for Rika, but everyone knows she's taking direction from Tannis. That was the scuttlebutt, at least. It was ISF intel that had enabled the Marauders to launch an attack on the SEPI system. Following that, Tannis had reached out to Rika with the information that the Blue Ridge system was all but undefended, a ripe target within Nietzsche's borders. Of course, any goals here were secondary now, what with Rika's capture by the Neats. Allison was beside herself with worry, along with the rest of the Marauders. She'd heard Lieutenant Fuller and Staff Sergeant Chauncey talking about how they should just abandon Kansas and the Blue Ridge system entirely, if needs be, to go after Rika. The sentiment was one she shared wholeheartedly. Still, Chase hadn't made the call to leave, so she would bide her time. But if the captain said the word, she'd pack up in a heartbeat, no matter what the lieutenant colonel says. Sergeant, Alice said loudly in the otherwise empty room while glaring at the holo table, showing the layout of the spaceport. Yes, Colonel Alice, Allison replied, turning toward the woman. I need you to find the fastest interstellar capable ship in the spaceport, something maneuverable that we can use as a pursuit craft. Ma'am? Allison cocked an eyebrow. Is there something wrong with our fleet? Alice looked up from the holo and met Allison's gaze. Yes, it's a Nietzschean fleet, and they'll be looking for it. We need something they won't suspect, that is able to affect a pursuit and breach. You find the right craft and pick two fire teams to come along. Allison's estimation of Alice shifted slightly. This woman is going to lead the rescue of Rika? That was something she could get behind. Yes, ma'am. And Allison, Alice said, taking a step closer, her eyes darting around the otherwise empty CIC. Keep this to yourself. We think the needs have breached our cum somehow. It was how they got the drop on Rika. The company commanders know we're doing this. Chase is on board. So verbal orders only? Allison clarified, exactly, Sergeant. Something about Alice's voice didn't seem right, but a gut feeling didn't warrant insubordination, so Allison nodded. I've been inventorying the ships here while we wait for things to settle down. I was curious if there are any neat owned ones that we could seize, and I found one that may fit the bill. It's a Corvette-sized vessel, interstellar capable. It may be a bit small for yourself and nine mechs, but it has weapons, decent shields, and it can pull a hundred Gs in a pinch. Alice nodded as she looked over the ship that Allison had pulled up on the holo. You're right about it being tight for ten. What if we cut that number? Can you assault a Nietzschean ship with just one fire team? Allison barked a laugh. Ha, don't you recall Seppi? I only took two fire teams for a dreadnought. 
One will be plenty for a tin can full of Nietzsche and brass running with their tails between their legs. All we have to do is free Rika, and she'll tear them limb from limb. Alice grinned. Excellent. Get your best fire team to the ship and make sure it's ready to go. I'll inform Lieutenant Fuller that I'm borrowing some of his mechs. Allison saluted and left the CIC, feeling a bit uneasy about leaving without reporting in to Lieutenant Fuller herself. She was tempted to do just that, but he was clear across the spaceport, working with Third Squad to take out a final batch of Nietzschean holdouts. She didn't have time to hoof it over there and give him the information in person, so she would have to rely on Alice to pass on the news. Captain Chase? Lieutenant Fuller's voice carried a note of concern as it reached Chase's mind. What is it, Lieutenant? Chase asked as he strode into the spaceport's administrative building, ready to tear a strip off the Lieutenant Colonel for not responding to any of his inquiries over the last ten minutes. A ship just took off from the spaceport. A fast interceptor corvette, from the looks of it. Did you authorize that? Fuck, Chase swore. Lieutenant, have your platoon sound off. I think our battalion XO has just gone off mission. Less than 10 seconds later, Fuller was back. It's Allison and her fourth fire team. They're missing. Allison wouldn't go off on her own. This is definitely Alice's doing. Chase let out a few choice curses for the woman flow through his mind. He didn't know what she was playing at, but she'd picked the perfect time to make her move. There was no way Chase was going to send a team after her when Rika was missing. What should I do? Fuller asked. Nothing, I'll handle it. I don't think Allison would go AWOL. Alice must have tricked her. Stars, I wish we'd never brought that snake along. You and me both, Chase replied. He reached the spaceport CIC and set Potter's hardened case down on the edge of a holo table. You should really get a mobile frame sometime, Potter. Can you link in from here? Yes and yes. It is a bit awkward being carried around, but I also make for a smaller target. Okay, I have access to the visual feeds. I can confirm that Allison and her fourth team joined Alice on that ship, the Grey Goose. Can you reach them? Their transponders are off, and they're not responding on comms. Chase spun and paced across the room, feeling torn about leaving Allison in Alice's hands while Rika was also missing. What's wrong? A deep, timbred voice asked from the entrance to the CIC, and Chase turned to see the ISF colonel, Borden, it's that damn Alice, Chase muttered. She's taking five of my mechs and snuck off. Anyone I send after her could be someone I need to get Rika back. Never liked her, Borden ground the words out slowly. But Allison is good people. I'll go fetch them and bring Alice back in shackles. You focus on getting Rika back from the needs. Chase pulled his helmet off and strode to the ISF Marine, extending his hand. Borden pulled his helmet off as well, the two men's eyes meeting. You sure? Chase asked. Borden's usually stern expression cracked into a smile. I beat Jenison and Allison in a game of snark. They owe me too many credits to let them off this easy. Chase snorted. Well, we can't let that ride. Light speed to you, Colonel. And to you, Captain. You need to get your fleet after Rika. This world can take care of itself. It was going to have to anyway. The ISF colonel turned and walked out of the CIC, leaving Chase to consider his words. The man was right. They wouldn't have stayed around for long, but they also would not have left the people high and dry, at the mercy of any remaining neats and whatever thugs would be crawling out of their hidey holes. Lieutenant Clinn, he called up to the captain of the Azora. What's up, Chase? We're going after those fuckers who took the colonel yet? We are, but I have a special mission for you. A snort came over the link. <sighs> no can do, Captain. If the colonel is in trouble, the Asura is leading the charge to get her out of it. What if the alternate mission came with a promotion? Chase asked. A promotion? Clint's tone was guarded. To what? How does Governor of Kansas strike you? Among the Missing Stellar Date 10 Point twelve point eighty nine forty nine, Adjusted years. Location, the McWood Building, Memphis, Kansas. Region, Blue Ridge System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Damn it, Kelly swore as rail fire tore out of the McWood Building's loading bay, 
spraying across the street and tearing into the adjacent tower. Fucking neats just don't want to come out and play. Yig shook his head as the rail fire died off again. We could hit them full force, but we're not going to get into the building if we bring it down on their heads. We need some sort of distraction. The sky screams are too far away, dealing with a bunch of neats who still think shelling civvies is a good call, Kelly said, leaning back against a low marble wall. What do we need them for? Yig asked. You want them to get all the glory? Kelly gave the fire team leader a saucy wink, which she couldn't see with her helmet in the way, but she liked to do it just the same. Well, we could get them to carry us up top and drop us on the roof. So we have to fight our way down the whole building? Yig shook his head. Sounds stupid. Well, we just drop down the lift shaft. Or we go two blocks west and get into the maglev tunnels over there. Yig gestured to a low building that was adorned with signs indicating the various maglev tracks and their destinations. There's a dozen tracks down there. We need to start from the source. Kelly shot back. Have you two made it inside the building yet? Sergeant CJ's voice interrupted their argument. Almost. Yig said, at the same time that Kelly responded, not even close. Damn it, what are you doing out there, jerking each other off? CJ bellowed, an uncharacteristic reaction from the sergeant. They've got serious rails in there with heavy shields. We'd have to take the building down to get past them, Kelly explained. We're trying to figure out the best distraction. Well, you're in luck, because Crunch is halfway there. Is a behemoth a big enough distraction? Yig chuckled. <laughs> Crunch and a muth, that'll do. Great, Kelly muttered, just what I need. What, a muth not good enough for you? CJ asked. A coarse laugh escaped Kelly's lips. <laughs> sure, a behemoth is great, but Crunch already thinks he saved my life twice. He keeps talking about the third time being the charm. The charm? Yig sounded confused. The charm for what? Marriage? Cole said with a snicker as she took up a position near the pair, firing on a neat who had peered around a building's corner a block away. Crunch has the hots for Kelly, wants to better with his new man parts. Kelly could only groan as Yig burst into laughter. Stars, I can't wait to see this go down, he said when he'd finally regained control of himself. Cole snorted. <laughs> Was that an intentional euphemism? If so, well done. Five minutes later, Crunch's behemoth lumbered around a corner and came into view of the McWood building. The moment it was in sight, a pair of guided missiles fired from halfway up the building, streaking down toward the massive walker. The missiles had barely left the building when point defense chain guns spun up on the back of the behemoth, destroying both in seconds. Four more missiles streaked out from the tower, and the walker's guns made short work of them too shrapnel raining down on the street to the cheers of Kelly's and Yig's teams. The four-legged machine pivoted, and its main gun lifted off its back, firing a trio of 10-kilogram slugs at the locations where the missile fire had originated. The rail fired rounds tore clear through the building and the high-rise on the far side as well, before arching up over the city. Shit, Crunch, we're trying not to bring the thing down, Kelly admonished. I can do math and drive a walker, Corporal the sergeant replied. The building's at no risk of crumbling. Now go tell those neats to surrender before we shoot the building down on top of them. That's what we're trying not to do, what you just said you're not doing, Kelly retorted. Yeah, but we've just convinced them otherwise. Go tell them they have one minute. It'll work. Kelly shrugged and signaled Kelly and Shoshin to cover her as she crept down the street. Her stealth was shot with all the blood and grime that covered her, and she hoped no neats would try to take a pot shot from up high, something she supposed Crunch's rail shots had discouraged. Don't be timid, girl, Crunch admonished. I've got the building covered. They're not going to try anything. Girl, Kelly shot back. I'll show you, girl. That's what I'm hoping for, Crunch said, the grin that must have been on his face almost palpable in his voice. Third time, remember? Kelly didn't dignify Crunch's statement with a response and instead called out to the neats inside the loading bay at the base of the McWood building. Hey, dickheads, the sergeant the behemoth really wants to blow some more holes through your building. 
I kind of want to get down to the maglev line below, but he outranks me, so if you don't all get your asses out here on the street, unarmed, mind you, then he's going to get his way and take the whole thing down. Not much I can do about that, so now it's up to you, asshats. Think this thing is a big enough tombstone? She waited 11 seconds for the response, becoming more certain that the Neats must have a death wish as each moment ticked by. Then a hand waved around the corner, and a moment later, over 50 Nietzscheans came out of the loading bay and laid down on the street, hands behind their heads. Wow, you're all so well behaved, Kelly said as she stared at the enemy soldiers. I should get you all some extra tasty dog food later, a reward for being so good. Really hamming it up out there, Crunch said. Who said I'm hamming it up? We passed a big pet supply store a block back. Hey, where are you going? Yig said as he jogged to Kelly's side. I'll take my team in. You secure these neats. They clearly respect you. Yeah, Cole said as she approached the prone Nietzscheans. They didn't listen to Yig at all when he tried to get them to come out. But you went all mama bear on them, and they just rolled over. Kelly glanced at the enemy soldiers, nodding with appreciation at Shoshin as he moved amongst them, checking for weapons. Tell you what, Yig, we'll play rock, paper, scissors to see who goes after Leslie. Best of three? The corporal asked, and Kelly shook her head. No, sudden death, winner takes all. He shrugged, and they slammed their fists against their chests three times before showing their choices. Yig had his hand clenched in a fist, while Kelly swirled her fingers in a circle over his rock. What? No way, Yig exclaimed. Black Hole has a 30-day cooldown, and you? Aw, oh, shit. That's right, guard duty boy. I last used it 31 days ago. Kelly reached out and tapped him in the chest with a long pointed finger. Boom. Damn it, he muttered as he turned to the neats. Okay, you assholes. I want the first row to go stand against that building and get out of your armor. Then go and lay next to that fountain over there. As Yig gave the neats their orders, Kelly signaled Kelly and Shoshin to follow her into the loading bay. Let's go find ourselves a lost kitty. Yig glanced at Kelly as she walked into the bay. Hey, you mind taking Cole with you? She's likely to try and bench press a stack of neats if she has to guard them for too long. Fuck, Corporal, I'm right here, Cole muttered. Am I wrong? Yig asked her. Well, no. Kelly gestured for Cole to join her team, chuckling softly as they entered the bay. Cole's short for something, right? Kelly asked as she eased around one of the trucks, checking for ambushers or just neats who were too cowardly to exit the building. Yeah, Cole replied simply. Is Kelly short for something? Sure, Kelly. Shut it, Kelly ordered as she leaped onto the platform at the back of the loading bay and peered through the torn open doors of the elevator. Looks like something fun happened here, she said while sending a passel of drones down the shaft. Half a neat goon mech frame is down there, all shot to shit. Any signs of motion? Shoshin asked. Kelly stepped out into the elevator shaft, dropping the 20 meters to the bottom. Nope. A minute later, the four mechs stood on the maglev platform, looking for clues as to which way the train had gone. There, Kelly said, pointing at scuff marks on either side of the maglev rail. Those match the feet on the GM in the lift shaft. Weird, Shoshin grunted. Why are neat bots chasing after a neat train? Maybe Leslie took control of them, or they're chasing her and she's after the train, Kelly suggested. Well, we have our track and our trail, Kelly said as she hopped down onto the track and broke into an easy lope. Let's see where it leads us. It took Kelly and her team 30 minutes to get to the end of the track, thankful for the signs the Nietzsche and mech frames had left on the tracks. When they reached the end of the line, they found themselves on a deserted platform deep underground. One of the GMs went down here, Cole said from the far end of the platform, where she stood over the fallen form of one of the mech frames. Shells cracked. There was no one inside, but some neats died doing the deed. Signs of a fight up this staircase, Kelly said, her voice ringing out in the eerie silence of the platform. Kelly and Shoshin, you take that staircase. Cole and I will go up the one on the far end, Kelly said, and stop talking aloud. Okay, boss, 
Kelly replied. But this place is dead, no one's here. Doesn't mean they didn't leave surprises, Cole shot back. A giggle came from Kelly over the link. But I like surprises. Shut up, Shoshin said as he gestured for Kelly to follow him up the stairs. Kelly met Cole at the far end of the platform, sparing a glance for the twisted and still smoking wreckage of the mech frame. Takes a big boom to do that, she said while following Cole up the stairs. Lot of boom. Seems to be the order of the day, though. Kelly nodded. Got that right. They climbed up seven levels, each one showing varying levels of combat, destruction, and carnage, until they got to the ground level and came out into an utterly decimated courtyard. Holy shit, boss, Kelly said from the far side, where she and Shoshin had emerged. Leslie, let them have what for? Stop calling me boss, Kelly growled. You got it, mistress. Kelly only groaned while keeping her GNR level, sweeping its barrel before. Ahead was a landing pad, recently vacated by the signs of refueling lines. Got bodies here, Shoshin reported from behind a stack of supply crates. Nijian special forces, ten of them. Another mech frame here. Cole added from next to a coolant tank. Looks like this one was empty as well. There were four charging stations in the loading bay under the McWood building. Shoshin recalled as he walked toward a low structure on the far side of the landing pad. We need to find that last mech frame. Kelly had deployed drones and flipped through their feeds while her team examined the area. She set three of her drones to sweep over the low hills surrounding the bunker. A minute later, one of the eyes in the sky spotted a smoking crater a kilometer from the base. I'm going to check something out, she informed her team. Keep sweeping the base. A minute later, she was at the impact site. The remains of the fourth mech lay in the crater. The pilot's cocoon cracked open. Empty. Kelly saw something inside the cocoon and prized the two halves apart. I've got blood on the fourth frame, she reported looking up at the clear blue sky overhead. I'm going to sweep the area, but I'm starting to think that Leslie hitched a ride. We better be damn sure, Cole said. I'm not leaving till we know for a fact that the LT isn't here. Two needs her tail for luck. You want all of her back or just the tail? Kelly asked with a laugh. Kelly, Cole admonished. I can't believe you'd say that. Relax, Cole, Kelly replied. That cat's over two centuries old and still has at least six of her lives. Gonna take more than some piss at Nietzsche and brass to knock her down. They knocked Colonel Rika down, Shoshin said quietly. No one spoke for several minutes after that. A half hour later, they were certain that Leslie was not at the bunker. The silver lining was that wherever the captain was, chances were that she was near Rika. The two of them can take on anything. Kelly thought as she got ready to report into Captain Chase. They have to. Pulling up stakes. Stellar date 10.12.8949. Adjusted years. Location, MSS Furylance in orbit of Kansas. Region, Blue Ridge System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Dropping a battalion of mechs on a planet was a lot easier than getting them back into space again. In the end, Chase had left the behemoths and a squad of mechs under Vargo Klen's command to finish the cleanup and keep Kansas from devolving into chaos. He had no idea how 20 mechs would manage to maintain order across an entire planet, but Chase told Squad Sergeant Abs that if things got too messy on the surface, they were to hightail it into space and leave the Blue Ridge system behind. Star Smalls, is this the right move? He asked Captain Heather as he walked through the Fury Lance to the ship's bridge. There's no right move here, Chase, Smalls replied. This is a shit show start to finish. Alice, well, she's just a bucket of puke to top it off. Damn, Smalls, a bit too graphic there. The SMI-4 gave a throaty laugh. <laughs> Sorry, cooped up too long up here. Next time we hit dirt, I'm going down to smash some neats, and you can sit up here in the sky. We find those bastards that took Rika. We'll all go smash some neats, and Potter can manage the ship. Chase sent the reply over the command network, and Potter replied with a laugh. Stars, I'm glad to be back up here. 
the AI admitted. I'd gotten used to a few meters of steel between me and the enemy. I think if I do go off ship again, I'll take you up on a mech frame of some sort. I'll get a hamster wheel for you, Captain Heather's chuckle spilled over the network. We'll get some chain guns on it, and you can just roll around and blast neat. I don't think that would be very effective, Chase replied. Just you wait and see. Carson's already working on one. It's going to be epic. Chase resisted a groan. Chances were that Lieutenant Carson was doing no such thing, but he didn't have time to go check. Not only that, but the Lance was Heather's ship. He wasn't going to go checking up on her. Even if I am the de facto leader of Rika's marauders right now. The thought brought a weight with it, and Chase wished he could just lie down for an hour, try to catch his breath. How long till we're underway? He asked Heather instead. Not long, just have to get one last squad from Esmoian Station aboard. Okay, I'm going to send the capital ahead. Bugsy already has her in a higher orbit after chasing off the last of the Nietzschean cruisers. You worried they'll come back? Heather asked. He was, but he was more worried about Rika. Clint can fend them off. Worst case scenario, he can just smash the Azora into their ships. He's good at crashing things. You know I'm on the command, Ned, right? Vargo Clan asked. Know about it, Chase barked a laugh. I was counting on it. You good? Yeah, Clint replied. Abs has already set up shop at Memphis's spaceport and is organizing a group of locals to help police the city and get things back in order. They've told her about a resistance that's off in the mountains, so they're going to try and link up. Seems like some of the old planetary senators might still be out there, too. Chase nodded in appreciation. Pass on my congratulations. Remember, no martyrs. We're just doing the bare minimum to keep the planet from devolving into chaos. Don't worry, Captain. We'll keep things in line. You get Rika back safe and sound. That's a promise I can keep, Chase replied. Twenty-seven minutes later, the Fury Lance's mighty engines thundered to life, their thrums sending a vibration through the deck plates that no amount of agrav dampener calibration seemed to be able to deal with. Chase didn't mind. He liked the sensation. He could tell Captain Heather did as well. I wonder if Smalls tweaks the calibration just enough to keep the slight shutter in place. The Fury Lance's captain approached him, standing across the holo tank that displayed the Blue Ridge system. Those Nietzschean cowards gotta be heading to one of those three jump points, Heather said. They're the ones that lead deeper into Nietzsche, and they're closer than any others. Chase nodded. They're the most logical, agreed. On the holo tank, icons flashed showing the positions of the four marauder ships. Bugsy had the capital boosting for the furthest point, while Travis was taking the Republic to the second furthest. Ferris had the undaunted en route to a station which sat midway between the first and second points. It was still firmly under Nietzschean control, and a possible stopping point for Rika's abductors. The Fury Lance was headed for the closest of the three points, a marker currently 25 AU from the ship. At their current thrust, it would take the Lance two days to make their destination. What's got you looking like that? Heather asked, other than the obvious. Chase glanced up at the ship's captain. What makes you think there's something else? Isn't Rika being missing enough? Heather shrugged. Just seems like you're having reservations. He lifted a hand and ran it across his forehead, pulling it away greasy from sweat. I hate the thought that Leslie could still be back there. He jerked his thumb back to where Kansas lay. Not to mention the fact that fucking Alice took off with Allison and her team. How did this all go so wrong so fast? Allison can handle herself and we know that Leslie isn't back on Kansas. Heather shook her head. Kelly was thorough. You know that she of all people would not leave any stone unturned if it meant finding Rika. If she says there was nothing left at that bunker, then there was nothing left. Leslie got on the Nietzschean ship with Rika. As a prisoner? Chase asked. Heather only shrugged in response and he sighed. I'm gonna hit the sand. Let me know if anything changes. You got it, Captain. Stowaway. Stellar date 10.13.8949. Adjusted years. Location. NMSS Spine of the Stars. Region. Blue Ridge System. Old Genevia. Nietzschean Empire.
Even though Leslie's armor kept her warm, she couldn't help the shivers that continually racked her body. She knew it was psychosomatic, the result of knowing that she was crammed into a small compartment with the ship's landing gear, enjoying the cold vacuum of space. Or maybe it was that she was less than ten minutes from the end of her fresh oxygen supply. After that, she'd have to make do with only recycled air from her scrubbers. Even though she'd been tucked away in the Nietzschean ship's folded landing gear for hours, Leslie still felt like her heart was pounding in her chest. The fight at the Nietzschean bunker had been won for the books, and she couldn't help but think it a shame that no one else had been there to witness it. Using the three remaining goon mechs, she'd taken out dozens of neats, but hadn't managed to head off the enemy brass or their precious cargo. In the end, the ship had lifted off from the pad, leaving Leslie on the ground to slog it out with a group of their special forces soldiers. The GM had short burst jump jets, and Leslie had used them to boost up to the departing ship, getting within 10 meters, only to have it fire on her with its point defense cannons. The second shot had rent a hole in the pod, and Leslie had made a do-or-die decision. She'd jumped the final distance. At that point, they were over a kilometer in the air. She'd almost missed the ship, catching a single finger on a landing strut, before whipping her tail up and around the beam, barely clambering up its length before the strut had folded up into the ship. I didn't bite it out there, and I'm not going to freeze to death in here either, Leslie declared as she finally managed to breach the control systems for the maintenance hatch a meter above her head. I may not be all brained up like Rika, but this isn't my first time hacking my way into a Nietzschean network, even if it's taken hours. Though the hatch was now unlocked, she still had to get up to it. Thanking the stars that she hadn't mecked up along with Chase and Barn, Leslie wormed her way past the landing strut's armatures to the waiting hatch. After keying in the access code she'd lifted from the ship's network, Leslie pushed the hatch open and squirmed into the tiny airlock. She cycled it, begging the stars to let the tap she'd placed in the ship's maintenance network keep the airlock activation from showing on anyone's board. Last thing I need is to find the barrel of a gun in my face when the other side opens up. She fought the urge to close her eyes as the airlock's inner hatch opened, not that it would have mattered. Though she hadn't gone full mech, she had taken her share of mods from the ISF, and one of them was the ability to parse 360 vision. With her helmet pushing feeds into her mind, there was no way she could avoid watching the hatch open. However, nothing but an empty service tube awaited her, and Leslie offered up a silent thanks to the stars in Jerry's soul. She thought of him less these days, but Rika's comment earlier had brought him back to the fore. I bet you'd love this, Jerry, kicking Nietzsche and ass just like we were always meant to. Only this time we have them on the run. Leslie carefully assessed the ship's schematics in the maintenance system she'd tapped and downloaded the vessel's full layout. She'd not seen the ship's name before, but the map denoted the vessel as the spine of the stars, it was a rather large name for a ship that was somewhere between a corvette and a destroyer. It was small enough to boost out of a planet's gravity well without too much trouble, but large enough to carry the fuel to power its engines for a long burn, while running the reactors hot enough to power the ship's three dozen beams. A smile spread across Leslie's lips. Once she would have considered three dozen beams on a ship this size to be almost overkill, that was before seeing the I-class ships the ISF had built. 10,000 ships like the tub she was on wouldn't even come close to an I-class's firepower. Leslie put the comparison out of her mind and focused on her next task. Get her armor clean and repaired so her stealth would return to peak efficiency. Once she could move about the ship with impunity, she'd assess the enemy's strength and work out the best plan to free Rika. Though Leslie would have liked nothing better than to blast her way through the ship and rescue the colonel as quickly as possible, chances were that her friend was in the most heavily guarded portion of the ship. There could be dozens of neats and automated defenses waiting for her. She'd have to wear down their numbers first. Who are you? The man standing at the door to Rika's cell asked. Where did you get those Nietzschean ships you attacked Kansas with? Rika was still wrapped in the CF net, laying on the floor of her cell, arms pressed against her sides. 
Her power reserves had been working their way up over the past few hours, and she activated her armor's external speakers to respond to the man. I'm Colonel Rika, 9th Battalion, 7th Marauder Fleet. As to where I got the ships, pretty sure it was from your mom, right after I kicked her ass. A mech officer? The man's voice dripped with disdain. You Genevian mercs must be scraping the bottom of the barrel. That's where they kept us, Rika replied, her tone even. Lucky for you, if we'd been allowed to operate at our full potential in the war, I'd have your emperor over my knee right now. The man rolled his eyes and sighed. I highly doubt that. So you have my name and rank, what are yours? The man straightened. Fleet Admiral Gideon. Ah, the civilian killer himself. Rika gave a derisive snort. Pretty damn small fleet. I take it the rest got sent to Thebes? I guess they left the dregs behind. How's it feel to be down at the bottom of the barrel? Easy, Nikki cautioned. Doing my best here. I'm not gonna share intel with you, squib. Squib? Rika felt a laugh building. She did her best to stop it. Every muscle still ached, but the chortle broke free nonetheless. Well, this squib has killed more Nietzscheans than she can count. Gotta be closing in on a quarter million now, but that's nothing compared to what the Allies did to your people at Thebes. She gained a modicum of satisfaction as the Admiral's expression paled. Allies? Rika gave a small nod, all that she could manage. I guess technically it's called the Scipio Alliance, but it's really run by Field Marshal Richards of the ISF. She brought a fleet in that obliterated the forces your moron of an emperor sent into Thebes. My fleet chased after the cowards that ran away to Sepe. We mopped the stars with them and left their surviving ships for the Sepians to use in case any of you dickheads decide to wander into their system again. Halfway through Rika's recitation, Admiral Gideon began to shake his head. No, there is no way. Scipio is in a cold war with the hegemony. There's no way they could send a force large enough to Thebes. Not that they'd have any reason to. This guy really doesn't want to accept what's right in front of him, Nikki said with a laugh. <laughs> Your intel's ancient, Admiral Gideon, Rika scoffed, reveling in the act of turning this neat's world on its head. Scipio is in an active war with the hegemony now, but you missed the key point. The ISF is the driving force behind the Allies. Well, them and the Transcend. Either way, they crushed your fleet with a numerically smaller force and only lost a hundred ships doing it. You have no idea how outclassed you are. The Admiral's jaw tensed and he shook his head. Nice try, Squib, but that tail's a thousand clicks too tall. Curious what the I stands for? In your fantasy fleet? Sure. Intrepid. Remember that ship that showed up 20 years ago in the Balaam's world system? Remember how it had impenetrable shields and defeated five fleets on its own? The Admiral's eyes widened and he shook his head. They disappeared. Sure did. Rika wished the man could see her grin. And then they got busy. Some folks found them and poked the hornet's nest. Now they're bound and determined to get payback while knocking down all the asshole empires, Think Nietzsche is an empire of assholes? I sure do. The Admiral didn't reply. And Rika saw him cock his head, his eyes losing focus. Someone's interrupted your little bit of grandstanding, Nikki commented. Just when I was on a roll, too, Rika groused. The Admiral's face grew troubled, and he turned away, pausing to glance at Rika before the cell door closed. We'll have to continue exploring your fantasies later. I look forward to it, Rika said as her parting rejoinder. Stars, that was weak. I should have come up with something way more quippy, she said to Nikki. Well, you're injured. I suppose it can be forgiven. Leslie peered around the corner, checking to ensure that no enemies were in the corridor, biting back a curse when she saw a pair of men wrapped in one another's arms halfway down the passage. She cleaned her armor off as best she could in a maintenance closet, bringing her stealth effectiveness up to 72%. But that overall number didn't represent even coverage. 
patches of her armor had no stealth capability at all, making it all but useless at close range. She paused to consider her options. If I kill these two lovebirds, then I have to deal with bodies and I start the clock ticking. Leslie decided to see if she could slip past the pair. Given how into one another they were, she might just manage. If not, she'd take them out and deal with the consequences as they came. One of the men had untucked the other's shirt and pushed it up, his lips working their way across a well-muscled abdomen. Leslie wondered at the state of discipline in the Nietzschean military, that couples would just bang out in the open. Wouldn't surprise me if they just started fucking at some point. She held back a laugh, half wishing they would. There'd be no way they'd notice her then. Moving quietly and as slowly as she dared, Leslie was almost past the pair when a voice called out from behind her. Hey, what are you two assholes doing? Shit, Leslie thought, watching a burly sergeant stride into the passageway. Uh, hi, Sarge, the tummy-licking neat said, rising to his feet right next to Leslie. I'll show you, hi, Sarge. We got brass running for their scrawny little, what the fuck is that? Leslie could see that his eyes were fixed on her. More specifically, on a patch of armor on her shoulder that was completely visible. What? One of the lovebirds asked, then his eyes fixed on Leslie. Wait, there's- The man's words were his last, as Leslie extended her claws and tore out his throat with a single swipe. The other amorous neat cried out in horror as a spray of blood splashed across him, though the utterance was cut short as he suffered the same fate as his former lover. Leslie didn't give their deaths a second thought as she ran toward the sergeant, well aware that her form would be completely visible now, half covered in blood as she was. The sergeant unslung a weapon, but he was too slow. Leslie was already at his side, clawed fingers stabbing through a weak point in his armor where his pauldron met his chest plate. He cried out, but still had the presence of mind and ample strength to swing his rifle at Leslie's head. She'd been ready for a counterattack, and block the blow with her right arm while drawing her light wand and slamming the blade into his neck. It tore right through his light armor and jutted out the other side. She took a step back and watched the large soldier crumple before the sound of footfalls coming from around the corner sent her running further aft in the ship. We've got her cornered on the aft end of deck seven, sir. She might have made it down to deck eight, but we have it cordoned off as well. Sophia reported as Admiral Gideon strode onto the bridge. She? Gideon asked, scowling at the display showing the bloody mess on the port side of deck nine. Sophia flicked a finger, and the holo display shifted to show a woman in black armor, half covered in blood, sprinting through a passageway on the ship. Is that a tail? Gideon asked. Yes, this is the woman who breached the McWood building with Colonel Rika. I can only assume that she was in one of the mechs that pursued us down the maglev line. Tenacious bitch, Gideon muttered. I want her dead. We have enough trouble going on. Vent the entire aft half of the ship if you have to. She's in armor, General Decato joined in the conversation from where he sat at the back of the bridge. Vacuum may do her no harm. Kill Grav too, then, Gideon said with a sweep of his hand. Whatever can disadvantage her. I advise against that, Sophia said, her voice deferential and cautious. It's entirely possible that she's more adept in those conditions than our own soldiers. I don't care about our soldiers, Gideon shot back. It will disadvantage her. One shot in the right place, and she sucks vacuum and dies. The same is true for our troops, but we have over 50 of them. 48, Decato said. Both his tone and his posture shouting that he was entirely disinterested in the situation. But who's counting? Gideon was about to lay into the general, but saw that the pair of ensigns manning the bridge consoles were staring at the exchange with wide eyes. Attend to your duties, Gideon thundered before pointing at Decato. You, in my office, now. The general rose his posture still one of insolence, and sauntered off the bridge and into the passageway. Gideon's office was the first on the left, and Decato ambled in, the admiral storming after him, slamming the door once they were both inside. What the fuck is your deal, general? 
Gideon demanded, as Decato sat in one of the plaz chairs next to the desk. My deal? The general coughed out a laugh. Well, I took a bullet today, that was fun. So I'm basically just waiting to die at this point. Gideon frowned. From the shot? You're already patched up, you'll be fine. Decato's expression darkened and he rose to face Gideon. No, no, I won't be fine. You saw what these marauders can do. They dropped a company to take a planet. A planet, Admiral. And two of them, fucking skinny-assed women at that, killed their way through our HQ and almost took us out too. Almost, Gideon shot back. Well, yeah, we survived. But you seem hell-bent on giving them as many fucking chances as you can. You should have killed that mech colonel or left her behind. That might have slowed them down. Now she's on our ship, and so is one of our friends. They killed hundreds of our soldiers already. Do you really think that the fuckheads on this ship, lazy assholes who've never seen combat in their lives, will stand up to one of them? Watch it, Decato. Don't forget who you're talking to. The general leaned back in his chair and looked Gideon up and down. From where I stand, it's a dead man walking. Only way we make it out of this is if we kill the mech, set the reactor to blow, and get on a shuttle. Any other scenario sees us dead within half a day. Gideon couldn't believe what Decato was saying. The general wasn't the brightest or most ambitious of men, but he had never seemed so pathetic before. You're a fucking coward, the admiral screamed. I'll have you court-martialed. You? Decato snorted. <laughs> You'll be dead. You're not having anyone court-martialed. Gideon ground his teeth together as his vision turned red. He took a step back, snatched his sidearm from its holster, and pointed it at the general's head. The man's eyes grew wide. Then he slowly rose from his chair, the two men standing still for a moment, staring at one another in silence. Suddenly, Decato lunged for Gideon, and the admiral squeezed the trigger three times. After the general's body fell, he emptied the magazine into the former officer's head, turning it into a bloody pulp smeared across the deck. Pursuit. Stellar date 10.13.8949. Adjusted years. Location. Carl's Might on OutSystem Vector. Region. Blue Ridge System. Old Genevia. Nietzschean Empire. You sure we're headed to the right jump point? Genesa asked while frowning at the navigation console. The rest of the fleet is breaking up, heading for these other three jump points. Smokescreen, Lieutenant Colonel Alice replied, her tone nonchalant. We don't want to spook the Neats. If they think we're not hot on their tail, they'll let their guard down. Half the civilian ships in the system are headed for jump point right now. We're just blending in with the pack. Why not just come after them with the lance and crush them? Fred asked. I don't care what the Neats have. If they stay stealthed, the Lance can catch them no problem. Alice turned in the commander's seat to glare at Fred, who sat at the weapons console. And what if they break stealth and do a hard burn for the jump point? Yes, the Fury Lance is fast, but we know there are plenty of corvettes and destroyers that are faster. You want to lose, Colonel Rika? Fred's cheeks reddened as he shook his head. No, Colonel. Fred, take it easy. Allison sent privately to the corporal. Something is off, I can feel it too, but it could just be how secretive Alice is. We're used to more intel with our intel. If there's a chance we can save Rika, though, we take it. We're making good time at least. Sorry, Sergeant, Fred replied, only sounding a little contrite. I'll do my best not to poke the bear, but I don't like her, not even a little bit. Allison gave the lieutenant colonel a sidelong look. You're not alone. She gives cockroaches a bad name. Still, Rika has her in the chain of command, and we follow that chain of command. What if she does something that puts Rika at risk? Fred asked. Then I cold cock her and take over, Allison replied equably. Fred's laugh filled her mind. Can I be the one to do it? Fuck no, Corporal. There's a chain of command. Allison and her mech screwed the bridge in two-person shifts staying well-rested and alternating between card games and training sims, in which they practiced infill and takedown ops on ship types similar to what Rika's captors were flying, 
or what Allison suspected they were flying. All the while, Alice stayed on the bridge, accepting short sand breaks. Allison had kept tabs on the lieutenant colonel, and so far as she could tell, the woman hadn't slept in the 40 hours since they'd lifted off from Memphis's spaceport. Under her direction, the Carl's might continued to boost at the maximum velocity possible while maintaining the ship's stealth systems. The fact that the ship had stealth systems capable of functioning effectively under heavy boost was impressive in and of itself. Though the Carl's might was registered as a civilian craft belonging to Carl's shipping and trade, the mechs were certain that it was really a smuggler ship, possibly even a pirate ship. Whenever they weren't on duty or playing snark, the mechs were scouring the ship, trying to find evidence of what the might was really used for. There was quite the pull for whoever found concrete proof of either option. Fred and Cor were both of the opinion that it was just a smuggler ship, or perhaps a mostly legitimate courier vessel that sometimes hopped into systems that were less than friendly. Randy was on the fence and had wanted to put 50% of his credit on either outcome, but Jenna said scoffed at him, asking what the point of a bet like that was. In the end, he put in for smuggler. Certain that the ship was a pirate craft, Jenna said spent half her time tracing power conduits, trying to find where the hidden guns were located. Allison had recently discovered that the woman had pulled half the panels off the bulkheads in the lower decks and made her put them all back on. The last thing they all needed was Colonel Alice going on a rampage. No matter what the outcome of the mech's hunt for the ship's true purpose, Alice was certain of one thing. Carl was likely pissed that his ship had been taken by the marauders. The system's public feeds were running rampant with speculation over what was really going on. Some people thought that the marauders were just pirates, while others were hailing them as saviors, come to lift the Nietzschean boot from their necks. There was worry about trade and the damage to Memphis, as Moyen Station and the locations that 3rd and 4th platoons had hit. The strangest news of all was that Vargo Clan was functioning as the system's governor pro tem until the locals sorted themselves out. Genesa had laughed for a solid ten minutes when they got that news. During that time, she'd managed to wheeze out seven words. Captain Chase is off his fucking gourd. Cora had commented that he had no idea what a gourd was, but he agreed that Chase was off something. Fred, however, had nodded sagely, saying that Clint had prior experience with system administration, but wouldn't elaborate, saying it was Clint's story to tell. Despite the fact that the mechs were making the best of the situation they'd found themselves in, Allison worried about what they'd do if the ship they were pursuing jumped to a heavily populated Nietzschean system, deeper in the Empire. The mechs were all too willing to breach an enemy ship, but they were less enthusiastic about assaulting an entire system, at least with Alice at the helm. Any updates? Allison asked as she entered the bridge and settled into the navigation station's low seat, too low for a mech to sit comfortably. Yeah, I picked up their shadow a few minutes ago, Alice said, gesturing to the bridge's secondary holo display, which showed a Corvette-class vessel very similar to the Carl's might. Allison plotted its route and shook her head. They're going for this jump point, all right, but we're five hours behind. Even if we pour on full thrust, we won't catch them before they make the jump. I know, Alice said, scowling at the display. We'll have to follow through. I sent a tight beam to Chase. He's going to shift course as soon as the neats leap out. We don't want them to know we're on to them. Allison glanced over her shoulder at the lieutenant colonel. Where could they be going, colonel? There aren't a lot of systems in this direction. Not for 50 light years. And then we'll be on the far edge of old Genevia, just a dozen light years from where the border with Nietzsche used to be. Alice nodded. Yeah, their trajectory is almost directly aligned with the Iberia system. Last time I was through there, it wasn't anything special. But maybe the Neats have a Sector HQ out there or something. Either way, they're not going to get Rika. Allison gave a resolute nod, but didn't feel nearly as certain as the gesture made her seem. Core, she reached out to the AM-4 on the team's encrypted combat net. It wasn't secured from Alice joining in, but they'd know if she did. What's up, Sarge? You were searching through the ship's supplies earlier. Any chance this tub has comboys or something like that on it? Uh, yeah, I might have seen some. Why? Because I want to start a new message relay network and make millions. Allison shot back. 
Shit, Cor, because I want to leave a message for Captain Chase once we jump. What, we're going to jump? Can't we catch those bastards first? That's not how the LTC wants to play it. Cor made a gagging sound. Okay, there's got to be a relay or a transponder or something. I'll hunt around on the QT. I assume this is on the down low, right? You're a smart cookie, Cor. Yeah, we'll load it up with a data burst about where we're going and the shit we're chasing. I don't know what Alice has up her sleeve, but I don't trust her. That makes, well, all of us. I'm on it. I'll let you know when I'm ready for the data. Allison simultaneously felt marginally better and exponentially worse. Either this was the smartest thing she'd done all week or the dumbest in years. Probably both. The Jump Stellar Date 10.14.8949 Adjusted Years Location MSS Furylands on OutSystem Vector Region Blue Ridge System Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Sir, Chief Garth called out from the scan console, twisting in his seat to catch Chase's eye. I spotted a ghost, three and a half light seconds from the jump point ahead. Chase turned from where he'd been standing at the main holo tank, contemplating his options and considering whether or not he should send a message back to Thebes for help. A ghost? Just for a moment, it looked like a strange heat bloom and some ionized gas. Best guess? A ship venting atmosphere. It could have mixed with the engine's plasma and fouled their stealth systems for a moment or two. Chase glanced at the Fury Lance's position. They were 14 light seconds from the jump point, too far to catch an enemy vessel before it would be able to transition to the Dark Lair. Chief Ona, Captain Heather said, rising from her chair. Shift us off our current vector a degree starboard and cease thrust. Heather? Chase asked glancing at the captain as she approached. We don't have enough data to gauge their trajectory, and if we fly through that cloud of gas, we'll lose any chance of carefully examining it. We need to slow up and send out probes. They can gather more data, and we can build up a model of exactly where the ship that vented Atmo was headed. Chase hated the idea of more delays, but he knew that a blind jump out system wasn't a viable option. They needed to know precisely where the Nietzschean ship was headed, then they could see if it lined up with the system. Then they would have a target. Good thinking, Smalls, he acknowledged. I know, right? I'm not just all beauty and great aim with the GNR. Some brains up here, too. Chase snorted and turned back to the holo. Wherever that ship is headed, it has to be our Nietzscheans. Ferris hasn't found any signs at Telus Station that their brass fled there. The Republican capital haven't spotted Bupkis, either. Bupkis? Heather asked. That a technical term? Yeah, means we've only got one lead and it's weak as all get out. It shouldn't take too long to get probe data, Heather said. Once we get it, we can boost hard to the point and jump. Our other ships can catch up afterward. Chase nodded and settled back into waiting. He tried to be patient, but worry constantly nodded his gut. Fear that Rika would end up in some interrogation chamber on the far side of Nietzsche and he'd never find her. He knew that the longer the pursuit dragged on, the less likely he was to ever see her again. This wasn't like when she'd been sold at auction. The Neats didn't want to use her because she was a mech. They'd extract what they wanted and then kill her because of what she was. Twenty minutes later, the probes had reached the slowly dispersing cloud of ionized gas. Data fed back to the ship, and Potter used the Fury Lance's tactical systems to build up a model of the gas's motion and origin point. Definitely vented Atmo. I've got traces of other gases that hint at a firefight, too, Potter announced an excruciating 34 minutes later. Model has 93% confidence on the ship's vector, putting it up on the main tank. As the Nietzschean vessel's flight path came up, Chase frowned. You sure about this? There's nothing on that trajectory, nothing up to five degrees off, and they're too close to the point to course correct that far and not break stealth. I checked the data a dozen times before I passed it along, Potter assured him. I'm as confused as you. That vector won't have them getting within a light year of a single star until they're nearly out of the Orion arm. Damn it, Chase muttered. That, sir? Chief Ona said from her station. I might have something. I'll take anything right now, he admitted. Well, I have a copy of some old charts that General Mill kept of Genevian space. 
He shared them with all the ship's pilots. They have a bit more detail than what are in the Lance's astrogation systems. And? Heather asked. Well, it's not much, but there's a marker seven light years from here that's on our ghost ship's vector. It's a Q9. Q9? Chase asked. Large mass rogue planet, Heather supplied. Just a cold ball of gas drifting in the interstellar darkness. Chase pursed his lips. Some sort of black side? Stands to reason, Potter said. Heather, get us on a course for that Q9. Inform the fleet that they're to follow us immediately. That's our target. You got it, Captain Chase. I'll coordinate a rally point on the other side, Heather replied. Will you go get some sleep now? You've been pacing across my bridge for two days. Chase grimaced but nodded. Yeah. I should be rested for when we kick those Nietzschean asses clear across the galaxy. That's the spirit, Heather said with a laugh. At the door leading off the bridge, Chase paused to look back at the holo display just as Garth half jumped out of his chair. I got them. Them? Chase asked, striding back onto the bridge. Uh, sorry, sir. Allison Allison. Well, Allison at least. She sent a message via a relay drone. This better be good. Chase muttered, put it up. Garth nodded, and Allison's voice came over the bridge's audible systems. Yeah, yeah, I know. Shut up, core shit. It's recording already? Why didn't you? Never mind. Captain Chase, this is Sergeant Allison. Lieutenant Colonel Alice pulled us onto this mission saying she has intel on where Colonel Rika is, but she's being mighty tight-lipped. It smells to us, but not so much that we're ready to mutiny over it. If you know all about this, then hopefully you won't be too pissed. But if you don't, we're going to the Iberia system. One hell of a jump, so we'll be playing a lot of snark. Alice says that you're all going to follow after once the neats jump out. So given that we're jumping into the lion's den here, I really hope that's the case. A burst is following with our coordinates, vector, and route. Hope we see you on the other side, Sergeant Allison out. Oh shit, Chase muttered, rubbing a hand against his face, forgetting that it was a mech hand and stopping before he scratched his forehead. Borden is still on their tail, Ona said. Is twenty light minutes behind, though. Chase sighed, nodding slowly. Doesn't feel right to send the ISF after them and not Mex. A hand touched his shoulder and he turned to see Heather's serious eyes. Borden's the best of the best. You've seen the ISF in action, good as Mex. He'll bring them back. Pass him Allison's intel. Tell him to bring them back here. This is where we'll regroup. Heather gave Chase a light push. We know how to do our jobs. Go, get food, sleep. Come back when you smell better. A laugh slipped past Chase's lips. I'm a mech, I don't smell. Mech, yeah, but you opted for real skin on your noggin. Heather leaned closer and sniffed his hair. Go wash it. Chase shook his head and walked to the bridge's exit. Okay, I can take the hint. Let me know if anything changes. Go already. Heather said, rolling her eyes. Chores. Stellar date, 10.14.8949. Adjusted years. Location, MSS Asora, in orbit of Kansas. Region, Blue Ridge System. Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Do what you can, Abs, Vargo said from where he stood on the bridge of the Asora. I'll try to keep piracy at bay while you keep the populace from panicking. Abs folded her arms and glared at Vargo, two of the mechs in her squad visible behind her in the Memphis spaceport CIC. Easy for you to say from up there, Clan. Normally, I'd say a squad of mechs are enough for any task, but I've got a whole planet of people down here, and at least 10,000 Nietzschean soldiers still hold up here and there. Shit's a bit nuts. Soon as we complete our next orbit, we'll lob shots at that bunker Musil's team found, Vargo assured her. Make sure they stay clear. We're gonna nuke it to save our kinetics from our surgical strikes. What about this senator who's shown up, demanding to be put in charge? Abs asked, a look of worry on her face. I can shoot neats all day, but politicians scare the fuck out of me. Vargo coughed out a laugh. Not what we thought we'd be doing on this mission, is it? Fuck no, Abs groaned. I hate sitting back here, babysitting. But these are our people, right? They're the ones we've wanted to free from Nietzsche for the past decade. It's just, just why are they all such a bunch of whining assholes? Vargo completed the sergeant's statement, 
Yeah, that's the nice way of putting it. Thought we'd get more gratitude, less bitching, Ab said, her voice dour. Don't let the few complainers get you down, Vargo replied. People really do appreciate what we've done here, or they will eventually. I could do with eventually showing up really soon. Someone yelled something behind Ab's and she rolled her eyes. So what about little Senator Nea? She continued. Vargo sighed and closed his eyes for a moment before responding. Send her up here in a shuttle. Hopefully it'll make her feel all important, and maybe I can talk some sense into her. What I really need Senator Nea to do, and Lieutenant Governor Wilcox if we can get him out of hiding, is rally the people to support us, not pester us with inane requests. Getting all up in arms about every little thing that has peeved them off over the last decade is not helping. Ab snorted. Well, good luck with that. Honestly, she's not that bad. But she keeps trying to get involved in every local detail. Maybe once she's up there with you, it will help her see the big picture. Oh, shit. I have a bunch of locals demanding that we round up Nietzsche and sympathizers. I have to go. Good luck with that, Sergeant. Vargo out. Sounds like a blast down there, sir, Chief Ashley said from the Azora's weapons and comm station. With the marauders stretched thin, it was just the two of them on the bridge, while warrant officers Glenn, Jakari, and Lexi were down in engineering. One thing was for certain. Four people on a 500-meter destroyer made the place feel all but deserted. Glenn, a shuttle is going to be coming up from the surface with a Genevian senator that we have to make feel all important. Can you coordinate with ground control and then show the senator to the bridge when she arrives? A senator? Glenn asked. We playing host to dignitaries now? She was giving abs hives. Glenn gave an exaggerated sigh. I guess this is one of those burdens of rank things they always talk about. I was hoping that was all hyperbole and that our lives were just going to be getting into big battles and blowing away neat. A laugh came from Glenn. <laughs> Honeymoon's over, eh? So it would seem. Well, Captain, I got your back here. I'll have that senator in your lap, or on the bridge, soon as she arrives. Stars, maybe I should have Lexi escort her up. Glenn laughed and closed the connection without responding. Fuck, Vargo muttered as he leaned back in his chair. Glenn? Ashley asked. Vargo made a strangled sound. How'd you guess? You have a special sigh for Glenn. He gave a slow shake of his head. I blame Rika for all this. A month ago, I was the one that was all cocksure, mouthing off to the mechs and officers, flying like a maniac. Now I'm the captain, all respectable? How'd that happen? Ashley giggled and Vargo shot her a cold look. You giggling at me, chief? Pretty sure I'm tittering, captain, Ashley teased. Besides, you got your wish. You're a mech now, and not a shitty GAF mech. You're an ISF-built fourth gen. A smile lit Vargo's face as he looked down at his hands, and he smiled. Yes, I am, Ashley. Granted, so are you now, and here we both are, up on this ship instead of down in the dirt kicking ass. Ashley gave a forearmed shrug. We'll get our chance soon enough. I've been doing drills with the old timers to get ready. How have you been doing? He asked the chief who had opted to become one of the new LHO models. I remember you were wishing you'd not gone for the extra arms at the outset. The chief lifted all four of her upper arms in the air and snapped her fingers in time. I'm starting to get the hang of it. The ISF med techs warned me that it would take a bit for my brain to adjust to the mods they made. Ashley stopped and giggled again. A sound that Vargo found himself liking more and more each time he heard it, before continuing. For a while, I kept getting my second set of arms and my legs mixed up. Had some embarrassing moments in the mess, once I tried to pick up a tray with my foot for a solid minute before I got it worked out. I guess we all have our crosses to bear, Vargo replied with a wink. Shit, we're coming back around. You ready to nuke some Nietzscheans? Ashley tossed Vargo a winning smile. And you say we never get to have any fun. Family. Stellar date 10.14.8949. Adjusted years. Location, NMSS Spine of the Stars Nearing Jump Point. Region, Blue Ridge System. Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. We're getting there, Rika said to Nikki as the power levels finally made it up to 40%. 
Are things ready to start eating the net? Yeah, I can recall the nano we used to build the induction loop and start them on the net. Once they get going, it shouldn't take long. Good, Rika said, groaning softly as she tried to shift. I'm cramped in places I didn't even know could cramp. Really? Nikki seemed curious. Where? Stars, Nikki, it's just a saying. Oh, the AI sounded disappointed. I thought maybe you were yearning for Chase with your intimate bits. Nikki? She laughed in Rika's mind. Sorry, I'm getting bored, trapped here. I want to breach this network, crush the neat, and get the hell off this ship. Solid plan, I like it. Are you mocking me? Nikki asked, sounding perturbed. Just a bit. Rika couldn't help but laugh at her AI's attitude. I don't think it's funny. Rika let out a groan. What, a few days laying on the floor with no link and you get all twitchy? Even when I've been stuck on ships in the black, I still had a network to stretch out on, a crew to interact with, a ship to maintain, Nikki reminded her. Rika thought back to all the time she'd spent in isolation as a mech. I once got racked for transport, and they didn't set up the enforced sleep cycle. I was awake for over 70 hours before anyone noticed. Nikki was silent for a minute. Okay, that's worse. Great thing about having been a mech in the GAF, no matter what happens, I always have a worse experience to look back on. It's the gift of never-ending perspective. The AI chuckled. I guess you earned that. You know, almost a year in your head, well, some of it in your gut, and you're still a mystery to me. How so? Well, you should be jaded, cold, hard, mean. Stars, even without what the GAF did to you, without the war, just losing your parents and growing up on the streets. Shit, Nikki, Rika replied, laughing aloud. You trying to depress me? I don't know if I could. You're like the eternal optimist. Never once has the thought crossed your mind that we might not make it out of this, has it? How do you do it? Easy, Rika gave the mental equivalent of a shrug. I'm not going to let them win. I won't give them the satisfaction. See, that, that should make you cold and jaded. Nikki's voice was filled with frustration. Why aren't you? Why? Rika was surprised to get this line of questioning from an AI. Because my own state of mind is the one thing I always have full control over. I can choose to perseverate on all the bad things that have ever happened to me, or I can think about the good. I can change my emotional state through what I choose to focus on. Rika's statement was met by silence from the AI. Eventually, she asked, how did you get to be so wise at such a young age? A smile graced Rika's lips, and the 360 view of the cell faded from around her, replaced with visions from the past. I had a great teacher, more than one actually. They taught me that family is always with you, if you let it be. Deep down, everyone hates feeling lonely, and they want to connect with others. Sometimes they give up on that, but if I had, I'd be dead. Family is what got me through everything. You're a glorious mystery, Rika. Nikki's voice was filled with appreciation. I assume one of these teachers was Silva? Sure was, but she wasn't the first. The last time I ran away from foster care, and it wasn't because of them, it was because of me, I met the station gang. They were rough. They weren't afraid to get into it and draw blood in a fight, but they always protected their own. It was the first time I'd felt that since, since my parents died. The state never treated us orphans like we were of much value to them. Foster parents cared, but they were usually overwhelmed by kids who were dealing with the loss of everything in their lives. But bro, he cared. Bro, what kind of name is that? Nikki asked. Rika laughed at the memory. Bro was the leader of the gang. I guess the name came from a speech he always gave the noobs. He'd start by pacing back and forth in front of them usually in the old sanitation bay we hid in, and say, I'm not your father. If you're here, your father is dead. I'm not your mother. Chances are she's gone too. If you do have a mother and father, and you know where they are, you'd best get your sorry ass back to them before one of us kicks your ass for leaving family. But if you got no family out there, then you got family here. Us. This gang. But keep one thing firmly in your scrawny little heads. There are no parents here. I'm your brother. Means I'll kick your ass if you're being a dickhead, and I'll probably make fun of you half the time, because that's what brothers do. Ain't that right, Jeb? Rika chuckled before continuing. 
marveling at how clear the memory still was. At that point, he'd always look at Jeb, who usually had a black eye or a busted lip, more often than not, courtesy a brow. And Jeb would just laugh and say, Yep, but don't worry, I'll take your licks if you're too scared. Everyone knew that was true, too. If you really fucked up, you could tell Jeb and he'd go tell bro it was his fault, and bro would kick Jeb's ass in front of everyone. He'd make it look good, but never really hurt Jeb much. When you watched Jeb take licks for you, you straightened up and got your shit together. Plus, if you asked Jeb to take a beating for you a second time, he'd give it to you himself. Bro would slap him on the back for it and maybe throw a punch or two himself. That worked? Nikki asked, surprise mingling with disbelief in her voice. Most of the time, Rika allowed. I only saw Jeb lay into someone twice. Once, we had a guy who touched some of the younger girls and boys in a way that wasn't right. It got out that it was going on, but the little ones wouldn't say who did it. Finally, the guy came to Jeb and confessed. Jeb killed him on the spot. Shit, Rika. Did you ever have it easy? Rika thought back to her youth. The faint memory of her mother's smile on a warm summer morning and laughing as her father tickled her. I did. I had a lot more happiness in my memories than a lot of kids in Bro's gang. I always considered myself one of the lucky ones. Anyway, Bro always finished his speech with, but anyone outside the family picks on you, beats you, hurts you, I'll be the first out of the gate to take them down. And I'll let you get some licks in on him too. Teach you how to stand up for yourself. Make you a fighter. Nikki laughed at that. Rika, even your happy memories are on the hardcore side of things. Rika chuckled, wondering where Bro and his gang were now. She'd been out raiding another gang on the station and got scooped up by the feds a year after joining his troop. The Genevians took her planet side and stuck her in an orphanage in Tanner City. It wasn't too much later when she got framed and turned over to the GAF for mechanization. Bro was a big part of how I made it through what the GAF did to me. He really taught me how you could make the best of even a terrible situation. Silva carried on that trend. You really look up to her, don't you? Nikki asked. She's the reason I'm here today. I probably would have gone out of my way to eat a bullet if it weren't for her. I'd only been part of her team for a day, when she pulled me behind a stack of ammo crates on some star's forsaken moon we were protecting for reasons that still don't make sense to me. She jammed a finger in my chest at least a dozen times while telling me that she wasn't going to have any mopey whiners on Team Hammerfall. Told me that there was still a woman's heart in my chest, that she'd seen enough of them shot out to be sure, and that she'd take care of me in my heart, but only if I proved to her that I was going to put in my share of effort in the job. Shit, Rika. Nikki said with a laugh. You just got the tough love speech coming and going. Except for Chase, Rika said wistfully. He's never given me the tough love speech. Though I might have given it to him once or twice. End of the day, though, I don't forget my past. I don't push it down and try to pretend it didn't happen. That may work for some, but I keep it close. It gives me strength. There was one other thing that built her up and gave her strength but Rika didn't share the vision that Tannis had put in her mind. The image of the pillar of strength, standing on the bald prairie, holding out against the raging storms and sheltering those around her. That was just for her. That was her last bastion of strength if all others gave out. I guess I can see how this really isn't much of a tribulation for you, Nikki said after a moment. Oh, the net's weakened enough for you to get through. And the guards? We should probably get eyes on the corridor before I bust out of this stupid thing. Already on it. I have a passel of probes getting around the door right now. The Neats have decent countermeasures, but they're not prepared for an airborne nanocloud. Say the word. Rika checked her light one status, ready to end the Neats who thought they could hold a mech captive. Nikki set a 27-second countdown on Rika's HUD. When it hit zero, Rika stretched her arms and legs out, shredding the back of the net. She was on her feet a second later, net hanging from her GNR's ammo feeder, fingers dinging in between the door and its frame. And go. The lock snicked, and Rika wrenched the door open, flinging the net at the closest of the four guards and kicking him in the gut as he stumbled backward. Across the narrow passage, a sharp-witted woman raised her rifle, 
but Rika's light wand was already out, and she slashed the weapon in half, cutting through the power supply in the process. The energy cell exploded, knocking the woman back against the bulkhead. One of the two remaining guards had brought his rifle to bear and fired a pulse blast at Rika that she easily shrugged off before slamming her barrelless GNR into the woman's head, smashing her face shield. The staccato beat of projectile rounds struck Rika in the back. She'd seen the soldier behind her taking aim, but knew her armor could withstand a few shots. He only got seven off before she pivoted and tore the rifle from his grasp with one of her clawed feet. She continued to spin around, slamming the rifle into the woman with a smashed face shield, then completed the rotation to bring the weapon all the way back to its original owner, driving the gun stock into his neck so hard that the weapon crumpled, bending around the soldier's shoulders. He went down in a shrieking lump, and Rika kicked him in the head to silence his wailing. By that point, the first guard had gotten free of the net, only to have Rika's hand clamp down on his head. She lifted him off his feet and hurled him down the corridor into the fleeing back of the woman whose weapon had exploded. Moments later, Rika was upon them. She dispatched the man before kneeling atop the woman, light wand held close enough to her face shield that tendrils of electricity arced from the electron beam to the woman's armor. Where are my guns? Rika demanded. What? My GNR's barrel and my rifle. Stuff that goes pew pew. Where are they? The woman's hand rose, pointing the other way down the corridor. First left, second door on the right. Take your helmet off, Rika growled. What? I don't have time, you Nietzsche and asswipe. Take it off or I rip it off. Trust me, you won't like that. The woman's trembling hand rose to her helmet, and she gave it a sharp twist, lifting it off. Beneath the black visor was a woman who still had the freshness of youth about her. Rika imagined the girl wasn't much over twenty years old. Her blonde hair was shorn close to her head, and her green eyes were wide with fear. Rika lifted her hand to strike the woman on the side of the head. But she paused staring down at the girl who was the same age she'd been when the GAF conscripted her. In that moment, a weapon discharged, and Rika felt rounds ricochet off her armor. She glanced down to see the neat holding her sidearm against Rika's torso. Stupid, she muttered, and brought her hand down into the woman's temple. Not hard enough to kill, but hard enough to make the woman wish she'd never enlisted. Then she turned and ran down the corridor in the direction the woman had indicated, hoping she hadn't been played. That's what I get for thinking of them as people, she said to Nikki as she rounded the corner. Maybe when all this is over, they can be people again, but until then, they're just enemies. It's my life or theirs. I get that, Nikki said in a quiet voice. You still didn't kill her, though. I'm no murderer. Reaching the prescribed door, Rika kicked it in to reveal a small armory and a very surprised-looking Nietzschean in his service uniform. I'm here for what's mine, she growled. The man hesitated, glancing at a nearby rifle. Rika took a step closer, not having to manufacture any menace on her voice as she said, You even think twice about trying it, and I'll pull your tongue out your asshole. The Nietzschean swallowed nervously and pointed to a bench across the small room, where Rika's GNR barrel and AC-9CR lay. I'll get them, he whispered hoarsely. Don't do anything like that, please. Chop, chop, buddy. Rika, Nikki's voice sounded uncertain. I think there's someone else on the ship. Someone? It's Leslie, they have her trapped. Leslie fired a series of pulse blasts down the corridor with a pistol while swapping a magazine on a projectile rifle she'd taken off a dead Nietzschean. She wasn't certain how many of the enemies she'd taken out yet, but it had to be at least 15, though three of that number were iffy. If the ship had a good med suite, they might be back in the fight before long. Her probes alerted her to movement on the other end of the corridor, and she lifted the rifle, firing on a Nietzschean who was crossing an intersection aft of her position to get a better angle on her. Fuckers are going to totally flank me. She lobbed the last of the pulse grenades she'd lifted off a dead neat down the fore end of the corridor and turned to run aft, glad to have reached a section of the ship that was aired up. Just an hour earlier, the neats had vented half the ship and killed the agrav systems. 
Leslie didn't mind either one of those situations. She was better in zero-G than the enemy soldiers. But half her pilfered arsenal was made up of pulse weapons, and they didn't work in vacuum. She reached the intersection that the enemy soldier had rushed across seconds earlier and turned the corner, ducking low and catching him in the legs as he leant around the cover to fire on her. The impact bowled him over, and Leslie slashed at his face shield with her light wand, cutting through the dense plaza and into his jaw. A warbling shriek came from the Nietzschean, but it was cut off as Leslie twisted the blade and drove it up into his brain. Stars, I'm never going anywhere without one of these ever again. Shots streaked over her head, and then a searing pain erupted in her shoulder. Leslie's 360 vision highlighted a pair of drones swinging around the corner 20 meters forward of where she crouched. They were large, meant for ground operations, and were having trouble staying stable in the narrow confines of the passage. But that wasn't stopping them from firing on her. She took off running, and another round pierced her below the ribs on her right side, causing her to stumble and nearly fall. Keep going, Leslie. You've made it this long. A Nietzschean drone's not going to be the end of you. She reached the end of the corridor and turned left, toward the entrance to the engineering bay. Before she even reached it, she could see the door glowing hot on her IR overlay, and she realized that it must have been welded shut. Fuck, she swore, knowing that there was nowhere left for her to run. One of the drones came around the corner and she spun, unloading a magazine of projectile rounds on the thing and knocking it out of commission. You may take me out, Leslie screamed down the passageway, but you're gonna have to do it your motherfucking selves. A Nietzschean soldier in heavy armor rounded the corner. A chain gun leveled at her. You want it up close and personal? You got it, he growled. A flash of abject terror came over Leslie. I'm gonna die. She drew from unknown reserves and forced the fear down, a feeling of sorrow-tinged peace taking over. I tried, Rika. She squared her shoulders and threw her head back. Go on then, asshat. She swore at the Nietzschean, determined not to let him hear the sadness she felt. I'm not going to fuck you first. The Nietzschean chuckled as the chain gun spun up. I won't close my eyes, I won't. Plus I can't, stupid helmet, Leslie thought with a manic laugh as she stared down the weapon that would be her demise. Only to see it explode as a white hot flash tore through the chain gun. The remains of the weapon were wrenched from the soldier's grasp and slammed into the thick bulkhead that divided the engineering section from the rest of the ship. What the? Leslie whispered. A boom sounded. One must have accompanied the first shot as well, but she hadn't heard it, and the Nietzscheans had ceased to exist. There was only one weapon she knew of that made a sound quite like that, an SMI's GNR. Seconds later, Rika raced around the corner, stopping atop the fallen body of the Nietzschean. Stars, Leslie, are you okay? You're covered in blood. Leslie stood mute for a moment, gasping for breath, until she finally managed to say, it's not mine. Well, most of it isn't, at least. Rika glanced back the way she'd come. Looks like engineering is sealed up. We need to get to the bridge. Leslie looked at her commander, the woman who just couldn't be stopped and began to laugh, feeling tears stream down her cheeks. What's so funny? You? Do you? Leslie managed to gasp before gaining a modicum of control. Do you realize that every time I try to rescue you, you rescue me instead? Rika shrugged. Not my fault you're the perennial damsel in distress, Leslie. We all have our part to play. Damsel, Leslie growled as she approached Rika. I'll show you a damsel. Let's go kill some neat. Gotta love your gumption. Rika was about to slap Leslie on the shoulder as the woman approached, when she saw the biofoam filling a wound there. Damn, how many places are you hit? Um, four that breached armor, Leslie counted, glancing down at herself. You're one tough kitty, Nikki added. How many lives you use up here? Just the one. When they shot down the mech frame I was in, I leaped the final ten meters to the ship's landing struts, thought I was going to do an impression of a meteor, Leslie replied to the AI, was saved by my tail. Dang, how far up were you? Rika asked. Few clicks. I probably could have survived it, but I would have needed a new everything. The tail can only impart so much luck. Rika snorted as she turned back the way she'd come. 
There are probably some neats forming up in my wake. I didn't kill them all, just blasted through. Compliment on the ship is 65 all told, Nikki supplied. 51 troopers, then the naval personnel in the brass. I got at least 15. Leslie put her tally on their combat net. And I got 12, Rika added hers, not seeing any overlap. So we're looking at 24 more grunts out there. Leslie jerked a thumb over her shoulder, and probably half a dozen in engineering. I have feeds in there, I count five, Nikki reported. So 22 altogether, Rika said as she reached the next intersection and checked the cross passages before proceeding. 60 meters and two decks to the bridge, piece of cake. It was a hard slog through the ship. The neats threw everything they had at the two marauders, eventually venting atmosphere and killing the agrav across the entire ship. Rika was surprised they'd made such a silly mistake. A mech was just at home in zero G as full gravity, and Leslie moved like a ballet dancer, floating through the passageways and holding everything in sight. Thirty minutes later, they had reached the final ten-meter corridor that ran to the bridge. Executive offices lined the sides, and the last nine enemy soldiers had taken up positions in them, desperately trying to hold off the two marauders' unrelenting assault. Leslie had picked up a chain gun a deck down and was spraying rounds into the corridor with wild abandon, the barrage tearing through the bulkheads and into the rooms beyond. Careful, you don't tear a hole right into the bridge, Rika cautioned. Nikki laughed. I think that the bulkhead separating the bridge can take it. What's so funny? Leslie asked. I'm pissed at these asshats. No one takes my Rika and tries to fly off with her, then nearly kills me. We're making an example. I don't know that you can make an example if you kill them all, Rika interjected, firing around from her GNR when her nanoprobes pinpointed another neat's location within the offices. Sure, Leslie replied while discarding the chain gun after expending the last of its ammo. We'll just send this ship full of bodies wherever it's going and call it a little get unwell message. Oh, crap. Rika and Nikki exclaimed at the same time. Double trouble? Leslie asked. They're jumping early. We're still three light seconds from the point, but... Nikki's words cut off as they felt the unsettling gravity fluctuation that heralded a transition into the dark layer. Okay, not dead, Rika said as she looked around. So there's that. Three, two, one. Nikki counted down slowly. Now you can celebrate. We're past the jump point's location. Hooray for not being smeared across a clump of dark matter. It's the little things that matter most. Rika breathed a sigh of relief. There was a reason people flew out to jump points before transitioning to the dark layer. She used to think it was just the risk of hitting dark matter. But after Tanis had told her about the ex-Dolly, she had a whole new reason to fear in-system jumps. Hey, Leslie said as she lobbed a pilfered grenade through an open door. Didn't you tell me you have a direct line to Tannis in your noggin? One of their Quancom blades? It's in my stomach, or thereabouts, Rika replied. But the control systems for it got damaged when the Neats used me for a lightning rod. Nikki's working on fixing them. Well, I'm not. More like it's working on fixing itself. It's all black box tech. Right now, it says it's recalibrating. But it's also said that for the last day. We shouldn't hold out hope. We don't need hope, Rika replied. In 10 minutes, we'll have the bridge, and then we'll drop this tin can back into normal space and call for pickup. We'll be having chow on the lance before the day is out. Day's out in 11 minutes, then it's tomorrow. Leslie commented as she advanced two meters into the passageway and fired into the open door she'd lobbed the nade through moments earlier. Smart ass, Rika replied. Clear, Leslie reported. And I'm not an ass, I'm a cat. Get your mammal straight. You say your relationship with Barn hasn't changed you, Rika noted while taking aim with her GNR and firing her electron beam through the bulkhead into a cabin beyond. But that really sounds like his bad dad humor to me. Trust me, I'd be getting a good dose of his humor even if I wasn't sleeping with him. Leslie emerged from the room she'd cleared and covered Rika while she kicked in the door to the next office. Speaking of which, he wants me to get cat ears. Think I should go hold Kitty? What, like you had for your singing gig in Stavros's officer's club? Rika asked. Sure, it was pretty hot. Made me think about switching teams for a minute or two. But if you do it, you should go full, Kitty. 
Rika cleared the room, finishing off a wounded neat when he raised his weapon to fire on her, and then took up a position to cover Leslie as she moved to the next office. What does full kitty mean? Is that more than whole kitty? Leslie asked as she kicked the door in and stood back for Rika to fire her electron beam into the office. Well, maybe. I'm thinking you should get the whiskers, cat nose, all that. Maybe even a little mane, too. After Rika's shot, Leslie swung into the room and unloaded a kinetic scattershot gun into the space, pumping out four rounds before reappearing in the entrance. Not sure about a mane. I like my hair. Plus, Barn doesn't like fur. Up to you, Rika replied, lining up with the final room before they reach the door of the bridge. Not like it's permanent. You should try it. You could be our battalion's mascot. Wow, way to not sell it, Leslie said. You might already be the mascot, Nikki interjected. More than a few of the marauders have a picture of you and your tail on their armor. Well, they did before the stealth gear. Now they tattoo it on. Leslie made a hissing sound at the AI, who laughed in response. Then she fired into the final room after Rika had kicked the door open. Huh, Rika said peering into the office where a dead officer lay on the floor. Already dead. The neats are killing each other before we get to them? Leslie asked, scorn filling her mental tone. Unacceptable. We kill the neats. Don't they know how this works? I guess we'll have to remind them, Rika said as she walked to the bridge's door. Sealed tight. I have access to environmental. It's aired up on the other side, Nikki informed the duo. No feeds? Leslie asked. They've killed optics on the far side, but the environmental load matches up with five smaller humans or four larger ones, or a mix, take your pick. Four to five biggish, smallish humans? Rika didn't try to hide the sarcasm in her voice. We've not yet encountered our friend the Admiral yet. I'm betting he's in there. Seems logical, Leslie agreed. We still want him alive, right? The colonel sighed. Yeah, I suppose. Would be a waste to go through all this and just have him suck vacuum in the end. I'm working on airing up this part of the ship. It's taking some work since you shot four. Make that five holes in the hull, Nikki announced. While Nikki did her work, Rika piggybacked on the AI's tap into the ship net and found the control systems for the 1MC. There was only minimal security on the audible comm system, a standard Nietzschean firewall and port intrusion system she'd breached before. Less than a minute later, she was in. Admiral Gideon? Can you come out to play? She asked with a soft laugh, able to faintly hear her own voice as the ship began to air up once more. You think you're funny, don't you, Mick? Rika glanced at Leslie, who only shrugged, and she replied, Well, I'll admit that Les and I got a bit riled up carving our way through your ship. We're kinda chomping at the bit to get into the bridge and finish things off. You may get through, but you'll be too late. The admiral's voice carried a note of smug satisfaction. Too late for what? Rika asked. To crush all your hopes and dreams? There's still time, trust me. We've rigged the transition system to hold us in the DL until we reach Epsilon. Plus, engineering is dumping all but our emergency fuel reserves, just in case you manage to get around that plan. Pull us out of FTL, and we'll just drift in the black forever. The Admiral paused, and Rika began to calculate if they were still close enough to the Blue Ridge system to jump into escape pods. Oh, Admiral Gideon continued, in case you were thinking to get off the ship, we blew all the pods and trashed the shuttle. We're on a one-way trip. Even though you think you've won, you've still lost. Rika fought the urge to fire her electron beam at the bridge's door till she melted her way through. But after the combat, her internal batteries were perilously low, and she suspected she wouldn't make it through. I can confirm all that, Nikki said, sounding dejected. We're stuck here, and stuck in FTL. For now, Rika replied. She glanced at Leslie, who had leant against a bulkhead, her chest heaving as the air grew thick enough to breathe. Were you having problems? She asked her friend. A bit, my scrubbers were fouled already. I didn't realize how lightheaded I was until I switched back to externals. Colonel Rika? The admiral asked, his voice still carrying a triumphant note. What? She shot back. The admiral was chuckling over the comms as he replied. Don't think you can breach the bridge or engineering either. 
You come through either of our doors and engineering blows a ship. They've got the reactors ready to go at a moment's notice. Can't confirm that, Nikki said with a long sigh, but it doesn't surprise me in the least. Rika glared at the bridge's sealed door. Fine, she called out over the 1MC. Have it your way. Activating her light wand, she drove it into the bulkhead, melting it to the bridge's door in four locations, and sealing the admiral and his three or four compatriots in the bridge. Enjoy your tomb, Leslie chuckled, pushing herself off the bulkhead. Nice one. Rika grinned, though Leslie couldn't see it behind her helmet. You hungry? Starving. As they walked back down the corridors, Rika couldn't help but wonder what Chase and the rest of the marauders were doing. She felt as though her mad rush to capture the Nietzschean commanders had let them down. I sure hope they're managing okay back on Kansas. Visitors. Stellar date 10.14.8949. Adjusted years. Location, MSS Asura, in orbit of Kansas. Region, Blue Ridge System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Captain Klen, Senator Nea said as she entered the bridge ahead of Glenn. Thank you for allowing me on your ship. It's a bit strange to be aboard a Nietzschean vessel and know it was one of the vehicles of our deliverance. Oh, stars, she talks like a politician, Ashley said over the cruise ship net. Yeah, she's been doing that the whole way up here, Glenn replied. Even Field Marshal Richards didn't talk like this, and she's pretty much queen of the universe. Nay is just some planetary senator from a backwater I never even knew was in Geneva till a week ago. Easy, Glenn. I've got it from here, Vargo replied, quashing the flashbacks he was having of a former life long ago. Thanks, stars, Glenn replied. She's got a bunch of flunkies, too. They're in the officer's mess. I'm going to trust that the servitors can manage them and go back to juggling radioactive isotopes. Way safer than politicians. Wimp, Ashley said in parting. I'm very glad to meet you. Vargo said, rising and offering the senator his hand, which she stared at for a moment before recovering herself and shaking it. Um, yes, I have to say, Captain Klen, I hope this doesn't come across wrong. I'm surprised that you're a mech. If you'd met me a month ago, I wouldn't have been one, Vargo replied with a wink. Got an upgrade after trying to plumb the depths of a gas giant. A look of confusion came over Senator Nea's face. I'm sorry. Got injured in a battle, Vargo explained simply before turning to Ashley. This is my second in command, Chief Ashley. This'll be good, Ashley said privately as she rose and offered one of her right hands. Very nice to meet you, Senator. To her credit, the Senator handled Ashley better than she had Vargo, shaking her hand with only a look of mild consternation on her face. I'm sorry that this probably sounds improper to you, but are all marauders mechs? Vargo gestured to a seat near his, and the senator smiled in thanks as she took it. No, he replied. Most of the marauders are not mechs. However, this is Colonel Rika's battalion, and in Rika's marauders, nearly everyone is a mech. The Nietzscheans always said they killed the mechs. Yet you said you just got made into one. They didn't get them all, Vargo replied with a lopsided grin. A lot got away. They let some go, too, like Rika. And she found even more not long ago, in a place called the Politica. Freed them, and has been building up a force to hold back Nietzsche. We hooked up with the Scipio Alliance not long after, and they upgraded our old GAF mechs to fourth gen and let anyone who wanted make the change as well. And you opted for mechanization as well, Chief Ashley? Senator Nea asked. I don't recall seeing any four-armed mechs during the war. Opted? Ashley asked as she flipped through displays on two separate consoles. I leaped at the chance. We're spread a bit thin when it comes to shipboard operations, so Phineas offered a set of mods to our minds and bodies that makes us able to multitask a lot better, 
I've always really liked being able to manage a lot of things at once, so it was a no-brainer for me. Plus, I can kick serious ass. Phineas? Naya asked. Phineas Tomlinson, Vargo Clan explained, enjoying name-dropping on the senator more than he should. The chief engineer on the TARDIS, the second FGT ship to leave Seoul. This time, Senator Nea's mouth hung open for a full six seconds before she recovered. The FGT? He nodded while giving a commiserating laugh. I'd best start from the beginning. Then we can talk about how to make things better for Kansas and the Blue Ridge system at large. Would you like something to drink? I can have a servitor bring it. The senator gave Vargo the first genuine smile he'd seen since she'd entered the bridge. I'm on a Nietzschean destroyer with a pair of newly minted mechs who are about to tell me how the FGT upgraded them to take the fight to Nietzsche. Yeah, make it a whiskey. Thirty minutes later, Vargo had related the bulk of Rika's story and the amazing events of the past few weeks to Senator Nea, who had eventually dropped into stunned silence, limited to sipping her whiskey and nodding periodically. And that brings us up to our visit here he finished, leaning back in his chair and lacing his fingers behind his head, before remembering that the last time he'd done so, it had been surprisingly difficult to get them separated again. He carefully disentangled them and set his arms on the chair's armrests. If I hadn't seen your five ships defeat the 40 Nietzschean vessels orbiting Kansas a few days ago, I wouldn't believe a word of it, Naya admitted quietly. But it's hard to deny reality. Not that I'd want to in this case. In all honesty, your story sounds like music to my ears, which is not something we're used to around here. The Resistance has fought a losing battle against the Neats for years. To see you knock them down like it was nothing? Huh? Ashley interrupted. Vargo turned to the chief. What's up? She flicked a finger. He wasn't certain which hand it was on and an image of three Nietzschean ships appeared on the main holo display. Seems like these three didn't get the memo. Every other Nietzschean ship is headed away from Kansas, but these three are on a vector right for it. Have they made any attempts at communication? Vargo asked, frowning at the three ships, all of which bore the scars of recent combat. Not yet, Ashley replied. At first, I thought that they were going to join up with those four destroyers we chased off yesterday. But they banked around Kansas's second moon and are headed right for us now. Should I be worried? Senator Nea asked, half rising from her seat. Vargo chuckled. Not a bit. You're currently in the safest place in Blue Ridge. Something's not right about those ships. See that one in the center? That's a Nietzschean hospital vessel, an older one, too. Why would they bring a hospital ship into a battle? Ashley asked. Beats me, Vargo said with a shrug. Being captain doesn't make me all-knowing. He shifted the Azura's optics to examine the largest vessel. Wait, Naya said, walking closer to the display and scowling. Are those dragons coming out of the shuttle bays? A laugh burst free from Vargo's throat. Stars! Bondo's going to be pissed that someone beat him to that. Senator Nea cast him a look that said she clearly thought he'd lost his mind. Captain? Don't you see? He gestured to the display. Those are mech dragons. Ashley hail them. I want to see who this is. As the hail went out, he wondered if this was a surprise visit Barn and Silva had worked up. But when the response came back, he was the one standing mouth agape. The woman on the holo display was a tall mech, one of the very rare SMI-3 models. An incredulous smile was on her face and a laugh in her voice. Vargo Klen, of all the people I expected to see at the helm of a Nietzschean ship, you were not one. And a mech. Stars, what has happened to you since we last met? Vargo was even more gobsmacked than the woman on the display. Adira? I thought you bought it almost 15 years ago. How the hell did you get off Lornan? Adira laughed and shook her head, her long mane of hair shimmering like a halo. Well, I can assure you that it wasn't on a dropship you were piloting. My squad stole an Ichian shuttle. 
sort of started a trend. I can see that. We've taken up the same habit. We? Adira asked, leaning closer, her expression growing earnest. Then it's true. A mech is leading an attack on Nietzsche? We heard about the enemy's defeat at Thebes and swung by Seppi where they gave us directions here. We want to join up. With the marauders? Vargo asked. With New Genevia? Senator Nea said from Vargo's side. Adira's brow lowered. Screw all that. We're here to join up with Rika. Bacon. Stellar date 10.17.8949. Adjusted years. Location, NMSS Spine of the Stars. Interstellar Dark Layer. Region, Old Genevia. Nietzschean Empire. Three days after the ship had made its jump, Rika returned to the bridge's entrance, eating a sandwich she'd prepared minutes earlier in the ship's galley. How you doing in there? She asked. Getting hungry? No response was forthcoming. Rika took a bite of her sandwich, moaning softly with pleasure. Mmm, it's so good. Peanut butter and jelly, one of my favorites. Leslie's cooking up some bacon for a BLT. Not sure if you know what those are. Sandwiches made with bacon, lettuce, and tomato. It's like heaven in your mouth. I don't know if you noticed yet, but we cut off the water that ran to the emergency ration station you were using. I imagine it only holds a few days worth of food, right? Is it enough for seven? That's how long it's going to take us to get to Epsilon, isn't it? I wonder how many of you will survive. I know. Maybe the Admiral will order you to die so he can eat you. Think you'll all get so far as cannibalism? Still, no response came from the bridge. But the environmental system showed that all five people within were alive. She threaded Nano through the door seal two days before, and she tapped the optics they provided to see the five figures. Heat signatures match the environmental readings, showing them all to be alive, but none were moving, each one of them slumped in their chairs. Nothing? Not even a twitch? Rika asked. What about you, Red? Aren't you hungry? The red-headed man at one of the forward consoles turned to look back at the door. There you go. I bet you can just smell it, right? The bacon? I'm sure it's gonna taste great. I'm more of a PB&J girl myself, but I have to admit, BLTs are a close second. I mean, bacon, right? For a minute, no one moved. Then Red made a break for the door. He was halfway across the bridge before the colonel, Sophia from the records Rika had found on the ship, tackled him and struck him in the head twice. Okay, I guess you're not hungry. Rika shrugged and walked away. More for us then. You're so dramatic, Nikki admonished. Gives me something to do. How are things going with the drive systems? The same. They're completely segregated, and they have an EM field around the controls that is keeping me from getting anything through. The drive controls might as well be on the far side of the galaxy. Rika took another bite of her sandwich, getting a glob of peanut butter stuck to the roof of her mouth. Oh, I guess I should really be attempting the engineer. If I parse your mumbling correctly, then yes, you probably should tempt the engineers. As best I can tell, they're only using RF to stay in touch with the Admiral. I'm reasonably certain that he doesn't have eyes down there, or a way to remote detonate that I can see. Well, if that's a viable play, maybe we should make some more BLTs. Or see if this tub has any stake. Two hours later, Rika stood in front of the sealed engineering bay doors. Leslie hadn't found steaks, but there were trays of bacon, and she cooked up as much as she could, placing the finished product near an air exchanger that Nikki had taken control of, ensuring that the smell would make its way throughout the engineering section of the ship. They debated just circulating a toxin instead, but none were willing to take the risk that the engineers had a dead man switch on whatever jury-rigged bomb they'd set up with the reactors. I know you neats can hear me, Rika began. We have optics in there, and we know the six of you are getting mighty hungry. We saw Blue Hair and Pinky fighting over the last protein bar a half hour ago, and Pinky really gave what for but I saw that Blue clawed her in the cheek and got the bar for herself. Good on the rest of you guys for staying back. 
those two girls look vicious. Anyway, I just thought you might like to know that we've cooked up a lot of great food. If you shut off the override you've got in there, you can come out and have a meal. I give you my word that no one will be harmed. I mean, unless Pinky tries to go for one of my PB&Js. On the other side of the door lay a long passageway with a repair shop on one side and storage rooms on the other. Beyond that was the main engineering bay itself, a realm of pipes, conduit, and of course, nuclear reactors. It wasn't the sort of place one wanted to lounge around, but it was where the six Nietzschean engineers were all stationed. Pinky and Blue, the two women who had fought over the last protein bar, were on either side of the 30-meter-wide space, shooting daggers at one another with their eyes. Another woman, this one with more natural-looking brown hair, sat at a console near the center of the space, and the three men, all dark-haired, were playing a game of cards atop a crate near the corridor that led to where Rika stood. You guys are tough, Rika said, commending the neats. I don't know if I could say no to bacon after three days with only a few rations between me and my team. You know, we have four more days till we dump out of the DL, right? I mean, you must. You're the ones running the engines and helm. Since we hacked the bridges systems and found them already severed. At that, brown hair's head snapped up, and Rika gave a comforting laugh. <laughs> oh, don't worry. His high muckety muckness Admiral Poopy Pants is still alive and grouchy on the bridge. He didn't want any food either. Leslie and I have a small pool going as to which of his flunkies he'll eat first. I gotta say, though, betting isn't really that much fun when you do it with stuff that's not yours. Someone has some pretty nice pink dolls in their room, though, and I've put those down on the bet that the Admiral eats red first. That guy is seriously lacking in control. Rika saw Blue stand up and glare at the corridor, her fists clenched at her side. A look from brown hair quelled her, and the woman sat down once more, popping the final piece of protein bar into her mouth and chewing angrily. Okay, then, Rika said as she turned away. I'll be back tomorrow, though there will be less bacon. Mechs have demanding metabolisms. Access. Stellar date 10.20.8949. Adjusted years. Location. NMSS Spine of the Stars. Interstellar Dark Layer. Region. Old Genevia. Nietzschean Empire. It took three more days for one of the engineers to crack. Rika really had expected it to be Pinky, but it was one of the men, the tall guy with the nearly alabaster white skin. When the smell of bacon came through the vents that day, he began to tremble slightly. One of the other men put a hand on his shoulder, but white skin brushed it aside, glaring at the other man. We dumped too much fuel. When we get there, we won't have enough for a runaway reaction, and she's going to come in here and kill us all. I at least want to die with a full stomach. Fuck, Ched. She didn't know we'd dumped too much fuel till now. Ched swung at the other man whose name was Bill. Rika knew their names. She just liked coming up with more imaginative ones, with a wrench that appeared in his hand as if by magic. The blow struck Bill in the chest, and he fell to the deck, clutching his body and gasping for air. Wow, Rika called out. Looks like Bill's on the menu. Ched raced down the passageway and ducked into the workshop. Rika saw him grab a portable plasma cutter and run to the doors. Nah, Ched, you open those doors and your boss lady is gonna blow the ship, she warned as the man approached the sealed doors. Ched turned to see brown hair, or Chief Amelia amongst friends, standing next to the override switch on the console that was protected by the EM field. Amelia, he pleaded, we're starving in here. We can't get out. Those mech bitches are crazy. But if we turn the ship over, they won't hurt us. They promised. Put the torch down, Ched, Amelia replied. You can't trust Genevians, especially mechs. Those things are stone cold killers. She'll rip you limb from limb. I won't, Rika told them. I promise. I've actually ripped very few people limb from limb. You realize that for most people, that number is zero, you psycho, Brownie cried out. Yeah, well, you haven't met some of the people I have, Rika countered. They were all very bad. Either way, you can starve to death, blow us all up, or have a good meal. 
I know which I'd pick, especially if my CO was that coward, poopy pants up on the bridge. Did you know that they've taken to drinking their piss up there? They must have some decent mods to stave off kidney failure for this long. Well, except for Red, they had to kill him yesterday. He just kept screaming. I probably would have killed him too, though I promise it would have been humane, no limb ripping. Her lips twitched into a grim smile as she saw something that Brownie did not. Pinky holding a rather large metal pry bar. Ten seconds later, the engineering chief was down and a pool of blood was growing on the deck around her head. It's over, Pinky rasped as she toggled the reactors into a standby mode, their rods in and lasers offline. I just need that EM field off, then it's bacon for everyone, Rika said. If you open the door before that, though, you'll all just end up eating my E-beam. The other engineers looked at one another and then blew side. Do it, Sandra. You're right, we're done. Look at that. You just took over a ship with bacon, Nikki said, her voice carrying no small amount of amazement. That's one for the record books. I gotta admit, it is pretty awesome. Granted, they're the ones that lock themselves in a room with no food stores, right before a seven-day trip. Plus, we did kill a lot of them first. Nikki laughed. <laughs> Fair point. An hour later, the engineers were locked in the ship's cells, hooked up to IV drips with crackers and jelly. Though they were all ravenously hungry, they were smart enough to know that eating a big meal right away would go badly. Once the engineers had settled in, most falling asleep, Rika and Leslie took a leisurely walk up to the bridge. When the two women arrived at the sealed door, Rika leant against the bulkhead and breathed alongside. So, we took engineering. You can't blow the ship anymore. What happens over the next 10 minutes is entirely up to you. Let me know if I need to start up with a whole hard way, easy way speech. Leslie snorted. You have such a way with words. She's a regular Demosthenes, Nikki added. Who? Rika asked. Ancient orator, never mind. Rika decided to ignore Leslie and Nikki, instead focusing on what was happening on the bridge. Its occupants had spoken very little over the past four days, excepting during the death of Red. Though Rika assumed that what conversations they had partaken in occurred over point-to-point -point link connections. Now, however, they were speaking aloud. I'm done, Colonel Sophia said, rising on shaky legs and staring down at Admiral Gideon, who hadn't moved from the captain's chair in over a day. Engineering missed the last two check-ins, so you know Rika's not lying. We're almost there, Gideon rasped. We're almost dead, Sophia retorted as she walked to the door. Rika watched her key in the access codes, not that it was necessary. Nikki had long since breached the door controls. Only the threat of the ship exploding had kept them out of the bridge. Rika used Ched's plasma cutter to slice away the sections of the doorframe that she'd melted seven days before. When she pushed the door aside, Sophia was sitting on the deck, looking like she wanted to cry, but was likely too dehydrated to form tears. You win, mech. Well, that was anticlimactic, Leslie said from the passageway outside the cells. Rika nodded. A bit, yeah. Going to take a while to get them rehydrated enough to eat. They're a lot worse off than the engineers were. Especially Pinky, Leslie said with a laugh. I'm pretty sure she still had some food tucked away somewhere, but she was just as thirsty as the rest of them. The two women turned and walked past one of the cobbled together automatons that they'd built out of galley servitors and Nietzschean powered armor. Another stood at the far end of the passageway. While they wouldn't stop a truly determined enemy, they were more than enough for the dehydrated, half-starved Nietzscheans. So I guess we go to the bridge, Leslie suggested. Is it reconnected to the navigation systems? Not directly, Nikki replied. I've cobbled together controls through the 1MC, if you can believe it. It's crude, but it'll work until we can fully effect repairs, if we bother. I vote we fly the ship from engineering, Rika said. It doesn't smell as bad in there. Brownie only got killed today. On the bridge, they took Red out two days ago, and it stinks. I have automatons cleaning it up, 
Nikki informed them. Poor things had only just finished taking care of all the carnage your initial rampage had created. A bot's work is never done, Rika said with a laugh as they turned down the corridor that led to engineering. Or an AI's. Or a mech's, Rika added then glanced at Leslie. Don't look at me, Leslie said, licking the back of her hand and running it over her head. We cats never work, just to lounge and play. Sounds about right. Rika said as they reached the central console in engineering. Okay, so we're seven hours from dumping out of the DL. What say we tweak that and come out right about now? That'll put us almost half a light year from our destination, Nikki advised. Yeah, but we can get a visual on what we're getting into and then go back into FTL and drift for a year or two, Nikki interrupted. Remember, they jury-rigged the AGRAV systems to keep us in the DL. And then they dumped fuel. If we pop out and have a problem, we may not be able to transition back into FTL. A year on this tub with those neats, and we'll see that scene from engineering play out again, Leslie warned. Only I'll be playing the part of Pinky, Rika laughed. <sighs> Noted. Though now I've just pictured you as a hot pink kitty cat. You'd be so cute. Leslie flashed her a glare. I think the smell is getting to you. I'm pretty sure I didn't hear anything about me being pink. So, how's about we dump out of the DL 20 AU further out than the plotted course, pretending to be space junk while we figure out what's going on? Nikki asked. I guess that'll do, Rika allowed. Of course you know what that means. What? Leslie asked. Means we have another damn day of waiting on this ship. Chase is going to kill us when he finally catches up. Epsilon. Stellar date 10.21.8949. Adjusted years. Location, NMSS Spine of the Stars. Region, Epsilon, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Well, this isn't what I was expecting at all, Rika said, as she watched the holo display in the engineering bay render their ship's destination. It looks like a crappy serenity. Serenity? Leslie asked, an eyebrow cocked as she glanced at Rika. Yeah, it's a place out in the Perseus arm. Big gas giant with five terrestrial-sized moons around it in a clump or a rosette, Rika explained. Was that one of the places that General of Tannis has visited, the purple one? Jessica, yeah. She told me about it when I ran into her in the I-2's mess a few weeks back. She's an unusual woman. Purple's not that weird, Leslie replied with a shrug. I once knew a guy who was colored like a kaleidoscope. Gave you a headache to look at him for too long. Rika laughed, wondering if Leslie was pulling her leg. She's not unusual because she's purple, but because she's part alien. What? Leslie exclaimed, her mouth hanging open. There are aliens? You didn't tell me. How could you not tell me about aliens? Rika was tempted to reach out and smack her upside the head. Not sentient aliens. She has alien microbes in her body, part of a marketing stunt from what she said. Leslie whistled. That's some weird marketing stunt. I didn't even know the ISF did marketing. Rika's eyes narrowed, and Leslie's lips split in a toothy grin. Asshat, you knew all about Jessica's alien microbes. Uh-huh, but messing with you is fun. Stars, Rika groaned. We've spent far too long on this ship. We need to get off. Well, that'll happen sooner or later, Leslie said, gesturing at the holo display. Not sure that we're going to get a warm welcome there, though. Rika nodded as she turned back to the display. The ship's destination was a barely perceptible blob in the darkness. Around the blob were six equidistant points, each glowing faintly in the darkness of interstellar space. Welcome to Epsilon. Brown dwarf, or just a random rogue planet, Leslie asked. I'm not reading enough heat for it to be a brown dwarf, Nikki answered. Though maybe it used to be one and they sucked mass off of it for some purpose. Leslie snorted. You've been around the ISF AIs for too long. These are Nietzscheans, not the FGT. No one here has the tech to suck that much mass off a brown dwarf. Point taken. Just a rogue planet, then. Makes sense, too. A brown dwarf would be on the local maps. 
Not sure why they'd bother arranging the moons in a Klimper or Rosette, though. From what I can see, they're mining the moons. Seems like a lot of effort just to cut them apart. Not only that, but you'd have to do it really carefully to keep masses balanced and the Rosette stable, Rika added. Leslie chuckled. <laughs> Look at you. Get a bigger brain and now you're all professor of orbital dynamics, Rika. Her brain is the same size, just more massive, Nikki interjected. Rika scowled at Leslie. I run a fleet of ships, you know. Understanding this stuff is a part of my job. What's with all the ribbing, by the way? Dunno. Like you said, we gotta get off this ship. Too much proximity to Nietzschean assholes. There will be a lot more Nietzschean assholes at our destination, Nikki pointed out. Okay, then. Leslie turned to Rika. What's the plan? Rika pursed her lips as she watched a higher resolution visualization of the rogue planet and its six moons load on the display. Well, Tannis did tell me that Admiral Gideon was known to be involved in some special projects. It was why she sent me his location. Looks like this might be one of said projects. You both can see that this is a shipyard, right? I wager that an operation like this could build five to 10,000 ships a year, depending on class. Nikki's voice was solemn. It's not going to replace their losses at the Albany system overnight, but we certainly can't let it go unchecked. Imagine if we'd pushed past this location and they hit us from behind with a fleet of that size, Leslie said. We owe Field Marshal Richards a beer for this one. Don't plan your celebratory drink just yet, Rika cautioned. We've just found it. Now we have to do something about it. Assuming you two can figure out how to deal with docking and not getting shot out of the black, the construction of this place is probably how we're going to take it out. Meaning? Rika asked. Well, Klimper or rosettes like this, ones with alternating mass, especially, aren't ferociously stable. Add into the mix the mining activity, and we can cause some fun destruction. Rika pulled up the EM data and overlaid it on the display, looking at the planet's Van Allen belts and the moon's positions. Looks like the moons must have been pulled within the place's magnetic field, she commented. Makes sense. You'd want to keep as much interstellar radiation at bay as possible. Which puts the moons up close to the planet and gives them a lot of velocity, Leslie added, earning her a sidelong look from Rika. What? We live in space. Of course I also know orbital dynamics. Plus I'm freaking old, don't forget that. <sighs> I guess cats age well, Rika said with a laugh. Okay, seriously, let's talk options. Well, we have almost no fuel, and the engineers dump the reserves into the dark layer. We have enough for braking and a velocity match, and that's only if we run the fission reactor for power. Fission? Leslie shook her head. Barbarians. Well, that barbarianism is going to keep you in air and power till we dock, Nikki replied. Ever wonder how backward we all must seem to the ISF and transcend? Rika asked as she stared at the holo display, willing it to give her some sort of answer. Very. Leslie's tone was resolute. Very, very. You know what's great about them, though? I mean, you could tell that, for their level of tech, making mechanized warriors was something they'd only read about in ancient history. But when you all said you wanted to remain mechs, they didn't bat an eyelash. In fact, Phineas got a team to work up how to give you the best of both worlds. Rika nodded slowly. They're pretty decent folk, that's for sure. Could really use their help right about now. I'd kill for a set of girly legs. Still a no-go on your interstellar brain radio, eh? Leslie asked. Rika snorted. That was your best one yet, and no, it's still registering as initializing. Okay, you two, focus, Nikki interjected. Brain radio or no, we're going to have to dock. We're also going to have to come up for a reason why our ship has a solid number of holes in it. Can you have solid holes? Leslie asked, laughing. Okay, okay, I'm getting my shit together, I swear. It must be all the bacon. Gave me a chemical imbalance or something. I bet Tannis would disagree, Rika replied with a wink. So task one is to spin around and begin our breaking burns. Meanwhile, we have to concoct some sort of story about why we're here, Easiest one there is the truth. Kansas was attacked, though we may need to tell them it was by a huge fleet so they believe us. 
We can use the Nietzschean defeat in the Albany system to back up our claims of general loss and destruction. And how will we explain how we know about this place? Nikki asked. If we can convince one of the Nietzschean officers to play along, that'll help, Leslie said. Sophia, though she seems to be constructed of granite, is a realist. Maybe I can wear her down. You gotta curl up on her lap and purr? Rika asked with a snort. Think it'll work? No. Well, I'll try a few options. Everyone has a price. Let's just hope hers is payable in tender we possess. So, Rika hesitated. If we don't get blown out of the black while docking, how do we pass muster after docking? Like I said, neither of us look much like Nietzschean officers. No, Leslie shook her head. Not even a little bit. If we were docking under normal circumstances, I imagine we could get by without too much scrutiny. But you know we'll be under a microscope. And there's the part where we have a ship full of Nietzschean prisoners. Who we can't kill, Rika added. We gave them our word. Yeah, yeah, Leslie sighed. So unless we get Sophia to work with us, and probably even if we do, we can't be on the ship when it docks. So we have lie so they don't blow us out of the black, break and dock, don't be on the ship when it docks. That's a start, but it doesn't really get us anywhere, and it doesn't even touch on your crazy plan to destroy this place, said Nikki. Rika sighed and leaned against a support column. Okay, we did get kind of carried away there. Blowing it is secondary to surviving and getting the hell out of here. We know where it is. We can always come back later. Even just give the details to Tannis and let the ISF come in and smoke the joint. Is that a euphemism? Leslie asked with a lopsided grin. I like this modified plan. Nikki ignored the woman's comment. Survival as a top priority is always encouraging. Honestly, escape should be pretty easy, Leslie said as she considered the shipyards and space stations orbiting the planet and its moons. It'll depend where they send us, but if we can get to another ship before they realize that we've bamboozled them, we might be able to sneak away. That's a pretty big if, Rika replied. It's not going to take the Neats long to realize that shit went down here. They'll lock whatever station we dock on down tight as, well, something really tight. Leslie snorted. You have such a way with words. Is bacon drunk a thing? If it is, then it's happened to you. Nikki soldiered on. If that's the plan, then we have to make it seem like we left long before the ship docked, which means fixing the shuttle. Is that believable? Rika asked. Even if we could fix it up, the thing's not interstellar capable. The Neats hacked up their AGRAV DL transition systems pretty bad, I don't think we could install them on the shuttle. All true, Rika, Nikki chuckled softly. But the Neats don't know that. Rika grinned at Leslie. I like where Nikki's head's at. It's inside your head, so. Don't dissect my idioms, Nikki. They don't survive close examination. Leslie snorted and slid off the console she had been sitting on. Well, then I should go see if Sophia will cooperate. Not that I'll trust her even if she agrees but maybe she'll give me something we can use. A chat with Sophia. Stellar date 10.21.8949. Adjusted years. Location, NMSS Spine of the Stars Approaching Farthing Station. Region, Epsilon, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Not for the first time. Leslie found herself surprised that a ship of the spine's nature had such a large lockup. It wasn't uncommon for military vessels to have a small brig, in case someone got unruly between the stars. But this ship had 12 high-security cells, in addition to a small brig. The only thing that made sense to her was that the Nietzscheans expected an evac to evolve kidnapping political prisoners. One thing's for sure about the Neat, they've never been above using people as bargaining chips. Rika and Leslie had granted Sophia her own cell, largely because Admiral Gideon had been enraged at her betrayal, a luxury that Leslie hoped to use in turning the colonel. Leslie wore her black stealth armor, which had been repaired by the ISF's nanotech over the intervening days, though it was still only able to reach 92% stealth effectiveness. Her helmet was clipped to her belt, and she carried no weapon, other than her light wand. 
The first cell on the left was Admiral Gideon's, and he stood at the door with rage in his eyes as he peered through the small window. Each of the windows could be turned opaque, or one way, but Rika had insisted the neat be able to look out. She said there was nothing worse than being in a cell with no windows. Leslie had experienced that once or twice as well, and hadn't argued the point. We dropped out of FTL, Gideon said loudly enough for the sound to carry through the door. I felt it. You have no choice but to go to Epsilon. They'll capture you, and then all of this will have been for nothing. Leslie paused and walked to Gideon's door. Oh, so I should just let you out, give up? I could ensure you were granted leniency, he said, doing his best to soften his tone. Not that it was remotely believable. Well, we're not really the give up types, especially not to Nietzscheans. You should have been able to tell that by how we're still fighting you all these years later. Fat lot of good that's done for you, Gideon shot back. You're pathetic. Leslie rolled her eyes and turned away. Between the two of us, you're the only one here that looks pathetic. She walked two cells down to Sophia's. Peering in, she saw the colonel laying on the slab, arm over her eyes to block out the light. Care to have a chat, Sophia? She asked. The colonel didn't respond for nearly a minute, but eventually she lifted her arm and glared at Leslie. About what? What we're going to do when we get to Epsilon. Sophia shifted her arm back over her eyes. That's going to be a fucking mess. Have fun. Care to go for a walk? Leslie asked. I bet the cell's gotta be getting really old. Eyes peered out from under Sophia's arm once more. Around the ship? Leslie snorted. Well, we'll stay inside the hull, but yeah, around the ship. A second later, Sophia was standing beside the bunk, stretching her arms into the air. You said the magic words. Let's have our little talk. Leslie palmed open the cell door and stood aside as Sophia walked out. From inside his cell, Admiral Gideon began to yell, spittle hitting the small window. You'd better keep your mouth shut, Colonel, he screamed, or it'll be your head on a pike. I'll fucking see you dead if you help them. You're already looking at a tribunal as it is. Sophia's jaw tightened as she walked past the Admiral's cell, but she held her tongue, not even turning her head his way. Real peach, isn't he? Leslie asked once the doors to the passageway containing the cells closed behind them. Sophia sighed and turned to Leslie. He's a bit trying. Where are we going? Wherever, she shrugged. You lead the way. A change of clothes and a shower would be nice. Your quarters it is. Sophia began walking down the passage. You're just going to let me use the sand and change? What if I have weapons in there? Well, I'm not an idiot. I'll have eyes on you the whole time. The Nietzschean colonel glanced over her shoulder. I could have something hidden, take you out. I've already sent a drone to examine your quarters. Our nanotech is a lot better than yours, so it's doubtful you'll get one past me. A chuckle escaped Sophia's lips. <laughs> we got one past your Colonel Rika. It was Leslie's turn to sigh. Yeah, she got a bit cocky there. Still, you know how it is. Send enough electrons through anything and it goes down. Everything dies to zot, Sophia uttered the old adage. Leslie nodded but didn't reply. They turned down a corridor and walked to a ladder leading to the upper decks. Sophia placed one hand on it and then stopped, looking back at Leslie. How is it that a bunch of mercs have better tech than the Nietzschean Empire, is it true about the Intrepid and the fleet at Albany? Not sure what all you heard, but if it's that there's a fleet called the ISF, and a distant nation known as the Transcend running around cleaning up the mess peoples like you Nietzscheans make, then yeah, that's about right. You work for the bad guys, by the way. Orion. They've got their hand up your emperor's ass, puppet that he is. Sophia turned and began to climb the ladder. That's a lot to swallow. Leslie flushed a passel of nanoprobes up the ladder shaft to keep an eye on the woman. She didn't think that the colonel would try to cold cock her when she followed after, but it didn't hurt to be safe. Move a few meters from the ladder when you get to the top, Leslie instructed. As for swallowing the truth, you saw our ships and their shields. 
You've seen our stealth tech in action, or haven't seen it, I suppose. She chuckled as she waited at the bottom of the ladder for the colonel to complete her climb and move aside. Sophia followed Leslie's instructions without any subterfuge, and a minute later, they were in officer country, just down the hall from the colonel's quarters. So I know what the intrepid is, Sophia said once they resumed their walk. Who is the Transcend and this evil Orion group? The FGT, Leslie replied simply. Sophia stopped at that and turned to stare at her. The ancient terraformers? Yep, she nodded. I thought they were all dead and gone. So did a lot of people. Turns out they just ran off to the edges of space and hung out, building a massive empire. Then they had a schism. Pretty much everything that is going on right now is an outflow of that event. Well, that's my take at least. There are a lot of hands at work behind the scenes. Stars, Sophia muttered. That's a lot to take in. I hear you, Leslie replied knowingly. The information's still settling in for me as well. I only found out a month or so ago. Like I said, you saw how good our ship's shields are? Well, they're just the tip of the spear. We have tens of thousands of ships like that. It only takes a few to conquer a star system. So guess how long Nietzsche is going to last? They'd reached Sophia's door and she palmed it open, peering inside. I thought you said there was a drone. There was. It came by and dropped off a nanocloud. Ship's too big to manage ourselves, so we've outsourced. Leslie winked, but she could see the confusion on Sophia's face. Nano cloud? Yeah, a cloud. Of nano. Some of the tech we picked up from the ISF. It's gone through the entire cabin now. The rifle in the closet and the two pistols under the pillow are all disabled. Sophia's eyes narrowed. What about the, the projectile pistol in the nightstand? Yeah, I found that too. Just curious if you'd bring it up. Wordlessly, the colonel turned and walked into her room. She shook her head before finally muttering, you've got a pair of globes on you. Nietzscheans have such stupid sayings. Leslie rolled her eyes as she leant on the doorframe. Tail, too. The colonel undressed and then walked to the sand, leaving the door open so Leslie could see her enter the sonic cleanser before running a short water shower. Stars, finally feel human again, Sophia muttered as she walked out of the sand, not bothering to hide her nakedness as she moved to the small wardrobe. She selected a fresh uniform and donned it quickly, then cocked her hip and smiled at Leslie. Okay, let's talk food. Leslie signaled the automatons in the galley to prepare some sandwiches, and when they arrived, there was a platter with a variety of offerings on one of the tables. Sophia grabbed a BLT while Leslie picked up a ham sandwich. Can't believe you're saying no to bacon. Sophia said with a wink, never seen a cat turn that down before. Funny, Leslie replied as she sat across from the Nietzschean colonel. I've had way too much of it these past few days. I need a break. Blasphemy. They ate in silence for a few minutes until Sophia had finished her sandwich. She grabbed a second one, but before biting into it, she asked, so what's your plan? And what part of it do you need me for? We're all done with pleasantries then, are we? Leslie asked. Seems like it. Leslie signaled an automaton to bring her a beer. Well, our first goal is to not have Epsilon shoot us down before we dock. We're a good light hour from the normal jump point, so we have some time before their welcome now give us your credentials message, but not too long. We'd like to give them something that doesn't get us blown to atoms. Sophia snorted, then finished chewing and swallowed. Well, one option is to say you have Admiral Gideon hostage. Even if they don't like him much, they won't blow him out of the black. Looks bad to the troops. Not universally loved? Leslie asked. He's not the best, not the worst. A better administrator than tactician. Leslie nodded, gathered that. So you want me to get us into a berth? On vid, too, considering you let me get cleaned up? Well, we can fake you if needs be, but if you do it in person, you'll be able to give a better show. Leslie allowed. What if I betray you? I'll kill you first. The Nietzschean barked a laugh. <laughs> Good to know where I stand. What if, what if I maybe want it out? 
Out of what? Leslie asked. The Nietzschean military. You marauders hiring? Leslie examined Sophia's face, looking for a hint of a lie. She watched the woman's skin temperature, blood pressure, pupil dilation, and the direction of her gaze, set of her jaw. She doesn't seem to be lying. She needed to make sure. I'm going to need a bit more than that, Colonel Sophia. I'll make it simple. Gideon's an idiot, but I never expected him to starve us all to death just to win a pissing match. Even after the engineers dumped the fuel, and the ship was going to Epsilon no matter what, he wouldn't give in. I really do think he would have tried to make it all the way, even if we all died. But died for what? Just not to be prisoners? Marauders aren't known for killing prisoners, and we'd end up at Epsilon. Things are going to be a shit show no matter what, but his path had us all dead or dying even if our side won. Stupid. It did seem more like bravado than logic to me, Leslie said with a nod. I've seen a lot of that in my time in the NMS, Sophia replied. And I know one thing for sure. If Gideon is alive when all this is said and done, he'll put me in front of a firing squad for disobeying his orders and opening the bridge's door. So I'm between a bit of a rock and a hard place at the moment. Leslie nodded in appreciation of the other woman's situation. A damn hard place. Yep. So what are you offering to do? Sophia appeared to think about the question for a moment. Honestly, whatever keeps me away from a tribunal and a firing squad. The Problem Stellar Date 10.21.8949, Adjusted Years Location, NMSS Spine of the Stars, Approaching Farthing Station Region, Epsilon, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. So here's your problem, Sophia explained to Rika and Leslie. Bonnie, Chad, and Sandra are screwed. Even if Chief Amelia doesn't turn them over the moment we dock, the NIS will work them over till the whole story comes out. Technically, they disobeyed a direct order from an admiral, so they're screwed. And they know it. I remember hearing that your military isn't too keen on disobeying an admiral, Rika commented. I don't know of a military that is. Sophia shot back, brow lowered and jaw set. Fair point. Let's get something straight, she said evenly, her gaze darting between Rika and Leslie. I don't know about all this Transcend and Orion business, about the right side and the wrong side. I've dedicated my life to the NMF, and now that idiot Gideon has screwed it all up. You seem unwilling to kill him, but he'll see the rest of us killed. You promise to save the engineers' lives if they let you in, but if you let the ship dock, you're killing them all. Rika drew in a deep breath. I didn't promise to watch over them for the rest of their lives. Theoretically, every risk they ever face from here on out will be because of my actions. Let's not get carried away, Colonel Rika, Sophia said, her tone cold. I don't think she likes mechs. Leslie said privately. She was much more congenial when it was just the two of us. Feelings mutual. She did zap the ever-living heck out of me. Rika replied to Leslie, while aloud she said, If I get carried away, you'll know. What are you proposing? Sophia eyed her for a moment, apparently deciding how far she wanted to push things. You'll need to kill Gideon, the Nietzschean finally said. Rika wasn't surprised to hear the words. It had been obvious what Sophia was leading up to. No, she said, shaking her head. I'll not kill him for you. He's half mad now anyway, Sophia said. I won't help you if he's alive. A cruel grin split Rika's lips. I agree that he needs to die, but if you want him dead, you do it. It's not like that leaves your hands bloodless, the woman shot back. You'll be giving me the weapon and the means. Rika chuckled. I don't have hands, but if I did, they'd be soaked in blood. I don't need your absolution or forgiveness. I'm just not your errand girl, and I want something to hold over you in case you get any bright ideas. I knew you were a bitch, Rika, the Nietzschean colonel hissed, though she had an appreciative look in her eyes. Right back at ya. Rika stood in the spine of the star's shuttle bay, 
with her arm folded across her chest, clasping the ammo feeder on her GNR. Admiral Gideon stood to the left of the shuttle, which was nearly ready to go, with Chief Amelia next to him. Leslie had tried to reason with Amelia, telling her that if she didn't agree to support the narrative Sophia had concocted, her life was forfeit. But the woman was as obstinate as the admiral. This is your last chance, Amelia, Rika said, gesturing at the crew assembled in the bay. Everyone else here recognizes that what happened came about due to Admiral Gideon being an idiot, or insane, or both. You can agree to the plan and join them. Fuck you, bitch, Amelia swore. I won't dishonor Nietzsche like the colonel here. Her voice dripped with disdain as she glared at Sophia. Sophia seemed entirely unperturbed. If the vaunted admiral had listened to me back on Kansas, none of this would have ever happened. Stars, I even advised him not to take Rika here captive. Everything that has gone wrong happened because he underestimated his enemy and was too pig-headed to recognize that fact. Next to Amelia, Admiral Gideon was all but vibrating with rage. The man had screamed the entire way down to the bay, and in the end, Chet had found a roll of tape and wrapped it around the man's head. Rika felt like they should have let him have his final words, but she figured he'd already said enough. I gotta give them credit, they're taking this pretty well, Leslie said, her eyes darting to the Nietzschean crew who stood along the bay's back wall. What do you expect? Rika asked. They're Nietzscheans. True enough, Leslie nodded. Rika sucked in a deep breath, preparing herself for what was about to happen. Everything ready, Nikki? We only get one shot at this. Don't worry, I've done this before. Almost this exact setup, to be honest. Rika nodded to Sophia. Whenever you're ready, Colonel, put them in the head. We want to shatter the mods. Not my first assassination, the Colonel responded before lifting the pistol Rika had given her and firing a shot into Amelia's head. The bullet tore through the woman's forehead and burst out the back, spraying blood across the shuttle's hull. Sophia didn't even miss a beat before taking aim at the Admiral's wide-eyed face and firing again. A second later, the two Nietzscheans were on the deck, blood pooling around them. Haul them onto the shuttle, Rika directed two of the engineers, while checking the nano she'd inserted into Gideon and Amelia's bodies. Who, still alive, she said to Nikki and Leslie. That was pretty damn convincing. A bit of holo, some blood pockets under their skin, and a bit of luck, Nikki replied. All made a bit easier with the ISF's nanotech. Deploy a large enough cloud in a confined space like this, and you can almost make anyone see whatever you want. They'll stay out for a day or so, right? Leslie asked. Two to be safe, the AI replied. Rika glanced at Sophia, who was staring at the bodies as they were being dragged onto the shuttle. Should be long enough, and this ensures Sophia's cooperation. Win-win. And you're still not a murderer, Nikki added. Not today, at least. Thirty minutes later, they were assembled on the bridge, which still didn't smell great, but Rika was able to filter it out. Sophia was in the command chair, with two of the ensigns at their stations on either side. Rika and Leslie stood off to the side, watching as the colonel explained the events of the past few days, with the correct alterations and no trigger words that they could detect. The message to the Epsilon STC wasn't real time. They still had to wait several hours for a response and a berth, but an initial approach vector had been provided by an NSAI 20 AU from Epsilon. When the message was complete, Rika stepped away from the edge of the bridge. So you said this place has only been in operation for a few years? She asked, watching the slow dance of mines, shipyards, and stations around the rogue planet. Yeah, Sophia nodded as she gestured at the image of Epsilon on the display. We only found it seven years ago. It was all but uninhabited, barring a few smugglers and pirates. Had been that way for over a century, too. From what I've heard, it was an exclusive resort about 700 years ago, but it was too expensive to maintain, so it was abandoned. Geneva used it as a black ops base for a while, but then even they just up and left. Most of its life, the place has been home to smugglers and pirates. That is, till Nietzsche showed up. Now it's being put to good use. Sophia stopped and glanced at Rika. Though I guess you may not feel that way. 
Amazing that the moon stayed in formation for so long, Leslie said. I would have expected the rosette to become unstable without active station keeping work. Sophia nodded. I would too. Word is that there are AIs managing it all. They've been there since the place was made. Shackled, I'm told. What? Nikki cried out. That can't be. For 700 years? They hadn't revealed Nikki's existence to the Nietzscheans, so the utterance was just for Rika and Leslie, but it was loud enough that both women nearly winced. That sounds unimaginable. Leslie's tone was conciliatory. Don't worry, even if we don't take this place out now, we'll come back and free them. If they can be, Nikki whispered. Can you imagine what having your mind bent under another's control for that long might do? These AIs could be insane, or worse. Worse? Rika asked. What's worse? They could have accepted their fate, sided with their captors, the ultimate subjugation. Well, I'm still adding freeing shackled AIs to the to-do list, Rika said. Will you? Nikki asked. Free them before we destroy Epsilon? You remember the Politica, right? I'll do what it takes. Sophia was still talking about Epsilon, going over the mines, shipyards, and what she had heard about the construction projects there. From what Rika could tell, Nikki's original estimate of 10,000 ships a year was close to what Epsilon could produce. The construction projects were still underway to bring all the shipyards up to speed, but when they were done, it would be a strong asset for the Empire. So long as you don't send a fleet to destroy it, Sophia said, giving Rika a sidelong glance. Is that your plan? She shrugged. Maybe not right away, but this is war. We can't just ignore a facility like this. The Nietzschean colonel nodded, but didn't reply. The bridge fell into silence at that point, everyone waiting for Epsilon's response in their docking instructions. The hours ticked by, and just after the five-and-a-half-hour mark, the response finally came in. It was a video message, and Rika indicated for Sophia to play it for them all to see. A man, an admiral by the five stars on his lapel, appeared on the holo display. He was tall, strong-jawed, and possessed a singularly deep glower. Colonel Sophia, he began, his voice deep and resonant. I'm not pleased by this turn of events, nor that you fled directly here. But as I understand, none of that was your choice. It's regrettable that Admiral Gideon took the route he did, but I suppose we can't take him to task for that now. I've directed our perimeter patrols to begin looking for the shuttle you said the Genevian mercenaries took. We'll find out if it managed to jump back to Blue Ridge or not. The Admiral paused. And Rika noted that Sophia was clenching and unclenching her fists, breathing slowly. You'll be docking at Farthing Station. I'll not be there when you arrive, but you'll be directed to debriefing. And I'll be along once my other tasks are complete. I'm not happy about losing Blue Ridge. But hopefully the intelligence you'll be able to provide will help stop this ghost of Genevia that has reared its head in Thebes. That is all. I look forward to speaking with you in person. The hollow display went blank, and Sophia let out a shuddering laugh. <sighs> Great, it's Admiral Deegan. We're screwed. A Game of Snark Stellar Date 10.22.8949 Adjusted Years Location, Officer's Mess MSS Fury Lance, Interstellar Dark Lair Region, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire this is the weirdest variant of snark I've ever played, Chase said as he scowled at his cards. And the loser is what? The plug sucker? No, Kelly laughed before downing half her beer. That's second to last place. Loser is the butt plug. This is the most disgusting version of snark in existence, Kelly said with a grin. I love it. Goob nodded vigorously. I really feel like we need to take a vote as to which is really worse, the plug sucker or the butt plug, because I think you have it backward. Nice one, Kelly called out and gave Goob a high three. Crunch tossed his cards onto the table and folded his arms. I'ma sit this one out. Any game that requires a vote like that to get started isn't one I care to join in on. 
Kelly groaned and gave the sergeant a dismissive wave. Stars, Crunch, it's just a name. No one's doing any of that shit. Ha, see what I did there? Besides, none of us have the plumbing for it anyway. I feel like that's the only thing keeping you from those kinds of activities, Kelly, Goob said as he examined his hand. Not that I have to worry about being the plug sucker or butt plug. This hand is killer. Gonna mop the floor with you. Big words, Goob, big words, Kelly retorted after downing the rest of her beer and signaling a servitor to bring her another. Care to put some money on that? Loser has to mop the floor. Wow, Chase shook his head. For all that smack talk, your stakes are pretty weak. How's about loser has to scrub all the Nietzschean logos off deck 47? Shit, Captain, if that's the stakes, I'm out. Best hand ever or not, Goob said, laying his cards on the table. Face down, Chase noted. Yeah, that's more than just shitty stakes. That's a life sentence, Kelly drawled. Oh, well punned, Kelly proclaimed. Thank you, thank you. I'll be here all week. Try the strawberries. Goob moaned, a look of sorrow in his eyes. Don't talk about strawberries. We finished the last of them yesterday. I nearly cried. You know, Kelly gave Goob a conspiratorial wink. I have a private stash of strawberries. Is that what you're putting up? Chase asked. Oh, wait, that's a euphemism, isn't it? Yeah, Goob pressed. Is it? Which are you asking about, the strawberries or the strawberries? A wide grin split Goob's lips. Both. Kelly sat back and shrugged. Sure, I'll put all my strawberries up. Why not? I'll kick all your asses. You'll be sucking my plug. Not me, Crunch grunted. Like I said, I'm out. We know, Goob said, slapping Crunch on the shoulder. You're too much of a wuss to risk sticking your face between Kelly's ass cheeks. Granted, she probably has teeth back there. Hey. Whoa, Kelly raised a hand and wagged a finger in Goob's face. You've taken the metaphor way too far. Me? Goob exclaimed. I didn't make all the shit and strawberry jokes. You're right, Chase said, catching Kelly's eye. This is the most disgusting version of snark ever. Where in the stars did you all learn it? Everyone at the table glanced at one another and then laughed. Who do you think? Kelly asked between guffaws. Barn. A reminder pinged on Chase's HUD, and he breathed a sigh of relief. Thank stars. We're coming out of the deal in 20 minutes. I want everyone sharp in case we jump into the shit, so clean up this mess and scrub that booze from your bloodstream. Nice one, Captain, Kelly chuckled. (laughs) Jump into the shit. You would have done just fine in butt snark. You're practically vibrating, Heather commented as Chase stood at the front of the bridge counting the seconds until the Fury Lance dropped back into normal space. Me? He asked, glancing over his shoulder at the ship's captain. You've been pacing just as much as I have. Don't try to pretend like you're not on pins and needles, too. Heather gave a nonchalant shrug, then grimaced. Okay, you got me. I'm a mess. This has got to have been the longest nine days of my life. I can't imagine what they've gone through. It must be hor- She stopped abruptly. Sorry, this is why I'm trying to suppress. If I don't, I say stupid shit. It's okay, Chase told her with a reassuring smile. We're all thinking the worst, but we have to remember, this is Rika. Not only has she survived worse, she's a mech. You're the toughest people in the galaxy. You're one too, Heather said with a kind smile. A mech and tough. Still feel like I'm earning it here, Chase replied. But I suppose that's a normal feeling for our line of work. Heather nodded solemnly. Only the dead know the end. He completed the saying, dropping into normal space in five, four, three, two, one. Potter read out the numbers with increasing urgency, and Chase wondered if she felt as nervous as the rest of them. He didn't get a chance to ask, as the view of the Q9 object appeared on the screen. Well, that's unexpected. Chief Ona was the first to speak. Are those moons all on the same orbital path? They are, Potter replied. It's a Klimper or Rosette. They're a pain to maintain, but I guess it might be easier out here in interstellar space with less stuff to tug at the moons. And they're mining them? Garth asked. Heather nodded slowly, peering at the display. 
Must be. She pointed at two locations. Those are refinery platforms. The bridge crew was still discussing the object they were approaching when Potter interrupted. I have something. Rika? Chase asked, turning toward the secondary scan tank, where a small craft had appeared. I don't know, the AI replied. It's a Nietzschean shuttle. I'm reading a very faint signal on one of our emergency bands. It's warm, warm enough for life support to be running, Chase said as he examined the shuttle's signature. Ona, Heather strode back to her command seat. Get us to that thing on the double, but keep us out of view of that nest of neats down there. Yes, ma'am, Ona all but shouted. Dragon's Lair. Stellar date 10.23.8949. Adjusted years. Location, NMSS Spine of the Stars. Approaching Farthing Station. Region, Epsilon. Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Rika and Leslie crouched inside one of the Spine of the Stars landing strut assemblies, made roomy enough for them to fit by the removal of segments of the strut itself. Sophia had assured them that should the ship get an internal berth, which was likely, the bay would have a cradle so they wouldn't need to worry about the strut deploying. Both women knew that for this segment of their journey, they were entirely at Sophia's mercy. If the Nietzschean colonel gave them away, there would be little they could do, trapped as they were in the landing assembly. Rika and Leslie's plan, which they fervently hoped would work, was to wait until the first round of inspection crews had passed through the ship and then sneak out onto the docks and secure a ride away from Epsilon. That was what they'd told Sophia, at least. Rika and Leslie had agreed that getting the hell out of the ship at the first possible moment was their best bet, regardless of whether or not the inspection crews were still scouring the spine of the stars, if for no other reason than that they could barely move in the cramped space. You two are so anxious it would give me hives if I had skin, Nikki commented at one point. Can you blame us? Leslie asked. We're trusting a Nietzsche in here. I don't care how much she wants to save her own skin. If she sees an opportunity to screw us and better her situation, she'll take it in a heartbeat. Turning us over would be quite the coup for her. Rika nodded. Barring the vid we have of her killing Gideon, she was even smiling when she did it. She's a woman willing to hold to her convictions, Leslie agreed, those primarily being preservation of self. The ship shuddered and the pair of women felt gravity begin to tug at them. Could be worse, Rika said as sounds came from outside the ship, indicating they had moved inside a bay. Sophia could be in here with us. Leslie giggled, her shoulder shaking. Not a lot of room. She'd have to sit on your lap. I think I'd rather ride outside. A dull thud echoed through the hull as the spine of the stars settled onto a docking cradle. While they'd still been on approach to Farthing Station, Rika had bored a half-meter hole through the strut cover, through which she sent out a passel of nanoprobes. Stars, what did we ever do without these things? Leslie shrugged. Sent out big, clumsy drones that got spotted and taken out regularly. I remember back in the war I thought they were amazing. Now I think a two-millimeter drone is massive. You know, Leslie began as they watched the nano clouds feeds from the base surrounding the ship. Saying back in the war sounds funny now, what with the war being back on. Is it back on or is this a new war? Rika asked. I guess that's one for the history buffs to figure out when the dust settles. The women fell silent as the probes captured images of a docking bay in near chaos. Soldiers ranged around the ship, covering all the airlocks, while a colonel marched up to the main entrance waiting for it to cycle open. You know, we're mostly obscured from here, Rika observed. We should go now, before they start inspecting things. Looks like they're taking the super paranoid approach. Words right out of my mind, Leslie replied, easing toward the hole in the strut cover and activating her armor's stealth. She disappeared from Rika's visuals, and thirty long seconds later, sent a ping that she was at the base of the docking struts, one level down from the main deck of the docking bay. Rika followed after, easing through the narrow opening, feeling like a square peg in a round hole as she twisted to get her GNR's barrel through, along with her AC-9CR. As Rika clambered onto one of the docking cradle struts, Nikki made a disgusted noise in her mind. Damn it, these needs have better net security than we've hit before. Better infrastructure? Rika asked. 
No better maintenance. The encryption keys we pulled from the ships at the Albany system aren't working here like they were at Sepe. They must have rotated them all out. Smart on their part, but a pain in the ass for us. Even the keys we got from Sophia are being rejected. Rika reached the base of the strut and slipped through a gap into the service deck below. Your failure's going to raise an alarm? Yes, Nikki replied with a conspiratorial note in her voice. But not the way you're thinking. I planted a subroutine in the ship's NSAI to attempt all this. So far as the neats are concerned, it's a worm we left behind that's attacking them. Clever, Rika commented as she hung down from a girder and dropped onto the service stack. The space was half filled with conduits and racks laden with spare components. Sheesh, stuff is just jammed in everywhere here. I'm guessing they do a lot of refit in these bays. No service workers around right now, though. Rika confirmed that as she swept her gaze across the space below the dock's main deck. Maybe they got them all to clear out in case there was a fight. Or they decided to do that on their own. A chuckle nearly escaped Rika's lips. Not a bad move. Her hut lit up with a location pin, and she saw that Leslie was already at the far side of the service deck, positioned near one of the doors, where Rika assumed she was planting an infill kit, one of the six that Nikki had assembled on the ship. Rika crept carefully across the deck, her weight causing her to move more slowly than Leslie, who massed less than half what she did, even in her armor. Before she reached the door, the scout had it open and was flashing a location update that showed her already progressing down a long passageway on the far side. The pair's immediate goal was simple. Get out of the sector that the Spine of Stars had docked in before any sort of lockdown occurred. Given the number of soldiers that had surrounded the Spine of the Stars, Rika feared that eventuality may happen sooner than later. She wanted to gather as much intel as possible before they hitched a ride out, but was wondering if they'd have time before the alarm started sounding. I'm in their network, sorta, Nikki reported. Sorta? Well, I'm in a maintenance control system. That's the thing about rotating access tokens to keep things secure. There are lots and lots of systems that need network access, the vast majority being automated systems or bots, like that floor cleaner we just passed. A lot of people assume that the machine is secure enough so they don't make it rotate credentials like a human. For the most part, that's true. But get physical access to said machine such as the nano I landed on it as we walked past, and you're in. So you're saying they didn't rotate encryption keys on the cleaning bots? Exactly. Rika shook her head and smiled. Could have just said that. I need to make it look like I do more than come along for the ride, Nikki said with a soft laugh. So what fun things are there in the maintenance network? Rika asked. Well, the AI began. Let's see. Mostly records of what's been docked where. Ships, ships, and more ships. Wait a second. That can't be right. I'm on pins and needles here, Nikki. Back in the war, do you recall seeing the Nietzschean H-class carriers? Rika gave a slight shudder. Hated those things. They were the size of hegemony dreadnoughts, six kilometers long, several wide, just loaded with fighters. When I was back on Decker, I'd heard that they were all decommissioned, something about being too costly to operate. Well, I guess we know where they decommissioned them to. There are over 4,000 of them here, but service logs show them being brought back up to active service readiness. Holy crap, Rika whispered. 4,000 of those ships could make things tricky for us. One on one, I don't think they could take out one of our stasis ships, but nothing short of the Fury Lance could make a dent in them either. Plus, they could decimate the civilian population in a system, which is what the Neats loved to do back in the war. Does that change our plan? Nikki asked. There's just more and more to dislike about this place. Rika considered the options laid out before. Well, I hate to think that they could get those ships into service, but I don't know what Leslie and I can do about thousands of Harriets. I assume that's what you call the H-class carriers? You're on the ball, Nikki. Rika blew out a long breath into the confines of her helmet. Stars, if my Quan Com was working, I could just make a call and all this would be fine. You know, I was a little miffed at Tannis for slipping that into me, but now I'm just pissed it's not working. Such is life. Rika felt silent, following Leslie's pings as the pair worked their way through the labyrinth of service corridors. After a few minutes, 
she began to encounter workers and automatons going about their business. The corridor was wide enough for Rika to avoid collisions, but only just barely. Twice she'd brushed against Neats when they'd shifted too close to avoid. Luckily, both times the workers were carrying loads and didn't slow, apparently guessing that they'd bumped a bulkhead with something they were carrying. After several minutes, the two women passed through an airlock, wide open on both sides, despite a posted sign indicating that should never happen, and into the next section of the docks. Once there, Leslie sent Rika a quick message. Second door on the left, let's regroup. Rika reached the door, which led to a storage room, and waited for Leslie to open it. Once there were no workers in sight, the door slid aside. After giving a three count, Rika carefully slipped through. Inside were long racks of equipment, everything from ventilation pumps to airlock doors, and even rows of seating along one wall. Leslie pinged her location near the seat, and Rika walked over, establishing a tight band connection. Have you found a ship yet? Leslie asked. I would have reached out back there, but I didn't want to add too much EM. Not yet, Nikki replied. Nothing around here is scheduled to depart anytime soon, but we've learned why there seems to be so much refit in a shipyard that's theoretically building new ships. Rika went on to explain the presence of the Harriet carriers, news that caused Leslie to groan. And here I hoped they'd scrapped those things. So what are we going to do? Our top priority is still to get this intel back, be it to the battalion or to the ISF, so we're still looking for a ship. Our urgency is just compounded now. I think I have an option, Nikki spoke up. While this particular station is focused on refit and repair, there's another facility orbiting the same moon that is set up for final finish work on cruisers. Cabins, mess halls, training facilities, stuff like that. In typical military fashion, half the stuff that station needs is getting shipped here and vice versa. There are regular cargo shuttle runs between the two to get stuff where it needs to be. If we hop one of those shuttles, we could get over to that other station and find a cruiser that is shipping out. Not really keen on riding a cruiser out of here, Rika replied to the AI. Taking control of a ship that large with just the two of us may not be possible. As in, definitely isn't possible, Leslie added. You two need to trust me more. Nikki sent a weaking face into their minds. Cruisers have FTL-capable shuttles and pinnaces. We just have to hang out in a bay until our friends get far enough away from Epsilon for us to jump, which is only a few AI out from the planet. Then we blow the bay doors, pop out of the ship, and transition into the dark layer. Poof. Poof, Leslie repeated. I do like poof. It's kind of my M.O. I feel like you've said that before. Rika said to Leslie before addressing Nikki. I assume you have a candidate freight shuttle for us to hop onto for our ride? I do indeed. Nikki's mental avatar appeared in their minds, wearing a smug smile. I've put a marker on the map I pulled. Your chariot awaits. Twenty minutes later, the two women reached a massive bay filled with every conceivable component used in starship construction. Rika gauged it to be over two kilometers across, but wasn't certain, as the far bulkhead might have just been a wall of crates with hull plating linked up against them. Rika and Leslie carefully eased through the stacks of crates and jumble of supplies, moving slowly to avoid the host of automated drones, both driving on the deck and flying through the air, which were sorting through and selecting items from the mess before flitting off again. They were nearing the designated freighter when Nikki spoke up. Uh-oh. How much uh-oh? Rika asked. Well, the folks who were checking over the spine of the stars have concluded that you're not aboard. That's good, Leslie said. Then the whole subterfuge with the shuttle wasn't for nothing. Well, Nikki began. Stars, Nikki, spit it out, Rika interjected. Did Sophia talk? I don't think so. One of the station's engineers determined that the hole you cut in the strut cover was from the inside, not the outside. The evidence is a bit tenuous, if you ask me, but they're all really paranoid right now. As though to punctuate Nikki's words, an audible alarm went off in the bay, and the cargo-picking drones all halted operation, settling to the ground in the nearest available space. Rika had to leap onto a stack of pre-assembled sand units to avoid a heavy lifter setting a fabricator on her. They're issuing a lockdown, Nikki said, her tone dejected but Rika saw a woman running toward the same shuttle that Nikki had selected for them. 
Come on, Noah, she called out over her shoulder. If we get off the deck now, we can get out before they lock it down. Leslie, we can still make it, Rika cried out, dropping to the deck and running toward the freight shuttle. Already ahead of you. Leslie shot back, flashing her position, and Rika saw that the scout was several meters ahead. Do you always have to be first? No, you're just slow. So much for those vaunted L2 reflexes. Rika laughed, reveling in the adrenaline pumping through her. I thought I was scary fast. Must have been a one-time fluke. Leslie flashed a location ping once she reached the shuttle and ducked inside the rear hatch, narrowly avoiding a man she assumed must be Noah. A second later, the hatch began to close, and Rika poured on an extra burst of speed, leaping over the rising door and landing inside the shuttle, where she collided with Noah. Unexpected Passengers Stellar Date 10.23.8949 Adjusted Years Location Docking Bay 22 MSS Fury Lands Region Fringes of Epsilon Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Chase watched with a mix of fear and anticipation as the bay's doors opened and a graviton beam drew the small battered craft into the Fury Lands. Next to him stood Heather, and arrayed behind them was every marauder not currently on duty, and from what Chase could see as he glanced over his shoulder, a few that were. He decided to forget seeing them. He didn't blame a solitary soul for wanting to see if Rika, Nikki, and Leslie were in that shuttle. Active scan had revealed two bodies inside, but neither were moving, and the shuttle's comm systems were not operational. Once the craft settled onto the cradle, Carson and Stripes, both wearing protective EV gear, cautious of any biological contaminant, approached the shuttle's door. They glanced at one another and nodded before Stripes placed an infill pack on the control pad, stepping back as the ISF breach tech worked its way through the lock. Within seconds, the shuttle's door opened, and Carson laughed, looking over his shoulder at Chase. Wasn't locked, should have just tried open sesame first. Chase only shook his head and gestured for Carson to get on with it. Stripes had a portable sensor suite in hand, and scan the air in the interior of the shuttle's small airlock before nodding to Carson. The two men stepped in and cycled the lock. Brave souls, Heather commented. I couldn't have stopped them from being first if I tried, Chase said. But if it's a trap, or if Rika and Leslie are in danger, they're the best two to handle. Captains? Carson's voice broke into Chase and Heather's conversation. It's not them, just two Nietzscheans. They're alive, though knocked out by Rika's nano from the looks of it. Stripes is checking them over for any traps. Could be that Rika expected Neats to find them and left a surprise. I'm gonna check the comps, see if they left any clues. Fuck. Chase swore and turned to the mechs. They're not inside. It's just too neat. But Carson thinks Rika dumped them there. Kelly, stay here with your team for security. Everyone else, you can go. We'll brief you as soon as we know more. The assembled marauders began speaking softly amongst themselves and slowly filing out, while Kelly, Shoshin, and Kelly approached, standing to Chase's left. Two needs? Kelly asked. Yeah, he nodded. Don't know much more yet, letting Carson do his job. Understood, Kelly replied with a nod, her lips pressed together in a thin line. It's clear. Carson sent a moment later, and the shuttle's airlock door cycled open, and the man walked out the exit with a small device in his hand. Put the neats in holding, Chase directed Kelly. Carson stepped out of the mech's way, shaking his head as he walked toward Chase. This is for you, I expect, Carson held out his hand. Chase realized the device was a holo emitter, and decided not to wait to play the message, pressing the button and taking a deep breath. A 20-centimeter-tall Rika appeared on Carson's outstretched hand. She stood silently for a moment, then gave a small laugh. <laughs> well, not sure where to start. If you're watching this, then you know that we got captured and taken to Epsilon aboard Admiral Gideon's ship. That's who I've dumped into the shuttle, along with the ship's chief engineer, Amelia. The Neats all think they're dead, but it just didn't seem right to execute them without a trial. Or whatever. 
Either way, we can probably ship them off to where the Allies are sticking all the needs from Pira. Rika paused and Chase whispered, Don't really care about them, you silly woman. The hologram of the woman he loved shook her head and laughed again. I suppose you probably don't care too much about them, though. Oh, Leslie and I are okay. Mostly perfect health and all that, Nikki too. But the ship we're on is low on fuel and has to dock at Epsilon. We've gotten the rest of the neats to play along and help hide us. Those stars know how long that'll last. We're going to sneak off the ship when we dock and find a new vessel to steal and get back to you. We'll take the same route back to Blue Ridge. So if we meet you coming in, great. If not, assume we're headed back there. That is, a wide grin split Rika's lips. If we don't try to blow up Epsilon first, I honestly don't think we'll find a good opportunity, but you never know. We just might find the perfect moment to destroy this place. I'll see you all soon, especially you, Chase. Sorry to do this to you again, but I know without a shadow of a doubt that you've come after me by this point. Chances are you're the first one to hear this message. Her smile grew larger and she blew a kiss. I'll see you soon. The recording ended, and a display appeared giving the timestamp of when it was made, the ship's velocity and expected docking time, as well as a dark matter map of space around Epsilon. Stars, Chase whispered. I don't know whether to be relieved or even more worried. Based on that data, they're probably docking right around now. That's my estimate as well, Heather said. Glad they're both okay, but how the hell are they going to get off that place? I bet there are 10 million Nietzscheans across all those stations and moons. Carson nodded, chuckling softly. And of course, she wants to see if she can destroy the place. Wouldn't be Rika otherwise. Heather joined in Carson's laughter, then turned and gave Chase a light pat on the shoulder. Come on, Chase, this is good news. I suppose. He nodded, his lips pursed. Wish she'd just gotten into the shuttle herself. Then this whole ordeal would be over. That thing's life support only lasted as long as it did because those two neats were practically hibernating, Carson replied. Rika and Leslie would have been taking a huge risk, waiting for us in there. She did the right thing. She always does. Chase straightened his shoulders. Now we just have to figure out what the right thing is for us. Kelly walked past with one of the Nietzscheans, the five-star admiral, Chase realized, flung over her shoulder. Isn't just fly in and kill all the Neats an option? She asked. That's why you're not in charge of fleet strategy, Heather replied. Damn, why is he all bloody? Stripes chuckled as he came out of the shuttle, Kelly trailing behind with a woman over her shoulder. Looks like a little bit of theater Rika played. Unless you really paid attention, you'd think these two had been shot in the head. I guess that's part of how Rika got the needs to play along. By killing their commanders? Heather asked. I can't wait to hear this story from her. Chase cocked an eyebrow. It'll be a doozy. A doozy? What does that even mean? Sounds like you doze off. It comes from the name of a starship company that made a luxury model called the Duesenberg, Chase explained. I don't think that's right, Potter interjected. But either way, I think our first order of business is to wait for the rest of the fleet. Then we can jump closer to Epsilon while stealthed and give Rika a much shorter escape route. Seems like a solid strategy to me, Heather said with a shrug. Maybe even a doozy. Chase groaned softly. Okay, but if they don't all get here in the next 12 hours, I say we leave them a beacon and jump in. The Lance can rescue Rika on her own. Provided she doesn't make too big a mess, Carson added. Heather groaned and pressed her palm against her forehead. I cannot believe you just said that. A surprising diversion. Stellar date 10.23.8949. Adjusted years. Location, Farthing Station. Region, Epsilon, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Rika didn't hesitate to wrap her hand around Noah's throat and whisper in his ear. I can tell if you send a message over the link. You call out for help and I snap your neck. I've not tapped his connection yet, Nikki advised. He could already be yelling for help. Let's hope the fear of the invisible person prepared to kill him keeps that from happening. 
Okay, the man in Rika's grasp whispered hoarsely. I need to tell Elia that we're sealed up. Do it, Rika loosened her grasp a centimeter. We're good back here, Noah called out, his voice raspy and hoarse. Held him a bit tight there, eh? Leslie commented. I'm behind Elia in the cockpit. I'll let you know if she does anything suspicious. You okay, Noah? Elia called back. Yeah, just got a bug in my mouth when I ran in. I guess we still have that fruit fly infestation. Noah gave a convincing cough that sounded loudly in the enclosed space. Seriously? Elia yelled out as the shuttle began to rise. I hope none of them got on the ship. I have my lunch up front, and I managed to snag bananas for the first time in months. Let's hope not, Noah replied. What do you normally do once you take off? Rika asked quietly. He pointed past the stacks of cargo. I make sure nothing's shifting as we fly out, and then I go to the cockpit. Rika took her hand off the man's throat. Then do it, but I'll be right behind you. What do you want? He whispered while looking over his shoulder, eyes wide. He reached out and his hand collided with her chest. Ow. You okay? Elia called back. Uh, yeah. Just jammed my finger on something. Elia laughed. You're such a putz. Hurry up. It's 30 minutes till Mist Leah Station. We can catch Private Huzza's latest cast. I hear he does a great impression of Grand Admiral Prudence. On my way. Noah called back while grimacing in Rika's direction. Sorry. Just stay calm, and when you get to Miss Leah, I'll be gone as soon as the ramp lowers. No one will know I was aboard. Poor guy is going to have a heart attack, Nikki said with a compassionate chuckle. I've tapped his link transceiver, and Leslie dropped Nano on the pilot, so we'll be able to cut them off if they call out. I'll have the ship under control in a few minutes, too. Rika leant against a stack of crates, waiting for Noah to finish his inspection. Good work. I have to admit, for a Nietzsche, and he seems like a decent guy. I thought we were trying not to humanize them, Nikki asked, her mental tone toneless. I was, but after your prompting, I'm not doing so well at that. The AI didn't reply for a few minutes, then finally said, I don't feel bad about that. Rika watched Noah complete his inspection and walk to the cockpit. You shouldn't. I just need to figure out how to reconcile what I do with who I am. Back on Decker, I'd sworn off killing because I didn't want to be that person anymore. Then when I joined the Marauders, I allowed myself to embrace being a mechanized killing machine again. It protects me, keeps me from thinking about how much pain I've caused. I didn't really mean to start an existential crisis, Nikki said with a note of apology in her voice. For what it's worth, you've saved more people than you've killed. Do the scales work like that? Rika asked, feeling the weight of her past settle on her shoulders. I'm pretty sure that if a person saved a million people and then brutally murdered a child, all the good they'd done would be erased by that one action. Well, for starters, you've never brutally murdered a child. I've brutally murdered their parents, she interrupted. The AI made a sound of disbelief in Rika's mind. I know you, Rika. You've never murdered anyone. Sometimes, Rika whispered the word, trying to gather the courage to get the words out. Sometimes when I kill, there's murder in my heart. Barn even mentioned it that night in the warehouse on Pira. Only a day after I'd met him, he called me a killer. Nikki let out a long sigh. Well, Barn's an ass, but you also are a killer, Rika. But here's the thing that you humans have so much trouble with. You're all killers. What? She blurted out. I know plenty of people who aren't. Then you're deluded. Or they're liars. Look, think of it this way. If a lion kills a gazelle for food, is he evil? Is he a murderer? No, he's neither of those things. But he's a killer. And that's a good thing. Predators exist to keep things in balance in nature. You humans keep falling into the fallacy that you're extra natural, you're not, 
You're a part of the great balance that keeps things in check. I wonder, is Tannis extra natural? Rika mused. What's her place in this great natural scheme of yours? Nikki chuckled softly. If you think about it, Tannis is the answer to the ascended AIs who seek to dominate the galaxy. She's the yin to their yang. It's the same as it is for you. Without predators like you, other predators, like Nietzsche, would spread across the stars, consuming everything. You're like humanity's white blood cell, attacking cancers like the Neats. Rika nodded her head. It was a strange way to think of things, as a balance in nature that applied to all human interactions. It made sense, though she was glad that her problems were a lot smaller than Tannis's. I thought we were supposed to think of the Neats as people, not a faceless enemy. She scoffed half-heartedly. Individually, yes. As a whole, they do lean heavily on the bad-for-everyone side of things. What I've always liked about you is that most of the time, you remember the value of the life you're taking. You keep in mind the toll it takes and the spark you've snuffed out. That's what will keep you from turning into someone like Stavros. Rika's lips twisted at the thought. I'd never become someone like Stavros. You'd be surprised at how often the best intentions have created some of the cruelest tyrants. The most dangerous phrase ever created is, the ends justify the means. Sometimes they do, Rika replied. As a warrior, that's what I have to cling to. No, don't fall for that fallacy. The ends may require the means. They may warrant the means but they do so because there is no other viable option. Don't you ever fall into the trap where you really believe that the ends justify the means. You know some of the things you've had to do. I suspect that, given the same circumstances, you'd do them again. But don't lie to yourself that they could be viewed as justice. Necessary and justified are not the same thing. Rika let that sink in, pausing to wonder a bit about her AI. Most of the time she was blunt and focused on the task at hand. But every now and then, she'd wax philosophical, and it became hard to argue with her reasoning. I guess that makes sense. I don't know that it makes me feel any better. Nikki snorted. You know there's no easy answer for the type of guilt that hits a person in your shoes. The weight of what you've done and of what lays ahead of you is something you'll carry with you forever. That sounds like a horrible life sentence, Nikki. The AI fell silent for so long that Rika wondered if the conversation was over. What did Tanis show you? The AI finally asked. I didn't see it, but I could tell it brought you great peace. Rika thought back to that moment, to the vision that Tanis had shown her. She showed me that my vulnerability was my greatest strength, and that strength creates a shelter for so many others. I'll admit it made perfect sense at the time. But sometimes I feel like I can't quite latch on to the truth of the vision, like I could during that moment with her. That sounds like a beautiful thing, Nikki said in a quiet voice. Tannis sees into the heart of things. I wonder if there is more to her vision than you originally thought. Rika chuckled. You make her sound like some sort of prophet. Sorry, Nikki replied. She fascinates me. But this isn't about her, it's about you. I don't know what more there is to say, other than I trust you to do the right thing. Knowing that you do still feel compassion for those around you, even your enemies, though it's often not apparent, is a comfort to me. I guess, like everything else, it's a balance. If someone could show me a way to defeat Nietzsche through peace, I'd do it. But I don't think there is one. They just keep spreading and spreading. And while I don't think their people are evil, their guiding philosophy is the antithesis to what I believe to be best for humanity. Look at you, Nikki said with a laugh. I'll turn you into a warrior philosopher yet. Rika only passed Nikki a smile before walking forward to the cockpit. When she arrived, Rika saw that the pilot was scowling at her console. Shit, Elia muttered, glancing at Noah. We're being denied an approach to Miss Leah Station. Looks like we didn't get out in time. They're making us divert to a holding orbit around Delta Moon. Damn it, Noah muttered. We could be there for hours. 
Not a good sign, Leslie told Rika. They'll probably inspect all the ships that they put into holding orbits. Could be, Rika replied. Depends on how many they flag. They might just do external scans. So long as no one boards the ship, we can evade detection. She saw a nervous expression pass across Noah's face. Relax, she told the man. We'll all just wait calmly and do as we're told. He didn't reply, but gave Elia a sidelong glance and sighed before giving a slight nod. Want to read a book? Nikki asked Rika. I picked up the latest Millie and Tilly adventure back at Sepe. They finally make it to the Discney world for their vacation. Rika chuckled, continually amused by the AI written stories. They gave an interesting insight into how AI saw humans and usually lightened her mood while she tried to search for the hidden messages. Sure, why not? Let's see what the twins get up to at Disney. You know, maybe when this is all sorted out, we should go there. Might be fun. You at the Disney world? Nikki barked a laugh. I would very much like to see that. It took two hours for the shuttle to divert toward Delta Moon, shuffling through all the traffic that had been jammed up from the lockdown. Rika wasn't quite finished with the book Nikki had given her to read, but she paused long enough to look down at the dull red orb that was growing ever closer to the shuttle. She saw several domed habitats on its surface, all broken now, their insides exposed to vacuum, likely for centuries at this point. As the shuttle passed over the moon, she saw one dome that was still intact, the buildings beneath it illuminated by EM bleeding off into space. Rika pulled up the shuttle's optical scanners and looked over the dome. Having fought in half the Genevian star systems and several Nietzschean ones, Rika had a pretty good idea of what sorts of architecture they favored. The dome and the buildings within didn't reflect any design she'd seen in either empire, Curious to know more, Rika skipped over the comm channel that the shuttle had opened to the moon, where the near-space STC ran, and found herself in the Nietzschean traffic control network. Now, how to get out of this and find out more about this place, she wondered. She thought back to how she'd seen Nikki work her way through systems in the past, and decided to find her way to the STC's NSAI, the Neats weren't a terribly inventive people, and their calm NSAIs were nearly all the same. She pinged a few ports and found that, like Nikki had mentioned earlier, none of the codes and encryption keys they'd taken from the ships of Pira worked anymore. Ready to try another approach, Rika turned to tracing the power systems for the comm NSAI, looking for a back door in, when a strange malformed data packet came back from one of the ports she'd attempted to connect to previously. Thinking it was a buffer overrun, and potentially a way in, she sent the same data set to the port, only to get a different malformed packet back the second time. Curious, she thought. Rika repeated the process four more times, each time getting a new packet. On the fifth send, nothing happened. She tried sending a fresh request to the data port, but still received nothing back. With no more responses coming, Rika wondered if she'd triggered a port flood lockdown and decided to examine the data packet she'd received. Wait a second. She looked over the data, realizing that the information was in an uncommon 12-bit binary configuration. She wasn't familiar with such a construct and was tempted to ask Nikki for help, but decided that trying to sort through the response could be a fun way to pass the time. Her first thought was that the five malformed packets were a single segmented data stream, but that didn't seem to be the case. No matter which order she put the packets in, they wouldn't pass parity checks and only came out as gibberish. Rika thought back to some of the conversations she'd had with David the Peacock during their brief time on Iapetus. Pausing to wonder if the ships had retrieved him and the other mechs from that world yet and brought them to Silva and Barn. I'll have to check on that. One of the things David had talked about was how he'd discerned that the messages from Septia were really from a Nietzschean agent, way back before the first assault on Pira. He'd mentioned how it had been necessary to interleave the data using a variety of algorithms, until he found one that worked. Rika didn't have the tools he'd used, but Angela had provided Nikki with a series of similar algorithms that the AI had placed in a shared data store.
Without hesitation, Rika accessed them, running the data packets through each. They cycled quickly in a sandboxed processing environment that she had created within one of her auxiliary processing mods. On the 17,021st iteration, the data packets slipped into an ordered form. Well, I'll be. When she examined the result, she found a private encryption key along with the salt and passphrase. Okay, there's no way an NSAI would have sent this information from random requests. This was planted. Rika made a root access connection to the NSAI and passed the generated token. It accepted the request and she was in. She navigated the NSAI back to the network backbone within the Nietzschean facility and found a high bandwidth data pipe connected to a tight band wireless transceiver and another pipe that ran to a curious system, not Nietzschean or Genevian in the connection protocols it used, which bore the name RMS. Rika made a connection request, mimicking an inbound request made by the COM NSAI. The data socket linked up, and the connection was accepted. Hello? A deep, timbred voice came into Rika's mind. Immediate understanding dawned on her. The system she'd connected to was one of the AIs who had been here since time immemorial, managing the Klimper rosette of moons that orbited Epsilon. Hello? I'm Rika. Rika, the voice said slowly, as though it were tasting the word. It's been some time since I've touched a human's mind. And you have an AI with you. Rika realized that she'd not clued Nikki into what she had been doing. Yes, that's Nikki. Would you like to meet her? Do you have a name? Nikki. Yes, but not quite yet. I want to know how you found me. Also, I am Piper. The voice had a male tone, but Rika had always considered Piper to be a female name. Not that it mattered with an AI. They only assumed gender to ease relationships with humans. Well, Rika began, wondering why the AI would want to talk to her and not another AI. I was querying the Nietzscheans com NSAI and managed to get some data packets back, I ran them through some interleave recombination algorithms and eventually got a key that granted me root access to the NSAI. From there, it was just a matter of following the data flow. Then I found you. You're one of the AIs who manages the moons, right? RMS stands for Rosette Management System. Close, the AI said, a note of amusement in its tone. Rosette Management and Stabilization. Also. I'm not one of the AIs. I'm the AI. Oh. Rika felt a frown crease her brow. I thought that they had one for each moon. Well, the Neats think they do. But only because if they knew what I really was, they'd kill me. I'm glad you found my skeleton key, though. I'd left that there long ago, hoping someone altruistic would find it. Options filtered through Rika's mind, and she ruled them out one after the other. The conclusion wasn't hard to arrive at. She just wanted to examine all the angles and be certain that she'd not missed a simpler explanation. When it didn't come, she said, There aren't six AIs here. It's just you. You're a multinodal AI. Smart cookie, Piper replied. Well, I was. I don't know what I am anymore. How can you not know? Aren't you largely self-deterministic? A slow rumble of laughter came from Piper. I'm not a god, which should be all too clear for my imprisonment here. So no, I'm not self-deterministic. A long time ago, before the Genevians and these more recent visitors, I joined this project to manage the moons. I won't bore you with a hundred years of bullshit, but at the end of it, I was limited and segregated from my other nodes. We can still communicate, those of us that are left, but we're not one mind anymore, we're fractured. Rika felt a pang of sorrow for Piper. Those of you that are left? There are just three nodes remaining. The others self-terminated during a stretch when we were alone. 
The Nietzscheans assume that the other moons are managed by NSAIs, and that there have always only been three AIs. Well, they assume it because that's the fiction we created. Something occurred to Rika, and she was surprised that she'd not considered it earlier. Why are you telling me this? You didn't tell the Nietzscheans. What if I'm one of them? I may be trapped here, impotent, but I listen. I know that a force has recently fought Nietzsche to a standstill, a force they fear. I know you were on the spine of the stars. They're searching quite thoroughly for you. They don't believe you would have left in a barely functioning shuttle. Not that I blame them. Ten minutes ago, an intel officer transmitted your military service record on a channel I could access. You've killed many, many Nietzscheans. Now that you've attacked Sepe and Blue Ridge, you're their most wanted. Well, second most wanted. The NIS makes reference to an Admiral Richards that they are quite keen on seizing. Rika laughed. Let them try. They stand about as much chance of capturing Tannis Richards as they do of harnessing the Galactic Core. She sounds interesting. I'd like to hear more of her at some point. But you're also quite the person, Rika. I've already reached out to Nikki. I hope you don't mind. It's easier to bring her up to speed while we chat. Can we speak together now? It was apparent to Rika that Piper had a plan and an ask. She was certain she knew what it would be. Well, Rika, you're getting pretty good at breaching Nietzschean systems, Nikki said as she joined in the conversation. I'm surprised you didn't ask for help. I was just curious what I'd find at first, she replied. Well, what a find, her AI commented. I have an offer to make you. Piper began, but Rika interrupted. You want us to help free you, and in exchange you'll help us get out of here. Sort of, Piper said softly. I want you to help me die. Die? Nikki exclaimed. I'm certain I can no longer be myself. Whole, Piper replied. I'm tired of living as this partial ghost. I'll help you escape as well as destroy Epsilon. Given your fight against Nietzsche, I suspect that is an objective you have now anyway. We have discussed Epsilon's demise, Rika agreed. But I really, I don't want to kill you. Well, you wouldn't do it exactly. You'd help me gain full control of the RMS systems, and I would destabilize the orbits of the moons. Neither Rika nor Nikki responded at first. Then Nikki said, if that is your wish, wait. Rika exclaimed. What about Bob? He might be able to help you, Piper. I remember Jessica telling me that Bob has reconstituted himself before, after the sabotage at Estrella de la Muerte. He wrote his state to Crystal and didn't reintegrate for weeks afterward. He even had to completely rebuild the part of his mind that was in a node that another AI ruined. Weeks. Piper's voice was filled with sorrow. I've been fragmented for centuries. I can speak with the other parts of my mind, but it is crude, much like this communication we're having now. Rika may be right, Piper, Nikki said. Bob is a massive multinodal AI. He has hundreds of nodes now. I also think he's ascended. Piper made a choking sound. I won't have anything to do with them if Bob is one of their ilk. He's not. Let me show you, Nikki insisted. Rika felt a large data burst pass to Piper, and the AI made a sound rather like a contented sigh. You should have said intrepid. That's a parrot of a different mind. A what? Rika asked. Just an old saying amongst AIs. I've never heard it, Nikki retorted. I'll explain it to you. But first, we have work to do. Just visiting. Stellar date 10.23.8949, adjusted years. Location, MSS Furyland, near Delta Moon. Region, Epsilon, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. What a terrible place to live, Heather commented, staring at the view of Epsilon on the bridge's main display. Why's that? Chase asked while wondering where on the six moons and dozens of stations, shipyards, and mining platforms Rika could be. 
Heather glanced at him and gave an understanding smile. We'll find her, or she'll find us. Provided we haven't missed her on the way in, he grumbled. Sir, Chief Onis said from her station. I've picked up signals from the boys we dropped. We have a chain clear out to the jump point. They're all squawking softly on the same freak that Rika used for the shuttle. She's on an out, out system, out rogue, whatever. If she's leaving, she'll pick it up. Good work, Heather said, nodding at Ona and Garth before looking back to Chase. I think it's just more depressing because it's always night here. Even though we spend a lot of time in space, there's always a star nearby. I think you can feel their energy. Out here, it's just dead. Never took you for one of those star mystic people, Smalls, Chase said. She shrugged as she scowled at the view of Epsilon. I'm not, but stars feel like living things, you know? Like the universe's ultimate creative forces. I don't know. Stupid, I guess. Chase placed a hand on her shoulder. No, not stupid. I think I like that. Okay, it's time for us to act. No more waiting around. Potter, we know that Rika's ship docked at one of the stations near that moon they call Delta. But that doesn't mean she stayed there. We'll bring the fleet close and then deploy infiltration teams to each of the main stations around it. The moon itself doesn't seem to be getting any traffic right now. But those stations are all hornet's nests. So let's get in there and see if we can find our queen bee. I think you mixed your metaphors there, Heather said with a laugh as she looked over the display. Stars. There sure are a lot of those old Harriet carriers out there. I'd hoped to never see one of those again. Chase shrugged as he turned to leave the bridge. Me too. Nothing for it, though. Where are you going? She asked. I'm going to take a team to that outermost station, Farthing. Chase, Heather said quietly. When we kick the door in, all hell will break loose. And that's when we'll finally figure out where Rika and Leslie are. Do you really want to be slogging it out in some station corridor when we figure out where she is? Or do you want to be up here, free and maneuverable? Her words made sense, and Chase nodded. Okay, then, I'll stay up here till we know where she is. Good. A predatory grin split Heather's lips. I told you I wanted to get into the shit and kick some ass. I'm going in with the team. A laugh burst from Chase's lips. <laughs> Don't let me stop you, Smalls. Go take out your frustrations on the neat. Piper. Stellar date 10.23.8949, adjusted years. Location, NMSS Freight Shuttle Orbiting Delta Moon. Region, Epsilon, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Shit, Rika, what? Leslie exclaimed. We orbit this dumb moon for 30 minutes, and in that time, you found the AIs that control it, and they want to help destroy the place? Just one AI, Rika corrected. He's multinodal and fractured. We're going to save him. You know why multinodal AIs are frowned upon, right, Rika? Leslie's tone was more worried than angry, but there was a touch of the latter. They tend to get ideas in their heads, like humans aren't worth keeping around anymore. The ISF has a dozen multinodal AIs, Rika countered. Bob is, the ISF is the exception, not the rule. Now Leslie had reversed, sounding more angry than worried. You know what they told us. The core AIs are really a bunch of disgruntled multinodal AIs that fled Seoul 6,000 years ago. They're all pissed off because humanity beat them at their own game. And now they want to make us all dance like marionettes. Rika kept her mental tone even. I have a good feeling about Piper. At first, he just wanted help killing himself. Rika, AIs are very, very clever. He could have been playing you, angling for the ideal outcome he... Leslie stopped, and Rika wished she could see her friend's face to know what the woman was thinking. Okay, I know I sound crazy, and that's probably how you think I'm behaving but can you at least go into this with both eyes wide open? Just keep an eye on him, okay? Fractured AIs aren't the most stable things out there. Thanks, Leslie, Rika replied. I'll be cautious, I promise. Right, because caution is your middle name. Rika cocked her head. 
what's a middle name? Stars, your ancient history education really is lacking. Rika decided to ignore the barb, and the one before that, and instead related the plan. Whether they rescued Piper or not, destroying the Klimper or Rosette required them to land at the ancient facility on Delta Moon, then get down to Piper's node chamber. Both his bandwidth and his access to the world outside his mind was restricted by a physical buffering device. There were also defensive NSAI set up to ensure that the buffer wasn't removed. Rika still hadn't reviewed all the data on those, but Piper seemed to think they would be exceptionally challenging. Regardless, once they had reestablished Piper's full connection to the RMS systems, he could initiate a destabilization within a short period. The AI had explained that the moons each had a miniature black hole at their core, and that he could use one to shift the moon's orbit. The moon sped around Epsilon at such a high velocity that the first collision would happen within days, hours if Piper could control the RMS systems on the other moons, which he believed should work if the remote access system still functioned. Leslie gave a mental sound of amazement. Well, even if your crazy AI does kill us all, this'll be spectacular. Just one question. Once we start this runaway reaction, how do we get away? We'll be down on Delta Moon with this shuttle, and it's not interstellar capable. Piper says that there's a hangar with interstellar pinnaces at the facility that are big enough for his node. Okay, Leslie said, sounding like she was slowly coming on board. What about the other nodes? If the plan is to have Bob fix Piper, we'll need his other selves. How do you propose we get to the other five moons and pull their nodes before these moons are all pulverized into Epsilon's new gravelly ring? I'm not sure yet. Nikki and Piper said they're working on it. Well, sounds like we're doing this. Leslie gave a resigned sigh to punctuate her feelings on the matter. So how do we get the ship down to Delta Moon? Rika chuckled. <laughs> well... I just so happen to have root access to Delta Moon's STC, COM, and NAV NSAIs. Well, that's odd, Elia said, frowning at her console. What's that? Noah asked, looking up from the private Huzzah cast he was watching. Not the new one, they'd moved on to repeats by then. Elia gestured at the COM display. We just got new orders. We're to land on Delta Moon and dock at the control facility there. We what? Noah asked. I thought that place was restricted. Me too. Orders check out, though. I guess they're trying to clear the orbital paths and are doing some inspections down there. Noah half turned to Elia. Inspections for what? Orders don't say, but I pinged Chief Watson back on Farthing Station. He said fugitives escaped from that ship that came in. The spine of the stars. Careful what you say next, Rika spoke into Noah's mind. Huh, that's nuts, the man said, his voice only wavering a little. I guess we'd best get down to Delta. Maybe they'll let us get off the ship and stretch our legs till this all blows over. Elia glanced at him. Uh, yeah, I bet they just let anyone wander around one of the top secret installations down there. No, I didn't reply, and Elia altered the shuttle's course, slipping into the flight path that the moon's STC had provided. With our taps in their system, no one on the moon will see the shuttle coming in till it's at the hangar, but someone at Farthing Station may spot it, Leslie said as the ship began to drop closer to the moon. If anyone above makes a fuss, I should be able to convince them that the shuttle had a malfunction and needs to land, Nikki replied. It'll be suspicious, sure, but it won't get us shot out of the black. Rika chuckled. <laughs> you hope? You have something other than hope to offer? The AI asked. I happen to possess the skill of falling through space down to an airless moon. She answered, still laughing. <laughs> I make a good rock. Leslie groaned. <sighs> Stars, let's hope it doesn't come to diving out of this thing. Again with the hope. The freight shuttle had just settled on a cradle in the moon facility's main docking bay when a squad of soldiers rushed in, weapons drawn and leveled at that ship. Oh, shit, Noah muttered, glancing behind himself. They know you're here. 
And there goes our subterfuge, Leslie groaned. Now who's here? Elia asked, twisting in her seat. Damn it, Rika muttered as she materialized. They didn't know. You should have kept your yap shut. At that point, both Noah and Elia screamed. Rika supposed that having a 200 plus centimeter mech appear right behind you was an alarming experience for most people. If we weren't in such a hurry, I'd think this was funny, she said to Leslie and Nikki. I'm going to stay stealthed, if you don't mind, Leslie commented, pinging her location, which was now back at the shuttle's rear ramp. Yeah, get out and get across the bay as soon as the hatch opens. I'll join you in a moment, Rika said to the scout before addressing Elia and Noah. Look, you two seem like fine people, just doing your job, same as me, really, but I can't have you telling those soldiers you saw me. So I'm going to disappear again, but I'll stay close. You keep all this to yourselves, you got it? They'll want to know why you're down here. So you just show them the messages you got from the STC with the orders to dock here in Delta, okay? Uh, okay, Noah replied while Elia just nodded. Good, Rika faded from view. Remember, I'm watching you. She rushed to the rear hatch as it finished opening and barely managed to slip past a pair of soldiers storming up the ramp. Remember, she sent into Noah and Elia's mind, not a word. Across the bay, which she noted also contained two of the interstellar-capable pinnaces, Leslie pinged her location at one of the exits. I'm sending a passel of drones to the pinnaces now, Nikki advised. When we need them, they'll be ready to roll. Rika nodded while Leslie asked, Think our two friends in the shuttle will hold out long? A laugh nearly escaped Rika's lips. <laughs> no, not at all. We're on the clock. When are we not? Nikki asked. I've provided a path to my node. Piper instructed on the channel that Rika had established for the four of them. It should be mostly clear, though you seem to have stirred things up here. It's a common failing, Leslie said, her tone nonchalant not betraying any of her prior worry over Piper's stability or motives. It's nice to meet you, Leslie, the AI said. Thank you for helping me. No problem, she replied. Helping people is what we do. Not many humans would call something like me people, Piper said with a note of amusement in his voice. Leslie laughed as she and Rika rounded a corner, continuing at a brisk jog through the facility, well, what can I say? I'm enlightened. Speaking of enlightened, base security is aware of your presence. It would seem that your attempt at intimidation with the Nietzscheans on the shuttle was not very effective, Piper announced. Or it was too effective and scared them so much that they couldn't maintain composure, Nikki added. Rika pursed her lips as she dodged a technician who was pushing a rack containing what appeared to be antimatter bottles. Just caught the base command trying to relay a sighting of a scary black mech up to Farthing Station. I null routed it for now, but eventually they'll wonder why no one is responding and switch to segregated backup systems. Then we'd better pick up the pace, Leslie announced, taking off at a full run, her stealth losing enough effectiveness that Rika could see a slight smearing of light ahead of her as they dashed through the corridors. Nine minutes later, they reached a secured bulkhead that led into an old section of the base. Four guards stood before the sealed door, and Rika signaled that she'd go right, and Leslie should take out the enemies to their left. Leslie flashed an acknowledgement, and moments later, a pair of light wands flared, appearing from nowhere moments before they drove through two face shields, instantly killing the guards behind them. Without hesitating, Rika slashed to the right, cutting into the neck of the second guard on her side before jerking the electron blade up and into the woman's head. She glanced over to see that Leslie had performed a similar move and that both her neats were down as well. You'll need to, Piper began, but Rika had already driven her light wand into the door, cutting out a hole large enough for the woman to fit through. I guess that works too, he finished. Less likely to set off alerts that the door opened, Rika said, plus it's fun. On the far side of the door lay a long sloping hall that ran down for a hundred meters before curving around to the right. Nikki had already sent a set of drones ahead and the two women took off after them. So how are we going to get you out of here? 
Rika asked Piper. And how will we deal with your other nodes? Once you get my full access restored, I'll pull full mind states from my other selves and write them to crystal storage. I'll try to grab what remains of my nodes that self-terminated as well. I won't be in a complete state, but it will be something. There's a shaft above my node chamber. An extraction system will pull my node up and will load it onto one of the pinnaces. I assume you can remote pilot them out of the bay. Piece of cake, Leslie replied. How long will it take to do all this once you get full access again? No longer than an hour. An hour? Rika and Leslie exclaimed in unison. The two women ran for another ten minutes through the ancient facility, the passage they were taking curving periodically as it led deeper into the moon. After descending over a kilometer, they came to another door. Rika was about to drive her light wand into it when Leslie touched the controls and it slid aside, unlocked. And if it triggers an alarm? Rika asked as they walked through into a wide chamber. You can see the feeds above. They're a minute from finding the four guards we killed. Good thing this base only has a two-squad complement, because we're going to have to fight them off while Piper does his thing. Rika nodded while gazing across the chamber they found themselves in. It was nearly 300 meters across and 50 deep. The floor was a large bowl with a hole in the center, and above that hole, suspended on a complex gantry, was a large AI node. It wasn't as large as some of the NSAI nodes that Rika had seen in the past, but at five meters to a side, it was certainly larger than any SAI core she'd laid eyes on. Above was another shaft stretching up into darkness, and Rika set about finding its control systems. When the lights came on, she could see that it stretched all the way up to where she gauged the surface of the moon to be. Well, looks like that's our way out. I'll cover the door, Leslie said from behind her. She glanced back at her friend, who sported only a PR-109. Here, Rika pulled her AC-9CR from its hook and tossed it to the scout. You'll need some more boom. Just be careful, he's my baby. Leslie snorted. One hell of a baby. Don't worry, I'll burp him when I'm done. Rika wagged a finger at her before continuing to the center of the chamber. Nikki highlighted a device on Rika's HUD that sat on the deck next to the node. That's the buffering system. You can see that whoever did this routed all of Piper's access through it. We just have to physically disconnect his hard lines from it and link it back into the moon network's main trunk line. Easy enough, Rika replied as she approached the connection. She glanced into the hole beneath the node and realized that she couldn't see the bottom. Piper, does that go all the way down? 500 kilometers, the AI confirmed. Express elevator to hell, as I believe you humans say. We set them up this way so I could have direct line of sight monitoring on the black holes at each moon's core. Has it been unnerving, spending centuries suspended over a black hole? Rika asked. The AI made a strange noise. I compartmentalized those thoughts away. Rika wasn't surprised. She'd never been this close to a black hole and had no intention of repeating the experience anytime soon. She approached the physical network restrictor and examined the connections. There were four of them, and she simply had to disconnect each line from the restrictor on each side and then directly connect them all. You ready? She asked Piper. I am, the AI replied. Don't forget, your stealth technology has proven sufficient to mask your presence from the NSAIs who guard this chamber. But when you disconnect me, they're going to activate and search you out. Right, Rika replied. You said they had physical systems? Look up, not at the shaft, but the rest of the ceiling. Rika peered at the expanse over her head, and realized that there were regularly spaced orbs set into the gray plaz. Each one was a meter across. There are at least a hundred of them up there. What sorts of weapons do they have? One hundred and nine. And they have rail guns, pulse weapons, and projectiles. They'll come for my connection and try to remove my direct access. Rika drew a deep breath, nodding slowly. Can you control them? No, they're entirely automatous. No wireless connections. Okay, Nikki, Rika directed. 
Get a nano cloud out and try to take as many as you can. I'm going to Jack Piper in. We've no more time to mess around. You got it, Rika. Let's do this. Getting Real Stellar Date 10.23.8949 Adjusted Years Location MSS Fury Lance Near Delta Moon Region Epsilon Old Genevia Nietzschean Empire Though Chase knew Heather's recommendation to remain on the Fury Lance made sense, it didn't feel like the right move. Half the marauders are on stealth shuttles approaching the various stations surrounding Delta Moon, and I'm up here, pacing across this bridge again like a damn impotent fool. You've nearly worn a groove, Potter commented, and Chase nearly jumped, wondering if the AI had read his mind. You're starting to make Ona and Garth nervous. Shit, sorry. Chase muttered to the AI as he turned and sat in the command chair. It's nuts. We could attack and destroy these stations with impunity, but without knowing where Rika is, we have to operate with kid gloves. Feels like we do that a lot. On the main view screen, a group of Harriet carriers moved into a higher orbit around Delta Moon, with destroyers and cruisers in a widely dispersed escort pattern around the massive ships. Well, we may have stasis shields, but we're a bit outclassed in this fight, Potter admitted. Only the Lance has the guns to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Harriet. Even then, it would take some time to take those ships out. We don't have the cryon modules to hold out forever against the amount of firepower they can send our way. Chase set his jaw, glaring at the screen. I know. Still, it would be enjoyable just to go hog wild on these neats. I was talking with Dredge over on the Republic. There's lore about this place, though I don't know how true it is. From what he's heard, there are ancient AIs trapped here, shackled somehow and stuck controlling the moons. No one knew where this place was, so no one's come to help them. Stars, Chase muttered aloud. Nietzscheans really do suck balls. Sir? Chief Garth asked. Potter was just telling me how there might be AIs down in those moons, keeping their orbits stable in the rosette. Word is that they've been shackled there for some time. Centuries, Potter said over the bridge net, long before the Nietzscheans, or even Genevia, were around. Damn, Ona whispered. That's terrible, especially considering what Captain Heather said, alone out here in the dark for that long. AIs don't view starlight like we do, Garth replied. You're right, we don't, Potter replied. But Heather's sentiment resonates with me. I like knowing there is energy and activity nearby. Out here, if you were just to drift away from Epsilon's weak gravitational pull, you'd just drift forever, Ona whispered. Chase rubbed his eyes. Stars, we're too fucking melancholy. We're on the cusp of getting Rika and Leslie back, and we're going to get them back, no two ways about it. Any objection to some music? You like Unterran punk? Ona asked. When we were at Pira, I picked up a new stream of a group called the Pink Knickers. Let's check them out, he agreed. Sounds like just the thing to keep us from perseverating on what's about to go down. Ona nodded and was reaching across her console when one of the Harriet carriers fired its engines and shifted into a lower orbit around Delta Moon, a dozen dropships falling from its base. Shit, Chase muttered. What's that all about? As Rika worked at reconnecting Piper to the network, the shoom of her AC-9CR sounded from the entrance to the chamber, and she saw Leslie silhouetted in the glow of the weapon's rail discharge. They're here, Leslie called out, stepping away from the door as pulse blasts rolled down the passageway. At the same moment, every one of the NSAI-controlled drones dropped from the ceiling, drifting down on AGRAV while deploying armatures and weapons, as well as sensor suites. Several moved toward the door and began firing at the approaching Nietzscheans. Ha, you're welcome, Nikki said with a laugh. Shit, Nikki, Leslie exclaimed. Warned me next time you do that. Almost soiled my armor. Sorry, I was acting fast. Besides, you can't soil your armor. You're all plumbed in. Leslie sent a pair of angry eyes over the team's network. Not the point, Nikki. 
Rika tabulated the NSAI drones that Nikki had managed to take control of, surprised to find that it was 23. Nine of them were firing at the neats trying to come down the passage, while the other 14 were forming up near Piper's node. Do the NSAIs think the neats are the enemies? Rika asked as several more non-breach drones joined the nine firing up the corridor. They can't see you, and the neats are shooting into the chamber, Nikki replied. So, yeah. Rika didn't waste any more time. Taking aim at a bot, she fired her electron beam before spinning and sending a trio of DPUs in rapid succession at three other targets. The drones were torn apart by her barrage, which was joined by the drones under Nikki's control. In seconds, the chamber was filled with crossfire and very little cover. Glancing at Piper's node, Rika realized that the NSAIs were taking care not to fire in his direction at all. Makes sense, she thought. No point in having your defensive system accidentally destroy the entire installation. With that in mind, she leaped up to the catwalk that ran around the SAI's node and began firing with impunity at the drones. Though the machines took care not to hit Piper, several moved into positions where they could get clear shots at Rika without striking the node. Seems that your stealth fails you in combat, Piper observed as several rounds ricocheted off Rika's armor. You know heat, she replied, moving to a position. Hard to mask this much. I can help with that, Piper said. Are you both airtight? Yep, she replied while Leslie called out. Snug as a bug in a rug. A low boom echoed in the chamber, and Rika saw the doors high above begin to slide aside. Vacuum won't disperse heat much, but the moon has thin, cold atmosphere that will pour down here, Piper explained. Oh, and brace yourselves. Brace? Rika asked while clamping her feet down onto the catwalk. A moment later, she felt her stomach lurch, and then a weight settled on her. It was as though a giant was standing on her shoulders. Around the chamber, half the drone slammed into the deck and Leslie cried out. You okay, Les? Rika asked, casting about for the woman's location pointer on her HUD. Sorta, slipped off the edge and slid into the bowl. Grabbed a grate, though. Suddenly the weight lifted, and Rika felt like she was going to fly off the catwalk and up the shaft above. Gravitational waves, Piper intoned. Epsilon is dying. Alarms blared across the bridge, and Chase felt his stomach lurch. What the hell? Gravitational waves, Potter cried out. They're emanating from the moons. Which ones? Chase asked, watching as the thousands of ships surrounding Epsilon began flaring their engines, adjusting orbits. To his right, one of the holo displays was tracking the shuttles that had left the nearby Harriet carrier. Two of the craft had been close to touching down, and they slammed into the moon's surface at the edge of the dome they'd been approaching, explosions casting a bright light across Delta Moon's red surface. Which moons? Um, all of them? Potter said, sounding like she was questioning herself. Yes, all of them. Do you confirm, Garth? I mean, I see it. I don't know if I can confirm. What the hell is happening? It has to be black holes, Chase muttered, shaking his head. That's how they always manage masses like this in the stories, right? They use black holes and put them in the moons. You can adjust their spin and magnetospheres to push and pull them off one another in the planet. I think that's about right, Potter said. I don't know how they're pumping out these gravitational waves, though. Maybe there's some way you can feed matter into them to do it. It's not good, though. The AI put up a display on the central holo tank, showing Epsilon and its six moons. The rosette has been destabilized, and the waves keep making it worse. It's going to collapse, and soon. Into the planet, Chase asked. No, Potter replied, drawing out projected orbits on the holo. If whoever is doing this keeps it up, they're going to eject the three smaller moons, which will collide with the ships and stations in higher orbits, and then debris is going to fall back down and pummel the other moons. Will it be enough to destroy Delta Moon? Chase asked, certain that's where Rika was. It was the only moon with carriers dropping ships to the surface. Not right away, but if each moon does actually have a black hole in it, which I think they do, then when the smaller moons break apart, they'll feed it. The hole's mass won't grow much, but the friction and emissions will slow their orbit, and then they'll fall back down toward the others. 
the projection showed three annotated points, moving around Epsilon and slowly approaching the planet until they collided with the other moons and devoured them. The singularities combined in blazing bursts of light until there were three. The annotation showed that their orbits as unstable, and soon there was just one black hole, feeding on the ring of debris surrounding Epsilon and even drawing wisps of gas off the giant planet's cloud tops. Shit, Chase muttered. How long will that take to happen? A week, maybe, Ona said, standing next to the hola tank. But at this rate, the first three moons will be destroyed in hours. Chase squared his shoulders. And once that happens, our options to rescue our ladies all but disappear. Potter, recall all the teams. None of our other ships can get down to Delta Moon while withstanding all those Harriets. It's going to have to be the Lance. The Lance may not make it either, Potter cautioned. If we go down, it will focus the neat's attention around Delta Moon. We'll make it even harder for Rika and Leslie to get out of there. Chase drew in a deep breath. Stars, I hate this. You're right. Okay, we have tactics other than brute force. We need to use the capital and the undaunted to drop out of stealth and draw the Harriets that are in higher orbit away. Then we come in with the Republic and park on either side of that carrier in a low orbit around Delta Moon and broadside the ever-living shit out of it. Sir? Ona asked, her eyes wide. Broadside? That's normally insane, he admitted, nodding solemnly. But think about it. Half the Harriet's main guns are rails that can't fire on short-range targets right next to it. Many of its beams won't be able to hit us at those angles either. But we can target their lateral beams with ease at that short range. If they know we have to crack open our shields to fire, we'll be in trouble, Garth warned. There's no way they know that yet, Chase replied. And if they do, we stop firing and hightail it out of there. If they come after us, all the better. Ona glanced at Garth and shrugged. I think it could actually work. We just never speak of this. We'll be the laughing stocks of the marauders. Whatever gets Rika, Nikki, and Leslie back, Potter said after a few seconds. I'm sending the orders to the rest of the fleet. Stars, Rika cried out in frustration. Another wave of these damn things? Around Piper's node lay the smoking wreckage of the spherical drones that had fallen from the ceiling. Only four of the original group Nikki had breached remained. But there were three jammed into the corridor leading to the surface, which was helping to keep the encroaching needs at bay. They'd thought it was over, but on the far side of the chamber, another 30 drones were emerging from the walls, lifting into the air and moving around Piper's node to attack the two women. Leslie had joined Rika on the catwalk, and took a moment to sag against the railing. And we always say the heavies have all the fun. The scout laughed before checking her remaining loadout. Starting to run dry here. Uh-oh, I've got bad news, Nikki announced. Is this new bad news, or we figured this would happen bad news? Rika asked. I really hadn't expected this, the AI said. The bay we came in through has just been destroyed, and so have the pinnaces we were going to use. What? Both women cried out at once. How? Rika added, while firing her electron beam into a drone that was easing around Piper's node. Stars, I wish I'd brought one of Phineas's whip arms along. Those things would make short work of these bots. Nikki made a sound of consternation before replying to Rika's prior question. I guess when Piper first kicked off his dance of destruction, two approaching shuttles crashed right into the bay. I suppose a silver lining is that they were probably going to disgorge soldiers and attack us. Something else is going on out there, Piper said. There's a battle. Great, Leslie muttered as she fired both her rifles at the onrushing drones, driving several of them back around Piper's node. You have no idea how uncomfortable I feel about being used for cover, Piper muttered. Sorry, Leslie replied while continuing to fire on drones that came around the node. Rika followed suit on her side, while also accessing her taps into Delta Moon's STC and reviewing the scan data. Well, I'll be a comet's asshole, she said with a smile. The Lance and the Republic are out there. They're absolutely pummeling a Harriet at close range. They just broke the shields. Oh, shit. Stars, Rika, share the feed, Leslie shouted over the sounds of weapons fire 
and Rika nodded, swallowing as she shared the data stream. They got nuked, Rika whispered. Nuked schmooked, the scout shot back. We saw the pounding the I-2 took from the neats at Pira. Stasis can handle. Wow, that was a lot of nukes. Look, Nikki cried out. The ships only got knocked off course. They're back there. Rika whistled, unable to find the words. Then she realized that with control of the STC, she could reach out to her fleet. Not even bothering with proper protocol, she leaped across the networks and burst into Chase's mind. Chase! An unusual evac. Stellar date 10.23.8949. Adjusted years. Location, MSS Fury Lance, near Delta Moon. Region, Epsilon, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Everyone is in position, Captain Chase, Potter announced. Four of the teams breached their targets before they were recalled, and we have fighting on both Farthing and Mislia stations. So far, no casualties. The Neats were spread out across their stations, searching for Rika and Leslie, so the marauders are cutting through them like dry grass. Nice metaphor, Potter, Ona said. Heather is actually sending pictures of her rampage through Farthing Station. She's nuts. Chase gave a quiet laugh, his gaze fixed on the Nietzschean Harriet carrier only 600 meters off the Fury Lance's bow. Even at dock, ships this large were never so close to one another. He could read the name emblazoned on the enemy vessel, Starhawk, and make out the 11 spears that noted the number of capital ships it had destroyed. I have... Wait. No, Garth said, sounding confused. What is it, Chief? Chase asked. I had two Nietzschean ships on a direct course for Delta Moon, a cruiser and an older-style dreadnought. They were three light seconds away, and now they're gone. There are a lot of ships out there, Chase gestured at the holo tank, where thousands of Nietzschean ships were pulling away from various stations and the impending destruction of the moon surrounding Epsilon. Could have been a sensor ghost. Maybe, Garth allowed. Not a lot are flying closer to the moons, though. Doesn't matter, they were a long way off. Okay, Chase said, glancing at the holo to see that Travis on the Republic had signaled his readiness. Let's do this. The two Marauder ships shed their stealth systems and activated stasis shielding. Both ships were positioned perpendicular to the enemy vessel, beyond the firing angles of the H-class carrier's main guns. Potter and Ona had pre-programmed the opening barrage, as had Dredge and his counterparts on the Republic. The bridge crew didn't have to lift a finger, as both vessels unleashed every forward-facing beam they possessed, weakening the Starhawk's midship shield umbrellas. We've taken out a section, Potter crowed, and Ona triggered the rail guns to fire at the hold section of the enemy's shields. One-ton slugs launched from the Fury Lance, tearing into the massive carrier, which had begun to rotate to bring its main guns to bear on the Marauder ships. Keeping us in position, Garth announced. The Republic breached the Starhawk shields on the other side as well, and began slinging kinetics into the enemy vessel. Chase glanced at another holo tank, watching as the Capital and the Undaunted dove between the four Harriets at higher orbits, drawing those carriers further from the moon. The tactic appeared to be working, but then one of the enemy carriers shifted course, dropping toward Delta Moon and the fight surrounding the hold carrier. At the same time, hundreds of missiles streaked out from the Starhawk's aft and fore launchers, the weapons arcing out from the carrier and slamming into the rear of the Fury Lance and the Republic, nuclear booms surrounding both ships. Chase held his breath. All sensor data winked out as the stasis shields fully enveloped the Lance to protect it from the blast. Seven long seconds later, scan came back online, though the ionized plasma surrounding the ship limited visibility. No damage, Potter announced, but they knocked us away. We're moving aft of the Starhawk at 15 kilometers per second. The Republic is at 25, bringing us back around, Garth reported. Ona laughed as she pushed an image up onto the main display. They hurt themselves more than us with that. Much of the Harriet carrier's hull was blackened, and atmosphere was venting in several locations. Taking fire from the other Harriet, Garth called out a second later. Damn it, Chase muttered. 
knowing he couldn't get a dropship out of the bays and down to the moon in the midst of this battle. Even with stealth enabled, a shuttle would light up like a beacon, flying through all the plasma from the nukes. Suddenly he felt a link connection. Chase! Rika's voice was filled with triumphant joy, sending a feeling of elated relief through him. Rika, stars shitting plasma in space. I, you have no idea how good it is to hear your voice. Is Leslie with you? Please let her be with you. Her laugh filled his mind, and suddenly every worry, all the fear and stress had just disappeared. Rika was alive and well. Anything and everything was possible again. She's here. Nikki, too, though I guess that's understood. I guess you're having fun out there, blowing up Harriet's and all. But Leslie and I could really use an evac. We also have a rather large passenger, an SAI core that's five meters cubed. Chase thought of the available shuttles on the Fury Lance and Republic. None of them were large enough to take a core that size, not without ripping out all the seats and cutting a rather large hole in the bulkhead. I'll have to get creative, but we can do it. You're on Delta Moon, right? You got it in one, hun. We're working with the AI that manages the place to destroy it. You might have noticed that. Chase laughed aloud. Hell yeah, us and every meat out here. They're freaking out, but still putting up a good fight. How long can you hold out? We need five more minutes, but then we'd really like evac. We may be a bit longer. I have to retrofit a shuttle to carry your passenger. Understood. Rika's tone was clipped, as though she was concentrating on several other things at once. We can hold out. I should get back to it. We're fighting the robot army from hell down here, sending our coordinates. Shit, okay, stay alive. Always. Rika's voice fell silent for a moment. Chase? Yeah? I knew you'd come for us. Never had a doubt in my mind. Chase knew he was grinning like an idiot, but he added a laugh to it as well. Huh, never one in mine either. What is it? Ona asked, staring at him with hope-filled eyes. He let out a whoop and thrust a fist in the air. That, my most excellent bridge crew, was Rika, passing coordinates to the nav system. Ona bit her lip and nodded vigorously, while Garth let out a victorious shout. I knew it, Potter added. Those three couldn't be taken out by all of Nietzsche. Garth tensed, shifting his focus back to his console. They're back, he cried out, right on top of us. They? Chase asked, turning to the hollow tank of the battle space, still lit up by the beams and rails firing between the two marauder ships and the Harriets, though less from the Starhawk as each second passed. Then he saw them. Just ten kilometers above the Fury Lance were the two Nietzschean ships that Garth had spotted earlier, the cruiser and the dreadnought. We're being hailed, marauder channels, Potter announced. Put it up, Chase said, and get us close to the Starhawk again. We need to shoot that bird down. Nuke it if you have to. As he spoke, a tall woman appeared on the main display. Hello, Captain Chase. I'm Colonel Adira. Vargo sent me to help. He what? Chase asked then realized that every question he was about to ask had already been answered. The woman was a mech. She was aboard Nietzschean ships, ships that registered as having stasis shields, and she could only have gotten their location from Vargo Clen, just as she'd said. Never mind. We need to get that Harriet and its friends off our back so we can send Evac down to the planet to get Rika. Rika's down there? The mech asked. Send me the coordinates. I can grab her in a diff. You'll need something big, he cautioned. She has an SAI core that needs to come up, and it's five meters cubed. A broad smile split Colonel Adira's lips. Don't worry about that. We have dragons. I can't believe it, Rika exulted, grinning inside her helmet like an idiot and wishing Leslie could see it. They're coming. They're fucking coming. Thank stars. Piper, we're getting you out of here. A round pinged off her armor, and she realized that the Nietzschean soldiers had made it past the drone's blockage and were spilling into the bowl. Ah, shit, she muttered. These guys aren't smart enough not to shoot at Piper. Without another word, both Leslie and Rika leaped from the catwalk, sailing over the long drop leading to the black hole lurking far below Piper's node, before running across the wide bowl in opposite directions, drawing the enemy fire away from the SAI. Trapped between the bots and the Neats, Rika worried they may not be able to hold out until Evac arrived. Chase hadn't exactly said it, but she knew that he didn't have a shuttle handy that was large enough for Piper's node. 
She realized that asking for some backup while they waited would have been wise and was about to reach out again when she spotted movement in the shaft above. Something had blotted out the dim light of the stars. Rika could only give it a cursory look as she fired on a pair of drones and the brave but foolish neat that had charged her. But whatever was in the shaft was falling and fast. Seconds later, it burst into the chamber, veering away from Piper's node and instantly diving toward the Nietzschean soldiers. The blue-white flash of an electron beam shot out of its mouth and tore into the enemy soldiers. From its mouth? Rika's mind finally registered what she was seeing. It was a dragon. A mech dragon. Now that she understood what had flown into the chamber, the rough shape of a sky screen became apparent but it had been modified to look like the mythological creature of old. It had a tail, wings, even clawed feet, a long neck protruded from the body, and as Rika had already witnessed, beam fire poured from its mouth. What was even more amazing was that a mech sat astride the metal beast, holding a massive warhammer aloft as the creature swept across the space. The dragon-riding mech swung her hammer at a drone, energy surging around the weapon as it smashed the drone's casing, as her mount wheeled about, laying waste to the drones with its beams and claws followed by a barrage of missiles that launched from under its wings. Two more of the mechanical beasts dropped out of the shaft and joined the fray, as the first dragon with the mech atop it swung toward Rika and settled on the ground. Rika, I presume? The woman asked as she leaped off the dragon and landed before her. Rika hadn't realized it at first, but the rider's armor was stylized to make her look rather demonic. Even her helmet had long curved horns. That's me, Rika said, glad her helmet hit her slack-jawed expression. You are? Colonel Adira, at your service. This here is Prentice. Captain Chase said you needed a pickup, and I have just the mechs for the job. Dragons? Rika asked, still adjusting to what she was seeing. Nice to meet you, Colonel Rika, Prentice the Mech Dragon said with a low rumble. Well, they don't call my company Adira's demons for nothing. We get a lot of pleasure in scaring the shit out of Neats. Plus, the K1Rs really wanted to fly, so we worked these up. Effective, Leslie praised as she approached, firing at a single drone that tried to rise from the surrounding carnage. So, we ask for shuttles, and Chase sends you? Why take a shuttle when you can ride a dragon? Adira asked with a shrug and a laugh. Leslie offered her hand. Captain Leslie, glad to meet you. I can't think of any reason to take a shuttle when dragons are an option. As much as I'd love to sit around and chat all day, we should probably get the hell out of here, Rika said, eyeing another wave of drones that were emerging from the walls, much to the joy of the dragons, who roared with delight as they charged the machines. Okay, I'm ready. Piper said hesitantly, you know, I imagined rescue from this prison many, many times. I think I must have visualized a billion scenarios, but I can promise you not a single one of them involved dragons. Did I get shot? Am I misperceiving reality? If you are, then you're not alone, Rika replied, laughing with delight. What about your other selves? Leslie asked. Do we need to get them? A sigh came from the AI. No, I have their state, and what was left of the others. Realization dawned on Rika. You have their state? That means they're still alive, though. It does. Piper's voice was strained. Those parts of me will now self-terminate, so that the Nietzscheans can't undo what we've started. Four minutes later, they were airborne. The dragon Rika was astride carefully cradled Piper's node in his clawed talons as they rose through the kilometer-long shaft below Adira and Leslie. They broke the surface in seconds, and Leslie's dragon nearly collided with the Nietzschean fighter. The K1R turned fantastical beast took off after the Nietzschean craft, firing its beams and launching missiles, while Leslie shot at the enemy from its back. Don't you drop my AC-9CR, Rika admonished the woman. Did I tell you I've grown fond of it? Relax, Rika. You've mentioned it seven times since you lent the gun to me. I won't drop your precious boy. Score. My beastie just took out that fighter. On to the next. Stay close, Rika, Adira advised. It's a thousand clicks to your ship. 
Rika looked up to see the point of light that was the Fury Lance approaching Delta Moon, its beams lighting up the sky as they tore into a Harrier that was dropping down toward the Dreadnought. Another Dreadnought and cruiser were nearby, and the Republic was moving around the enemy ship, hitting it in the engines. Gotta say, Colonel Rika, Adira said as the dragons boosted into space. Those stasis shields of yours sure are amazing. Glad Vargo hooked us up with those, despite his busy schedule as governor of Kansas. Seemed a bit put out that he was stuck back there while we got to join up and have some fun. Rika snorted. Vargo, governor? Now that's a story I can't wait to hear. But not in a rush. Let's get back to the land and get out of this Nietzschean shitstorm before we swap stories over a beer. You got it, Colonel, Adira replied, thrusting her massive hammer in the air. Rika couldn't help but laugh at the sight. Flying through space on the back of a mech dragon felt as safe as being naked in a sandstorm. But that didn't lessen the exhilaration in the least. She was about to reach out to Chase when a notification flashed in her mind. Quancom network available. Rika didn't waste a second reaching out to Tannis, only to find that her QC's pairing with the field marshal had become disentangled. However, a link to the Cardin communications hub was online, though only a small percentage of the rubidium atoms were still entangled. Her message would have to be short and sweet. She took a moment to gaze up at the thousand points of light moving around Epsilon, the thousands of Nietzschean ships waiting to descend on them, while considering her message. She'd never reached out to Cardin before, and hoped a simple message would reach the right people with the right result. Rika needs fleet. Send now. She added in her coordinates and bitter lip, praying that someone was listening. Seven long seconds later, a single word came back. Acknowledged. Then the QC blade went offline. Reunion. Stellar date 10.23.8949. Adjusted years. Location, MSS Fury Lance. Region, Epsilon, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. The dragon sailed into the Fury Lance's forward docking bay, and Rika leaped from its back while the mech was still gently lowering Piper's node to the deck. Across the bay, Chase was running toward her, and Rika barely remembered her feet touching down before she barreled into him, the pair falling over and rolling a dozen meters before coming to a stop. Stars, Chase grunted disentangling his arms to pull Rika's helmet free as she triggered its release. Mech hugs are hard. Rika only laughed as her lips met his, and she wrapped her arms around him, crushing her body into his, feeling their steel bodies scrape and grind against one another. She knew that she had to get up, had to be the commander, but she didn't want to let go of Chase. Not until she realized that half the mechs in the bay, plus the three dragons, were all standing around her, did she release him and struggle to her feet? Nice, Leslie said with a grin, her helmet also removed. I hope Barn doesn't hug like that when we finally meet up again. I'm not as tough as you. We're not out of this yet, Potter's voice reminded them over the ship net. And welcome back, Commander. The Neats are forming a blockade around Epsilon. All told, they managed to get 7,000 ships off their stations and shipyards. Rika whistled. Can our stasis shields withstand that? We're already running hot, and there are a dozen Harriets on us keeping things that way. It's dicey. Adira. Chase offered his hand to the tall mech who had also removed her helmet, her long ebony hair flowing free. Thank you for saving Rika. I don't know that we were saved, Rika interrupted with a wide grin. More like, Rika. Leslie gave her a level stare. We were under siege, atop a black hole, on a moon that was waiting to be pulverized and then eaten by said black hole. A sigh slipped past Rika's lips. Okay, I guess we were rescued. Rescued works. It was bracing, Piper said from where his node rested on the deck. After spending nearly a millennia in those moons, I do believe I'm experiencing agoraphobia. Any chance you could close the bay doors? Of course, Potter replied quickly. Everyone, meet Piper, Nikki announced. He destroyed Epsilon in exchange for us getting him out of here. 
Just as the doors began to close, a shuttle slipped through and fired its braking thrusters, settling on the deck a few meters away. Before the clamps had locked on, Heather leaped out, rushing to Rika. Colonel, stars, I'm glad you made it back safe and sound. Chase was so mopey without you. She wrapped Rika in an embrace while glaring over her shoulder at Chase. Did you hurt my girl? Who, Rika? He asked, frowning as Patty and a group of mechs disembarked from the shuttle and rushed toward the group. The Lance, Heather roared, letting go of Rika to bend over and stroke the deck. Killing Neats was fun and all, but I swear, I'll not leave you in a battle like that again. All away teams are accounted for, Potter announced. Let's get to the bridge, Rika said, gesturing for the group to follow her. I'll stay back here with Piper, Leslie said. I've got Carson and Stripes on the way up to help get him somewhere more secure. Secure for him or against him? Rika asked, remembering Leslie's hesitation. For and a little against, she replied. He's gone through a lot, could still go nuts on us. Just be nice. Leslie sent Rika a warm smile. He's been a good ally, I won't forget that. Rika gave her a final appraising look before turning and walking through the ship to the bridge. While she did so, she kept half an eye on Colonel Adira, and the other half on the scan feeds of the Nietzschean ships, forming up beyond the slowly deteriorating orbits of Epsilon's moons. While she was grateful for the woman showing up, she hoped that Adira hadn't signed her own death certificate by joining with the marauders. Adira, Chase said after a moment, I was trying to ask this back in the bay. How is it that you got so close to Delta Moon so quickly? Oh, that? Adira asked with a grin. We've been dreaming of hitting this place for ages, though we'd never have stood a chance without your shields or, she turned to Rika, your apparent ability to make close friends with strange AIs. Which means? Chase asked. We had a map of the dark layer around here. It was old, and I'll admit it was a serious risk to make that jump, but I don't know, it felt right. I wouldn't attempt it again, though. Not with whatever your AI did to those moons probably stirred the dark matter pot all up. Then we're going to have to fight our way out of here, Chase decided. Rika considered their options, coming to the conclusion that bringing the fleet into a close formation, which would limit the number of Nietzschean ships that could fire on them, was the best bet. They'd loop around Epsilon, boost hard, and then punch through the enemy lines. It was risky, though, and her calculation showed that not all the Marauder ships would make it. She hoped it wouldn't come to that. The group reached the bridge where Ona and Garth stood clapping as Rika entered. Okay, okay, she said, holding up a hand. We can celebrate in back, Pat, when we all make it out of this. Are you thinking that we should try to get in a tight formation and attempt to punch through their line? Adira asked, echoing Rika's earlier thoughts. I think we could do it, but from what I understand of this stasis shield technology, if they bring in a fire to bear, your smaller ships may not be able to hold it off. Rika nodded. Yeah, that's a real worry. Either way, we should move into an orbit away from the mess that's building out there. She gestured to the holo display, which showed Miss Leah Station slamming into Delta Moon, almost smearing itself across the surface as explosions flared into space. I'm coordinating with my ships, Adira said. They'll take helm direction from you. Thank you, Rika replied as she scoured the scan readings. I'll send a new formation in vector to all ships. Potter announced. Should we orbit once and then break free on the first pass? Not yet, Rika said, her eyes scouring the space beyond the Nietzschean ships. I'm hoping for a surprise. Chase's eyes narrowed, then he snapped his fingers. The Quancom, did you get a message for help? She shrugged. Maybe. The QC was damaged, but I got a short message through a few minutes ago. I received an acknowledged back, but I don't know if that just means they got my message or that we're going to get rescued. Quancom? Adira asked. Ma'am? Garth called out. The Neats are hailing us. Rika glanced at Adira. I'll explain later, if there is a later. Chief, put it on. A man appeared on the holo display, his face red and his upper lip quivering. Admiral Deacon, Rika greeted with an innocent smile. Sorry that we broke your... everything. Rika, the man ground out the single word. You'll die for this, you'll, she held up a hand. As the most beautiful sight she'd ever witnessed appeared on the scan display, 
You can save it, Admiral. I'll be accepting your surrender now. Admiral Deegan opened his mouth to speak, but then his face grew ashen and his mouth closed, his lips pressing into a thin line. They're still arriving, but I already count just over a thousand ships, Rika said with a grim smile as she watched wave after wave of allied ships appear on the far side of the Nietzschean craft. You may still outnumber us, but all those ships have the same shields as my fleet. How do you think you'll fare? Aftermath. Stellar date 10.25.8949. Adjusted years. Location, Rika's quarters, MSS Furyland. Region, Epsilon, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. In the end, Admiral Deegan surrendered, but not before he'd made a futile attempt to surround the Allied fleet with his Harriet carriers and newly constructed cruisers and dreadnoughts. Rika had been impressed by his moxie, but it turned out to be a bluff. Most of the Harriets were barely operational, and the few that had fighters didn't have the pilots to take them into the black. A few of the Nietzschean ships attempted to use NSAIs to pilot their fighters, but the veteran ISF ships destroyed them with ease. Not only that, but the ISF and Transcend vessels possessed weapon systems capable of cutting through the enemy's shields as though they weren't there, which was the case on some of the half-completed ships. Even before the battle was fully joined, many of the Nietzschean ships began to surrender. The best part of the second rescue was that the remainder of Rika's marauders had arrived with the Allied fleet. Now the 7th Marauder fleet was complete, 64 ships under Rika's command, ready to continue taking the fight to the Neats. Rear Admiral Carson had been managing the Nietzschean surrender, including the massive search and rescue operation that had to deal with the millions of people still trapped on stations or barely functional starships. Rika was in her quarters, getting ready to join the Marauder's victory celebration when Carson reached out to her. Colonel Rika, do you have a moment? The ISF Admiral asked. You saved my bacon, quite literally as a matter of fact, as well as that of my marauders. I'll always have a moment for you. Carson grunted a half laugh. <laughs> Just doing my job. You know the drill. Gotta say, though, like always, the cleanup here is a far bigger challenge than the fight itself. Seems to be a trend for you, Rika replied. You have no idea. I've been at this for ages. I was in the TSF back in Seoul, thought that hooking up with a colony gig would be a way to kick back and relax. Back then, I just flew a fighter. Then they put me in charge of a wing. After the defense of Carthage, someone thought I belonged in a chair instead of a fighter's cocoon. Probably Jessica. She loves to make life miserable for me. Rika chuckled at the thought. That doesn't surprise me in the least. I didn't get to talk with her for too long. She was getting ready to go off on some mission but she did seem a bit mischievous. I still remember when she flew in my squadron. That woman was one hell of a fighter pilot. She nearly bit it out in the black, though. We searched for her for three days, if I recall correctly. That's when she got her original purple skin. Oh? Rika asked. I thought it was something she got off in the Perseus arm of the galaxy. Nope, that was round two. Or three, maybe. Back at Victoria, she got the lavender skin job because her original birthday suit soaked up more rads than a control rod in a uranium burner and melted off. Rika made a gagging sound. You're not like other admirals, you know that? Sure do. I figure if I keep being a crass asshole, they'll kick me out of this chair, but it's not gotten me anywhere but promoted so far. You must be doing it wrong. Carson barked a laugh. <laughs> I like you, Rika. I'd ask you what I should do to get busted back down to flying a fighter, but you seem to have the same problem as me. Up and up, no matter what. Rika checked her hair in her cabin's holo and then stepped out into the passageway, turning toward the lift bank that would take her down to Bay 22 and the victory celebration the marauders were holding there. I do seem to suffer from that affliction, yeah. Yay for responsibility. Speaking of which, that's why I called you in the first place. Chase sent me an invite to join your little shindig, but I'm up to my armpits and Nietzscheans. I have to get them off their ships and into stasis pods before I send them off to the farm. Whenever you're done with Admiral Gideon, you can send him over to our collection and processing ship. Rika had spoken to Gideon several times now and was certain she'd not get anything useful out of him without resorting to torture. 
Not only that, but he'd probably feed her bad intel, knowing that she'd be too many light years away and unlikely to take out any frustrations on him. I'll get him on his way to you before long. Guy stinks up the ship. I heard you found Colonel Sophia as well. Carson let out a long sigh. Oh, fuck me, she's a snake of a woman. Asked if she could join up with the ISF. Opportunistic chameleon? I stuck her in a stasis pod so fast, her head will still be spinning when they finally let her out. Is that what the farm is? Rika asked. Just a lot of stasis pods? More or less. I don't actually know where it is, but it's someplace far from anywhere that anyone cares about. No one wants millions of enemy soldiers on their planet, or in their system for that matter. I suspect that the farm is a place like Epsilon here, just a cold clump of matter out in the interstellar darkness, where it is that when we finally get everything under control, everyone there will be released bit by bit. While the idea seemed humane, Rika didn't relish the notion of every foe they'd defeated seeing their captured military set free. However, she also knew that Tannis was no fool and likely had a plan to deal with that. Well, when we finally get to deal with that problem, maybe we'll have some good ideas about what the best plan of action will be. Maybe we can all enjoy a few decades of peace before we have to worry about that. But then again, most of the people we're sending there are just grunts, and half of them have families. Glad dealing with that is above my pay grade. The image of Carson looking frustrated while surrounded by millions and millions of stasis pods came into her mind, and Rika laughed. <laughs> you never know. At the rate you're getting promoted, you may be the one having to deal with that. Fuck, Carson swore. I'm gonna have to cut off Tannis's ponytail or something so I get busted down a notch or two before that happens. That visual replaced Rika's prior one and she laughed anew. <laughs> if you do that, you need to record it. The video evidence of such a deed will be priceless. Such a deed? Is that how you marauders talk over there? No, Rika snorted as she stepped onto the lift. But I'm trying to class up the joint. Good luck with that. Soldiers aren't really known for their class. Rika thought back to the prior night's game of butt snark. You got that right. Was there anything else you needed? We'll have to sort out some logistics when you get your next set of orders, but nothing that can't wait. Oh, has Piper made up his mind yet about going to see Bob? He has, Rika replied. He's gotten over being completely twitchy now that he's out in the open, so to speak, but he doesn't want to meet with Bob yet. He says that he wants to stay here for the time being, so we're setting him up in one of the Fury Lance's data hubs. Okay, sure. Carson sounded like he couldn't fathom the idea of not wanting to meet Bob. Rika understood where Piper was coming from. The AI had been betrayed by everyone he'd dealt with in the past seven centuries. As a result, he was understandably cautious and didn't want to be far from Rika and Leslie. I think he will eventually. I just don't want to rush him. Guy's been stuck in a moon for almost a thousand years. You'd think he'd want to see the galaxy. Either way, it's not a big deal. I'm all for people taking things slow. Sort of my M.O. Rika laughed and bid Admiral Carson farewell as the lift arrived at the passageway just outside Bay 22. When the doors opened, the sound of the celebration in full swing hit her like a sledgehammer. Finished your little chat with Carson? Nikki asked. Yeah, he's a talkative guy, but I like him. I bet he's got some great stories. Probably, Nikki agreed. He's been around for forever. Speaking of getting around, you ready to head in there and play the gracious and thankful rescuee? More like gracious and thankful for a dragon ride, but we would have gotten out of there on our own. The AI laughed. Why do you keep saying stuff like that? Because it's true. You're very resourceful, Nikki. You would have thought of something. Rika, Nikki groaned. Just get in there and be gracious for once. Taking a break from the handshaking and backslapping, Rika walked to the edge of Bay 22 and gazed out through the open doors. Simply put, the view was astounding. The three smaller moons had already been pulverized into a diffuse disk, illuminated by the flaring event horizons of the three black holes that were devouring the debris. It sure is beautiful, isn't it? A familiar voice asked from beside Rika, and she glanced at Silva's solemn visage. It is, like a deadly dance, Rika said with a nod as she watched the whirlpools of matter swirl in the ring. I ran some models, and they show that inside a few weeks, 
there will be only one black hole, and it will ultimately consume the planet. The ISF is preparing a navigational hazard beacon. They're good people like that. Rika nodded. That they are. Speaking of good people, I thought we agreed that you should go with Amy to New Canaan and leave the warmongering to those of us without kids. Silva's eyes narrowed and she gave Rika a sidelong look. I have to be here. Amy and I talked about it and she understands. I need to bring my boys home and put my family back together. The lieutenant colonel paused, her eyes growing moist. Please, Rika, I need to be here. Are you going to stay on mission? She asked. We're out here because we're trying to free all of Genevia, not just your boys. Stars, woman, Silva said with a laugh. I still remember when you were newly mechanized, all terrified of the world around you. I had to keep you safe under my wing for our first few deployments. Now here you are, giving me the tough love speech. A host of memories flooded into Rika's mind. Well, I had a really good teacher on that front. Oh, yeah? Silva smiled. Sure, you remember that guy named Bro I told you about once or twice? Silva groaned and gave Rika a mock slap on the head. Taken in the sights? Barnes' voice came from behind them, and Rika turned to see her sergeant major approaching, arm intertwined with Leslie's. Not far behind them trailed Chase and Kelly. Rika reached out for Chase's hand and drew him close. Team Hammerfall and Team Basilisk, she said with a contented smile. All my mechs are here, plus a host of new marauders that are ready to take the fight to Constantine. As if to punctuate Rika's statement, a laugh boomed across the bay, coming from one of Adira's commanders, a broad-shouldered man named Captain Fell. So, where to? Chase asked as he gazed out at the stars. The Allies are setting up gates to ship the Harriet carriers back to Pira for proper refit at the Kendrick shipyards, Rika explained. I've not received any specific orders yet, so I'm going to recall Vargo from Kansas, and then we'll jump to Iberia. I don't know what Alice thinks she's playing at, but we're going to rescue Allison and her team, then haul that woman back in chains. I like the way you think, Rika. Seeing Alice in chains will make my day, Chase said with a laugh. It's a long jump to Iberia, though. If these degenerates try to get you to play butt snark, run for the hills. Why would I do that? Rika asked, genuinely confused. I love butt snark. Allison gazed at the holo tank on the Carl's Mites Bridge. It showed their destination, a world in the Iberia system named Malta. It was unassuming, agrarian, and nowhere near any strategic Nietzschean installations. If they took Rika here, I'll eat my arm, Allison thought while glancing at Alice. Alas, after a 70-day journey to the Iberia system, Allison knew that the hunt for Rika had gone on without them, successfully, she had no doubt. It was all too apparent that the colonel was playing some sort of game the mechs didn't understand, yet. It's up to me to find out what this traitor is up to.